You can now begin, Mr. Fluker. Thank you. Uh, I now call to order the October 14th meeting, regular meeting of the Accommodations Tax Advisory Committee for the town of Hilton Head Island. Sunday, would you call the order, please? Um, yes, sir. Mr. Fluker. Here. Mr. Arnold. Here. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mr. Berghausen. Present. Great. Right. There appears to be a quorum. Uh, therefore, we can go forward. Uh, Sunday, have we complied with the Freedom of Information Act uh, for this meeting? Yes, sir, we have. Okay. Are there any uh, questions or comments about the agenda for today's meeting? I have none. All right. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll motion I'll make, uh, to approve the agenda. I'll second. All right. So, Dave, would you please call the roll? Yes. Mr. Arnold? President. Ms. Johnson? I mean, yes. <laughs> Ms. Johnson? Approve. Mr. Berghausen? Approve. Mr. Fluker? Approved. Great. Sundaya, do we have any citizen comments for the meeting today? Yes, sir, we do. We have Mr. Hoagland who is holding on the line. And I also wanted to let you know that Mr. Farrell has joined us in the meeting also. All right. Would you please let the record show that Mr. Farrell is involved in the meeting now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Hoagland, can you hear us? Mr. Hoagland, are you there? Can you hear me? Now I can. Yes, okay. sir. You can hear me now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, um, good morning. Uh, Skip Hoagland, Windmill Harbor. Uh, Mr. Fluker, it seems big changes are coming, and all accounting must be provided to me under FOIA and to South Carolina Turk by Bill Miles and what he did with over $1 million of eight tax funds in Canada and many more laws he broke, both federal and state. Look at the good side. We will end up with a properly and legally operated private chamber business league and a totally separated ATAX funded DMO, both operated under national gold standards, not as a criminal secret nonprofit enterprise, illegally using millions of tax funds to profit. Seems lawyer Terry Finger, Coltrane, Tom Lennox, Ames, Steve Riley, Brad Mara, Chris Corkendale, lawyer David Tigges and Paul Bethay and many others corruption on behalf of Bill Miles and this chamber leadership is coming to an end. It took 20 years to finally get South Carolina authorities to understand just how bad it had become. It's far from over and it's just what I call another Murdoch without the murders. ATAX members have lied as well as committed grievous financial malfeasance by recommending ATAX funding illegally for political corrupt purposes. Further, you did not follow the law for proper and equitable distribution of these public monies because they were handpicked, because you were all handpicked by town manager Steve Riley, a close friend of Bill Miles, to keep the ATAX grift and, and, and fraud going forward. Further, any current ATAX committee members who are chamber members, which is all of you, have an express conflict of interest and should resign immediately or be removed as opposed to continuing to recommend funding that you know is improper and illegal. You should all be questioned on why you just kept recommending with no accounting provided or legal DMO contracts or tax recipient agreements signed that fully spells out how all tax funds can be properly and legally used and how all the accounting must be reported, receipts and invoices. It's a disgrace to have to live with this level of corruption by you people. You should all be held liable along with all town officials. Chairman of the Finance Committee, retired banker Tom Lennox and David Ames have lots of questions to ask, as do all of you, as do the town lawyers, Terry Finger, Coltrane and Bush and Gruber. Couldn't be any worse than Gruber. For the scheme drafting of the fraudulent DMO contract to allow the full accounting 
to be hidden and secretly used by Bill Miles and the chamber. How will these, how will all of you as ATAX committee members respond to authorities when they ask you the simple question, why and did you base, and what did you base your continued recommending to fund, uh, uh, funding Bill Miles on? Why did you allow it? Mr. Fluker, you better clean up your act as well as the rest of you and get this thing fixed, or I think you're gonna be in big trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the citizens? Is that the only one? Yes, sir, that's the only one. All right, next agenda item is unfinished business. There is none, so we move on to new business, which is the hearing of the applicants. Um, before we get started on that today, uh, it's the chair's uh, recommendation, if, without, uh, uh, if there's no disagreement, that uh, after the applicants have used their time to present today, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to call uh, each of the members, uh, give them an opportunity that way we can uh, do this in some sort of orderly fashion. Um, and that for I'll, I'll rotate that list as I go along so that uh, uh, same person is always the first one on the list. And then uh, we'll move on from there. And if anybody has a follow up after the questions, then they can just uh, somehow signal me either by raising their hand or letting it be known to me that they have additional questions. So uh, with that in mind, our first applicant today scheduled is the uh, Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce. Is, uh, is that presentation ready? Good morning. Yes. Hi. Hello, Mr. Fluker. How are you? Hello. I'm fine, Ms. Pernice. How are you doing? Great, thank you so much. Um, as you stated, my name is Ariana Pernice and I'm with the Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce. And I appreciate the opportunity this morning to um, present our 2022 supplemental request. Um, if you all can allow me the opportunity to share my screen, um, please let me know if you can see it. It's up. I'm just gonna put it into presentation mode. Everyone can see that? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, good morning everyone. And thank you again for the opportunity. Um, we'll work quickly through some slides here to recap where we've been and our requests going forward. And let's see. There you go. I always like to start with our mission, mission and vision, excuse me. Our mission is to stimulate the regional economy while enhancing the quality of life for all, as well as our vision is a welcoming world-class community, embracing nature, culture, and economic vibrancy for residents and visitors. I thought it was important for us to put our cornerstone up. We've all worked very hard on this opportunity, um, but to summarize it as it's up here in front of us, um, we're stewards as your DMO to the community in our efforts to promote tourism and that all of our efforts begin with a community focus um, in all of our efforts that we um, push in the out markets. So we'll dive into the year in review. If you look at our overall economic impact, we had 1.37 billion of economic impact <clears throat> of tourism on Hilton Head Island. And that translates into every dollar um, that's invested into the marketing uh, for the destination, an output of $15.90. What did that look like from the program perspective? As we look through um, where we've been, um, there was a series of different promotions and activities that surrounded our efforts. Um, we're very excited about the arts and cultural video promotion. Uh, many of you know that we worked closely with Jen McCune, um, Director of Cultural Affairs for the town to ensure that we had a comprehensive video that really promoted the arts um, and culture of the destination. And so a few years back, we worked to produce the video um, in this past year and still going that we're working on promotion of that video. And that video is being seen not only linked um, through YouTube, but also on social media. It's embedded on our website. It also is, is a shared asset. So Jen has that as well to use in her promotions. Um, and we're just very excited about that. So we can see some of those results here. 
Um, and just uh, when you're clicking onto the video, it clicks back to um, their website, which is really um, a great opportunity. So you can see more things that are going on within the community there uh, regarding arts and culture. As we look through all the events that we were promoting um, in this past effort, we had uh, Concord de Elegance, Bella Festival, Foodie February, the RBC Heritage presented by Boeing, Bravo Piano, Juneteenth, and the Hilton Head Island Wine and Food Festival. As you know, as we navigated the um, latter part of 2020 and into 21, um, events um, and partnerships were still being kind of figured out because many were still navigating COVID um, as we were globally. And so we really found ourselves sitting right beside the partner as we always do, but really thinking through how can we best articulate what's going on, what iteration of the event is going to take place, um, if it were gonna take place at all, or how we were gonna maintain um, relationships with the um, vast amount of visitors that we know attend these that maybe weren't gonna be able to attend this year in the same capacity, but keep them engaged as we move forward with future efforts. Efforts. So as we look at a comprehensive effort um, against these activities, you can see here just a quick snapshot of um, different ways in which we promoted here, are a bunch of um, different digital and social examples, but please know the comprehensive approach that is taken, again, that we sit very closely with our partners, um, that we look at all of their um, opportunities, what their strategy is, and how we can really, really take a divide and conquer approach. So there is um, a broader reach, a deeper dive into the markets that they're looking to serve. We are um, allowing them to, you know, working with them and they have their efforts that they're going to work towards and we're going to have our efforts and we're going to come together for that deeper, um, you know, uh, brand awareness into the market so we can drive visitors to the destination, drive them to their websites. So they can really understand all the different details of these events. That looks a little different for each partner. Um, each partner has a different, you know, strategy or, um, you know, what they're tracking in terms of key performance indicators. Um, but again, we'll see that through digital, social, we'll see that in print, on the website, different dedicated landing page. Um, pages, or we could bring in different media opportunities. And so it's really, you know, unique to each partner, but in, with each partner effort, um, there is a concerted effort to ensure that we're meeting um, goals that on, on all sides. So this total impact, and again, we took that comprehensive approach, how did our efforts in terms of promotion really impact um, our partners and the efforts of awareness for the events and festivals that were taking place. So we look here and we're taking KPIs that we measure against, which are landing page sessions. We have organic and paid impressions, engagement and referrals. And these are just really strong metrics that um, as you're working through on the marketing side, you'll see as great key performance indicators of success and um, efforts within your, your campaigns. Switching gears to the ever important meetings and groups, as we know with COVID that meetings and groups had kind of waned off a bit based on um, lack of business travel. But as a destination, um, we have been top of mind for not only leisure, but also as a, as a place for meetings and groups to safely re reemerge and reconnect. And so we can, we can say confidently that we've been top of mind in the places where when people are ready to look for meetings and groups, we are present. So we use our CVent and Helms Frisco partnerships um, to generate the numbers that you're seeing in front of you. Um, and then we use LinkedIn as kind of the top of funnel awareness opportunity to really start to build relationships and engagement um, and to help bring people further down the funnel. And so when they're on their, these platforms such as Cvent or Helms Briscoe, they're able to find our um, information and details about the destination and outreach accordingly. Golf has also been um, really part of our DNA for so, so many years, um, but really has really seen a resurgence in terms of um, efforts that people enjoyed and played from all vantage points throughout the last couple of years. 
and it continues to stay strong. It is part of our DNA and one that we're very proud to promote um, and partner with LGCOA on. And um, I think these numbers are indicative of how well um, golf is uh, doing for us. It continues to be a strong platform um, for all ages and for families and for groups of all sizes um, and configurations. And I just think that it's a wonderful story to be able to tell as we figure, as we continue to promote golf um, moving forward. We have 23. Um, beautiful courses and um, great partnerships with the LGCOA. And as we continue those efforts, uh, we will work towards um, efforts to ensure these numbers continue to grow. So that was our look back, but as we look forward into 22, um, we will make a request for, again, arts and cultural promotions. As you know, people um, really are taking the opportunity to take um, a deeper look into a destination when they visit. They wanna learn a little bit more. They wanna understand um, the history that you know they're exploring maybe for the first time or maybe for they've been visiting for several years but they just wanted a different vantage point um, what, than what they have been doing. And so we are working very closely with many different partners within the community to ensure that the arts and cultural promotion continues to be a pillar of our efforts um, going forward. So as you know, we've worked to create um, foundational pieces such as ongoing video, captured content with on our, on our website, um, but we will continue to move forward with um, cultural and um, art specific platforms such as Smithsonian Magazine, excuse me, um, and also work towards enhancing the website and working with our partners in the community to see how we can build that platform to be um, robust with um, such things as itineraries, different tours, um, more of the virtual opportunities, bringing the destination really to life as that first touch point of the website, um, as we talk about so much is really the front door for so many as they explore the destination. So this would be our first request as we're going through and really ensuring that arts and cultural pillar is nice and strong as we move forward um, in our efforts. We will continue to support our community partners with festival and events. This is not a comprehensive list, but a nice list to begin with um, uh, for our conversation today. And many of our partners will be presenting to you later um, over the next um, few hours and, and next week. And um, these partnerships are, are valued and we are so appreciative and excited about the opportunity to continue that momentum. Um, as we work with each one of the partners, as I mentioned earlier, to understand where their needs are and how we can help promote and enhance all the efforts that they're doing, how can we help extend and expand all that um, and dive a little deeper into those communities um, of outreach and bring those visitors here. It'll be um, ever important for us to stay import, uh, to stay on the front line of meetings and groups. Um, as I mentioned, we have been um, top of mind as many emerge back into the meetings and travel space um, regarding meetings and groups, but we will need to keep um, that pedal on the gas and remain um, top of mind as we move forward because as they emerge, they need to know that we're here, that we're ready and um, available for them when they are ready to travel. So we will continue these partnerships and our request and use LinkedIn as that funnel to bring those um, qualified um, meetings and groups, RFPs and visitors through. Um, so this is an exciting opportunity for us as we build out that website as well create, again, itineraries from the meetings and groups lens, showcase our destination as a whole, but also many of our partners, um, ranging from hotels, excursions, um, wonderful restaurants, things for them to do while they're here. We love to bring them in, but we like them to stay a bit as well. So this is really our opportunity as we work through, you know, several different iterations of COVID as we've, we've seen over the past few months. We wanna make sure that as we work through this, that we are top of mind. We have to stay vigilant, we have to stay on top of it, and we have to stay in front of them. And this is one of those ways that we're proposing to do that. In golf marketing, again, um, part of our DNA, another strong pillar for us and has been for so many years. We wanna continue that momentum. It is an opportunity to not only bring those that have found the destination um, as their favorite spot for so many years, but it's also a way to introduce the destination to so many who haven't, haven't been here before. We have 23 beautiful courses. We partner very closely with um, Low Country Golf Owners Association um, and all the partners across the island to ensure that 
you know, between the, the book that they produce and the website that we maintain and oversee for them, um, as well as meet with them regularly, that we are showcasing and bringing in qualified group um, RFPs to them so they can turn those into actual visitors. It's an exciting opportunity for us, another uh, great opportunity for us to introduce the brand, um, and we're excited to move forward with them in that partnership. To summarize, our request again is for arts and culture, festival and events, meetings and groups, and destination golf marketing. We're excited to move forward in 2022 to see how we can again leverage and expand these partnerships to bring the destination top of mind. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to present. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Pernice. I'm going to go around like I said I would. And the first person that I have on the list today is Mr. Arnold. Go ahead, Mr. Arnold, if you have any questions. Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, well, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, as always, always thorough and uh, well put together. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your dedication and the uh, dedication to the arts and the culture. We have a lot of new faces and folks that come to the island, uh, and sharing our rich history is definitely uh, important for those new faces. To not understand or to understand that not only are we a beach and golf destination, but there's also the arts and the culture. So thank you for that. And also for the groups, um, that's a big market that took a hit with COVID, obviously, uh, and the pandemic. So focusing on recapturing that market uh, was nice to see. Uh, I don't have any questions about the presentation at the time. I'll pass it on. All right. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Uh, Mr. Farrell, any questions? I have no, I have no questions. I do applaud them for the diversification of, of the markets and the, the type of activities they're promoting so that we don't put all our eggs in one basket. I think it's great how diverse they are and I applaud them for that. And, and I uh, have no questions at this time. All right, thank you. Mr. Berghausen. There I am. Yes, I, you know, I, I think the, the chamber does a, a great job for the town as the DMO, we, we pay them a lot of money uh, to, to be our DMO and promote the town generally. Um, this is a supplemental request, however, above and beyond the DMO duties. And where I struggle a little bit is to identify what we're getting incrementally for the $480,000. In other words, then how many more tourists will we get by spending this 480,000 than we'd get if we didn't spend this amount that's in addition to your DMO contract? Well, thank you, I think that's a great question. The opportunity is really to align with our partners in the community and understand how we can help better serve them and promote them as a community first approach in taking their campaigns and their opportunities and really outreaching. And so with their efforts, we're partnering with them and expanding those. And I don't look at it as how many more visitors, but it's how deep of an awareness and opportunity we're bringing in for our qualified visitors that have an affinity for the destination, who have the opportunity to be repeat guests with us, to have an affection, uh, excuse me, an affinity for the brand as they continue to navigate the many different opportunities um, that they have to explore this destination. And so when we look at the additional funding that's being awarded to us, we're looking to take that from where our DMO dollars really are dedicated to that master brand umbrella overarching effort that you see day in and day out. It's the website, it's the digital, really promoting the overall master brand. The X for the supplemental piece is to work alongside of our partners to ensure that the promotion that they are putting into the marketplace is being lifted, enhanced, and pushed further, that they're getting a bit deeper, they're getting the qualified leads. And so for that, I think that there has been great success and we've had great synergy with the partners here within the destination. And we would want to continue that opportunity to ensure that, that our number one economy is supported, um, not just 
for a short period of time, but 365 days a year. I think that's a very important piece to understand. 365 days a year, we want to ensure that there is a way that we can talk to our partner to talk about the diverse opportunity that a visitor has when they come into this destination and to support our partners that don't just have events or opportunities within um, a short window of time, but throughout the year. Thank, thank you. One, one follow-up is would be you partner with a number of uh, entities and not-for-profits who also come to us for funding. So sitting in, in my chair, it's, it's hard to understand how that fits together when they're coming to us for funding, you're coming to us for funding, and they come to you to provide the service to them. So mm -hmm. just speak, tell me, sure. if you would how, give me the comfort that absolutely. we're not paying twice for the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, Mr. Berghausen. I would happy, happily do that for you. We are in partnership and I will take any of the festival and event partners um, that you see uh, that you saw on the slide as a great example that on an annual basis, um, we, we go forward um, having worked with them prior to the presentation um, to understand what their objectives and goals are for their effort. And so as we sit together and we talk through all of their efforts, we understand that this, this opportunity, they're gonna be able to um, provide outreach and awareness and promotion for X amount. And, but they really wanna achieve Y. And so by us coming in and supplying the why component, we're able to take that festival or event or um, activity and push it through a little further, a little deeper. And we are not um, duplicating these efforts that they're doing. We're not um, coming in and um, essentially doing the same thing. We are looking at their strategy and we are saying, okay, you're already doing X, Y, and X. We're gonna help you come in and achieve Y. And these are separate initiatives, all promotion for this event, but they're separate, um, but they weren't be able to do those alone. And so in partnership, um, we're able to achieve, you know, further and deeper opportunities, um, which achieves um, a, a larger yield and a, a greater opportunity for them to have repeat opportunities going forward. So, I think um, we've done, you know, a great opportunity. There's a great opportunity in front of us to continue that momentum and to continue to work with our partners and to grow those those efforts as we move forward. Okay. If that helps. Yeah. Fine. Thank. Thank you. Yes. That's all for me, Jim. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Johnson. Good morning. Thank you so much. I have no questions, just a couple of comments. As the freshman member of the committee, I really appreciated the comprehensive presentation. I have a lot of things uh, highlighted in yellow as I learned new terms and uh, concepts that I would be faced with with the rest of the group. So um, I appreciate the presentation and um, I appreciate the diversity shown in the outreach to the world for Hilton Head. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, are there any other committee members that have joined the meeting since we started? Sandeo? Yes, sir. There's Mr. Thomas. Mr. Farrell is here. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. And I believe Mr. Arnold is still here. So yes, just Mr. R Mr. Thomas. All right. Uh, Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions of the uh, chamber? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any questions. I, I do have just a couple of comments, and I'd like to echo what a couple of my colleagues have already said with regard to the outreach and the uh, expanding emphasis of our cultural um, our cultural heritage. And um, I, you know, Ariana, you always give such a wonderfully crafted and masterfully delivered presentation. It's, it's a pleasure to listen to. Um, my one comment that would be a concern is that as we think about arts and culture on the island, uh, the emphasis on uh, performing arts and events is something that is always uh, prominent. And we do offer a lot of very exceptional, wonderful things in that regard. When you think about uh, the, the, the cultural side 
of things as a as separate from arts as a focus. I I think where we tend to to converge mostly and where our primary asset is is in the Gullah culture as opposed to the cultural expression through the arts. And, and that's all good because that's a, that is a distinctive asset that Hilton Head has. The one place that I feel may need additional representation somehow, and this is my own perspective, is on the historical heritage side of things. And if you think about things in a very broad sense, um, one of the other distinctive assets that Hilton Head Island has is the richness of that historical heritage in addition to the cultural heritage. And I know that in many, in many senses, you might consider what I'm doing to be an exercise in semantics, but I really see those things as very separate and very important. Um, Hilton Head is really one of the only places in the, in the United States that has a lifespan of history as long as it is, um, as a representation of various cultures through its history, as diverse as it is. And I think we can capitalize on that, uh, perhaps more than we are now. That would be my only comment. I would hope as time goes forward, we can see even a greater emphasis on the historical heritage uh, elements of our, of our uh, island's heritage. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Thank Thomas. you so much. Um, Ms. Pernice, I just have a couple of questions. You talk about your partnerships with uh, these other groups, and uh, I'm going to focus on one right now, and that's with the LGCOA. Um, as I looked at your budget under your supplemental grant, you, there's a uh, you're going to receive $100,000 from from the uh, Golf Owners Association uh, to fund that golf promotion part, and that's what they're asking us for. And so my question is, you know, are we just passing it through one organization to another or what, what's the situation with that? No, you know, what, no, what, no, do we have a middleman no. involved here? Or, <laughs> you know, tell well, me why. I thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that question. So I think again, in partnership, where so many, and it's festival and events, it's it's the Low, Low Country Golf Owners Association, um, but it's really us coming together, correct? And so as we talked about with Low Country, uh, with our festival, similarly as in with the LGCOA, there are kind of the, the two approaches. They are focused on in their request and their efforts that they, that they receive um, X. And then we come in and support with why. So there again is no um, shared efforts in terms of um, dollars being put together or, or sent through as that um, as as you were mentioning. So we are overseeing of the um, golf microsite. We are overseeing of all the efforts that go into there to ensure the RFP program. When someone comes in and is requesting a site, we are responsible for the digital components that go around to push qualified um, visitors or potential visitors to the site. We work hand in hand to ensure that there are um, the digital components of the golf marketing are um, working at a thousand percent and really performing for our partners within that organization, but really for the destination. The qualified leads that they come through that website are ahead in the bed, are a tummy through a turnstile. Um, there's a button to see when we're sitting at a restaurant or on, you know, visiting an excursion. They are not just simply here to, um, you know, have a, a round of golf. And so really our focus is to bring in, and that's what our ask is for, is to maintain that digital, that digital front door <clears throat> in partnership with the LGCOA. Their request will have things that are more tied to public relations um, and some of their efforts that go along with, um, you know, different events they might attend, um, different media that they might bring in. Um, so I think, again, it's that, it's that approach of partnership that we've brought together um, that you're seeing here and not only in my presentation, but you'll see in others that we are uh, working together to ensure that our brand and our brand assets are reaching further and deeper to the qualified individuals that again, can come to the um, destination, come to the destination website or the other you know, microsites that we have and then push into being actual visitors. So again, here, the real, the real message here is partnership and how we can um, 
bring a dynamic approach to our efforts, working in, in partnership to ensure the most qualified leads are not only coming to the website, coming to our partners, but also coming to the destination. Uh, and you also mentioned, you know, it increased uh, uh, push for the meetings and groups. As we've Absolutely. seen, a lot, of, a lot of large companies are now you know, getting rid of their uh, headquarters and such because their people are now going to be working remotely and such. Do you see that there's going to be the meet of business traveling and groups, given that the pandemic may have changed the whole philosophy on how we do business? See those business and so, meetings coming back in person again like that? Absolutely. And I think it's our job to ensure that we are at the forefront of that conversation. We are seeing people travel today. We are working on not only, you know, the, the fact that we want to bring meetings and groups in, but how we're advocating on the other side to ensure that businesses understand um, the importance of meeting again, just because we have individuals or, or organizations or companies, you know, perhaps still um, maintaining some sort of uh, remote working, they are still traveling to be together um, in different opportunities for business. There is not a substitute for that. And it is um, so important from a travel and tourism lens, from a destination that is driven by, a, um, by travel and tourism, that we are um, at the front of that conversation and that, and that we have been, and we wanna maintain that energy. People are traveling. Um, and we see that building back up. We see that um, opportunity coming back. We've heard from many of our partners um, on the business side that people are going back into the office, office. It might be staggered. It might be a few days a week, but we're slowly making that, that ramp back up and we will start to see that. And so soon to follow and probably faster than a full um, entry back into the office space will be those business meetings. People are excited and, and, and full of energy to be back in person with one another. And we, again, and want to be on the um, top of their mind when they're picking the place to do that in. Um, and so this is an exciting point um, in kind of where things have been and, and an opportunity for us to move forward in the space. So very exciting opportunity for us. And it's a build out not only of just our promotion of it, um, it's working with you know, many of our partners here within the destination to be prepared and, and have that opportunity ready um, when, when they're here to be welcomed. All right, that's all I have. I, I would have rather been in person today. That's my preference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy the in person. It's much more difficult, I think, to hold a meeting via Zoom or otherwise. Because, and I also miss the, the personal contact with all of the applicants and my committee members. Uh, <laughs> so I thank you for your uh, presentation. Does anybody have any follow ups? If you do, just sound out. If not, Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I set that up? Uh, uh, James Berghausen, quantifiable results. I think uh, Ariana would, it, it does help this process when we do have the ability to see an ROI, so to speak, on our spends. Mm -hmm. Because we, we do want to feel good about um, what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I think it's, I thought that was a good line of questioning. And I think that could help us going forward for us always to be cognizant of. What is the ROI on these on, and what is happening as a result of specific specific to that supplemental because it's supplemental. So um, I think that it, it was beneficial for us all to hear that line of questioning so that going forward, we can maybe address those very mm -hmm. specifically. Absolutely. And um, we've tried to put those details within not only the presentation, but I believe there was um, efforts put into our recaps that we provided as well. And so we will continue to articulate and build on those efforts and making sure that they are, um, you know, everyday conversation, part of our presentations and, and things as we're following up. But yes, we, we heard that loud and clear and we will continue to chart forward on those efforts. Yeah, I'd just like to just follow up to that, that my understanding is this is basically a heads and beds tax. And we're to spend the money to try to get more heads in beds on, in the town of Hilton Head Island. And so from an accountability standpoint, we should measure that to know how are we doing? Is, we're, we're spending a lot of money on brand identity. Well, are we getting more heads in beds? And I think you have some of that data uh, it's, it's, 
it would just be helpful to us if that data came forward in the you know 250 word summaries so that okay. we so that we can see we can we it, it helps us on the accountability side so we can see that it's Absolutely. producing so it's not as a, a follow-up yeah. as a follow-up we'll work to um send through some of those um occupancy details for your review just so you can see um where we've been um and, and we'll give some context to those numbers as well. So we'll we'll absolutely provide those and, and we'll make sure that they're part of our presentations going forward. I think you've got it. You've got it. Oh, we absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Bernice. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Uh, is our next uh, presenter, the World Affairs Council of Hilton Head Island, ready? Yes, Ms. Maureen is coming in now. Okay. There she is. All right. Would you like me to share my screen? If you can. Yes, I can. Let's see if I can get this started. Come on. There we go. Uh, I'll just give you a slight brief overview. I'm Maureen Korsik. I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Hilton Head. And for those of you who don't know what we do and what we're about, I'll give you the nickel tour. We are a 501c3 organization. <clears throat> Our mission <clears throat> is all about educating people and students about world affairs. We are a member supported organization. And what I mean by that is that we have memberships that we sell to anyone in the community that allows them to see our 14 speaker programs on Friday. But every one of our speaker programs is open to the public. You can walk in on any given Friday and see one of our speakers for $20. So, um, we are affiliated with a national organi organization, the World Affairs Council of America. And that is important because there are 94 councils that are affiliated with them. And we end up getting, um, we kind of cross and, and share our programs with other councils. And I will tell you about a partnership that we are working on uh, later on and why that's important. So we have a few primary programs. Our signature program is our Friday speaker series program, which I'll touch base on in a few minutes. We also have an evening speaker series program that happens in January, February, and March. We have student outreach programs, which actually second only to our Friday speaker programs. We feel they're very important because uh, students are our future leaders. And so we have a model UN program that's in the public schools that we support and an academic world quest program, which is kind of like your college bowl of the 1960s. We hold a, comp a local competition. And then the winner of that competition we take to Washington DC to compete with national teams so and then we have a community global forum, which is free programming anybody in the Community can show up we just concluded our three program series in September, we had one on Bitcoin. We had one on nuclear energy and we had one on cybersecurity. So those videos are actually up on our website. If you go to our website and click on Community Global Forum drop down, you can actually see those videos. Click on the link. They're open to the public. So I talked earlier about our signature series. This is our Friday speaker series program. We host two speakers a month from October through May. <coughs> Uh, some of you may have heard that we've just hosted John Bolton on October 1st. For $20, you could have come and watched John Bolton speak. Um, we, the membership supports these 14 programs. That gives us a foundation for um, 
booking these speakers. We actually book these speakers 12 months in advance because they're busy and uh, a lot of them are ambassadors or authors, what have you. Um, so that gives us the financial freedom to do the booking, but the guest program is what really helps us. And I will say the pandemic has kind of uh, not been good for our business <laughs> because people don't want to show up. We haven't been able to be in person. We've been Zoom and people are um, kind of Zoomed out, I think, and there's more competition for your attention, uh, be it outside or inside. But we are back at First Pres now. We are um, October 1st. We were in First Presbyterian Church. Pre-pandemic, we usually had over 600 people in attendance at these programs with an average of over 30 guests uh, on a presentation. So we've actually had a high of 770 people show up and guests as many as 80 show up at one presentation. So we are a popular um, program when we are at First Pres. So we have some upcoming speakers. As you can see, we have uh, Nuri Turkle, who's going to talk about the Uyghurs. We have Farah Pandith, who's going to talk about extremism uh, abroad and home. Joby Warwick is a award-winning, Pulitzer Prize award-winning author. We had him come three years ago because he had written a book about Afghanistan, and now we're bringing him back because he have, has a new book, uh, and he was very popular. So the topics we pick, we have a program committee who picks these. They run the gamut from China to climate change to healthcare, whatever, we feel is trending and that people want to hear about that's where we try to pick speakers so from i should note that two speakers a year are international one in the spring and one in the fall we bring in two people from overseas this year we're bringing in a non-men in, in november he is an expert on brexit we brought him in two and a half years ago, right before Brexit happened, and we're bringing him back so he can talk to us about um, the United Kingdom and how it's faring with now that Brexit has happened. And we're bringing Sergei Medvedev in. He is a scholar and an author from Russia, and he's going to basically tell us what's going on in Russia and what they're up to. So. The nice thing about these speakers is we bring them in early because they're international and they need time to rest, and, but we don't let them rest. We basically take them out to the high schools and they go talk to students about uh, their topics, their expertise. So um, we, we keep them busy, but those are two. And again, $20, you can show up at the church and see these gentlemen um, talk. Now, um, before I open it up to questions, I'll just let you know, um, we have been around for 40 years. And you may not have known that because we mostly relied on word of mouth advertising. My friend talked to her friend, she'd bring you as a guest, then she would join. But we realized, and particularly the pandemic made this quite um, obvious to us that we have to do more to reach out to the public because we have a special program. It is unique and there's no other program within 50 miles of here that is like this. It's an affordable education program for everybody. So that is what I am requesting the funds for. I am the funds would go towards marketing our Friday speaker series so that more people knew about it and more people can come on Friday to listen. Um, the pandemic, as bad as it was, actually had some positive effects for us in that um, we lost 50% of our membership, but we were forced to go online. So we went Zoomed last year. Now that we're in back at the church, we are live streaming our programs as well. So guests, they don't have to be here to, um, they don't have to be in the church physically because there's some people who don't want to do that. But there's also other people who are in other states who may want to watch our program and they can watch it live stream now. 
Um, we have decided that we need to do more outreach um, to let people know we exist. So we are now going to all the hotels and the concierges to let them know we exist and that our programs are here and to send their guests if they are interested. As I touched base with the World Affairs Councils of America, there's 94 different councils. There's actually three more councils in South Carolina, and they we all know about each other, but we're going to do a concerted effort to reach out to them and let them know that when their members are coming down to South Carolina, to Hilton Head, that they can come to our programs. And uh, there's programs in Dayton, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Columbus, same thing. We are reaching out to these councils to let them know that we are here and that if they want to send their members when they come visiting in Hilton Head, please do. So um, we are doing more now than we've ever had before because it's kind of a, a new world we, and we have to adapt uh, along with it. So um, we are thinking of new ways to promote our programs and possibly uh, come up with new programs that are more that will attract a younger audience because that I will say our audience is relative they're 65 and older, but that means we're missing a core group of people who are younger so and we recognize this and are actively working to um, to reach that audience so. Do any of you have any questions for thank me, thank you, Ms. Corsick. let me stop um, sharing hold on there we go. Right. There you go. Thank you. Um, Mr. Farrell, we'll go start with you this time. Do you have any questions? All right. Mr. Berghausen. Yes. Um, I think, first of all, your application is very nicely put together. Somebody, you gave this a lot of thought. And I especially appreciate the candor that's in it. Uh, you told it like, like it is, and I appreciate that. It really helps us. Um, I see this largely as an experiment. I, th I think your program sounds very interesting. These are tourism dollars, mm -hmm. and we're spending them to get tourists, heads and beds, tourists in the town of Hilton Head Island. So I say it's an experiment because it's not a whole lot of money and, and we're letting you go try. But ultimately, for, for me to, to continue to support it, I'll need to see some results where we actually are getting tourists because that's what this money is all about. Actually, so. this to your point, I agree. Uh, in the past, I would count heads and guess I would count mostly numbers of people showing up, but this year we have started counting zip codes and we are reaching out to those people who are showing up as guests and um, we have a short mini you know how did you hear about us. Um, did you like the program would you like more information about it so that we're staying in touch and they stay on our contact. List. So we'll, we should be collecting more information this year. I will be honest with you on zoom when you signed up. Uh, it was mostly members we you know if we had two guests on a zoom meeting we were like it, you know our guests kind of went down to zero. Understood we, we just come through a really unusual year but going forward hopefully we see some tourists actually come and that will help us continue to support yes. you your interest. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, James. Uh, Ms. Johnson, do you have any questions? A question and a comment and a question. First, thank you. The educational opportunities that you present for residents, for members, for people who are already here are very impressive. I also have the uh, a concern of not being a direct i'm not seeing a direct measurement of the people that you've brought that you've caused to come here um what has been the specific outreach that you've done that have brought people here once they're here they can certainly take advantage of the great educational opportunities 
and understanding that COVID presented a challenge to that in this past year. But are there any metrics available from fee, uh, past years before COVID that would help us understand what you did, what your efforts did to bring additional heads in beds? Is there Currently, any Currently in the past, data? no. I will be on, we have not, um, we didn't think we needed that, but that is all on our, our bad. But going forward, that's why we talked about, uh, the board talked about reaching out to other councils as an opportunity. Like I said, Dayton, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, these are people who come down directly down 77 to Hilton Head. And um, so that's why we haven't in the past, we are going forward. And so I have nothing to give you from the past. I will have something at the end of this year to give you. Um, which doesn't help, doesn't really answer your question. So sorry. That's a, and a going forward, can you be specific about what you will employ to provide those metrics? What will be your methods of gathering the data? Well, when people sign up, they have to sign up online. I mean, they can, they can call the office and I would take the same metrics, but it pretty much zip code. They have to give me their email address. And those two things will afford me a chance to reach back out to them to ask them um, the survey, the guest survey. So Thank we you do you survey our members, but they're, most members are yeah. either from um, the local zip codes, Hilton Head, Bluffton, Okatee, and a few in Beaufort. Mm -hmm. So Good. Thank you. And mm -hmm. just one final detail question on page eight of the application. Mm -hmm. It said you um, the answer was yes. Have you requested other ATACs or any other funding? The answer was yes, but there was no listing of the organizations or the funds. It was last year. I, I got. Oh, did I? I asked for funds last year from ATACs. That did I misunderstand the question? Uh, perhaps it because no. Uh, nothing was listed okay i was just curious about that so i so did send it in to send dia afterwards but we did um you we you have gave us money i believe it was uh eighty nine hundred dollars yes. or 89 yeah eighty nine hundred and so it has been spent <laughs> yes. so. thank you thank you for clarifying that appreciate it all right thank you Ms. johnson uh, mr thomas do you have any questions No questions, but I'd like to second Jim Berghausen's comment about your application. It was excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, it, it was a good application. Uh, the question I have is you've had John Bolton within the last two weeks. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Was, it, was that a live? live? It was live. Uh, the sad, I, <laughs> because the church limits us to 400 people, I had to tell the public that if you were a guest, you could only live stream. And so we did get 19 guests to live stream out of the 93 who actually live streamed. But I think a lot of people wanted to be there in person and I couldn't, I have 600 members and I needed to guarantee that each of the members had a seat. Now the funny thing is only 250 people showed up, but I couldn't, I mean, I, I literally had people counting heads as they walked in the door. The church is very restrictive on how many people they have. And so I have to, that's the only place that can actually um, give us enough space to house our speaker and the amount of people that show up. So we're kind of at their, uh, whatever they say we do. <laughs> so. So if I if I've got that right, you had 250 approximately in person mm -hmm. and 93 streaming. Correct, and we actually had 197 people view the video after the fact. So okay. what we do video record our programs, and we put them up on our website for members only. So you don't this way again. Uh, pandemic kind of forced our hand. We had to think out of the box. If you're not going to be able to see it on that Friday you still have an opportunity to watch it else elsewhere. So of those 350 to 450 people who have viewed either in person or online, Correct. that you have the, uh, do you have the demographics on that? 
like the zip codes and such? Zip codes, yes. And uh, I don't have their age group. I mean, I guess we could ask, but it's, um, I will say most of them are 60 and older. <laughs> so. Would you uh, provide to Sundaya or to the committee the breakdown of what you have for this year so we can see kind of what your numbers are? I did. Are. I actually sent her last year's uh, attendance records mm -hmm. of guests, and I also sent her, it was the Zoom records, and then right. um, two previous years of attendance and guests. I don't have a but breakdown I'd like to see the, of zip. I'd like to see the zip code breakdown because, again, yeah. you know, uh, you know, you're, you were very honest in your application that there are few, if any, tourists involved in your, have been involved in your, um, in your presentations in the past. And uh, I have to say, I was, I've been a guest uh, mm -hmm. online, um, and um, I think it would be, uh, from my own personal point of view, I think younger people need to probably hear some of the things that I agree. Um, that, that your organization brings out because I think that uh, a disservice is being done in the way of history and in social studies and sociology or in all those different uh, fields right now uh, as to what's going on in the world. So I, uh, it's a little different than it was 50 years ago or 40 years ago when, when we were in school and, and things were taught a different way, whether they were right or wrong as we're now finding out, but at least um, it was taught. <laughs> I don't know that it is today. So uh, I, I commend you on your application. Uh, we just, uh, our concerns are, I think from the members of the committee that have spoken is that we need to, uh, this is a tourist focused tax. Beds and beds, and beds. I understand. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have anything they want to follow up with at this time? I do. I do, Mr. Chairman. I want to apologize sure. for my technical difficulty there <laughs> from summer ago. I'm challenged that way. I also would like to point out that some of, while we do like to have things quantifiable to the best of our ability with regards to what our charge is as a committee, I do think the more we're, op we're given the opportunity to give people another reason to come to Hilton Head that's not just golf, tennis, and beach. That's why I applaud uh, Ms. Maureen and her efforts on this. And I think it's a wonderful addition to this community. And I think it, we're kind of betting on the come that when people are here, at, when they leave and say, man, I had no idea there is these additional things to do other than what, that they're apt to come back. So our, our payment or our uh, benefits to these are, are probably forthcoming is what I would, I would suggest, or I would uh, bet on. So thank you. I think it's I think it's a great addition to this community. Thank you. Well, and I should let you know, last year I had three separate people tell me that the World Affairs Council was a factor in their decision to retire here. Now they didn't that doesn't put heads in beds, but they actually when they were looking for a community to retire to, they looked at a place that had tennis and golf, but other like a symphony and educational programs. So to your point, um, it, there, not everybody wants to go to the beach and that's where we have to do a better job on our end of letting people know we exist and the opportunities that they have, so. All right, thank you, Ms. Corsick. If you could get the, uh, the zip code breakdowns of that John Bolton um, presentation to Cynthia so we can have I can. that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your time and appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Uh, our next presentation will be from the Hilton Head Concourse. So, so do we have a representative from them? Yes, sir. I'm getting Lindsay Harrell and Mr. Bob Lee online. Lindsay and Mr. Bob. I believe you're still on mute, Mr. Bob. And there's Morning. Lindsay. Lindsay, you're still on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Good right. morning. And you can begin your presentation when you're ready. Okay, um, Cindy, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end this morning, it seems. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I've been I've been very static in a lot of Zoom meetings recently, so I've been trying to figure out what's going on. So my apologies if it starts to sound that way. Please let me know. Um, and Bob, Bob Lee, would you be able to share our presentation? Because I'm afraid it might screw up my connection as well. Okay, can, <clears throat> can you go ahead and get it started so I can get it cranked up here? 
get the presentation started? Yeah. Okay, I'll just, let me try and share it from my end and then we'll just go from there. All right. Hold on one second. Okay, can everyone see my monitor? Not yet. There you go. It's there. You can hear me yes. okay too. I'm not, I'm not static. You're okay. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Well, now I'll officially get going. So here, here we go. Um, I'm Lindsay Harrell. I'm the president of the Hilton Head Island Concord. And Bob Lee from our board of directors is here with me today, as you, as you know. Um, we're thrilled to be with you this morning. And thank you for your time um, in advance and your consideration for our request this year. We'd like to kick off our presentation with a very short video that we launched at the beginning of the year, which really allowed us to reintroduce ourselves to people as we we're coming out of having a year off last year thanks to COVID. So let me just go ahead and play this for you and then we'll get into the meat of our presentation. Okay, and I'm having, bear with me. Sandeya, do you have access to our PowerPoint? I do. I'm pulling it up right now. Bear okay. with me just one moment. My apologies. I even updated my Zoom this morning, hoping that would help. Well, you don't want me on your IT team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd think I'd have it down by now after, what, a year and a half of being on Zoom? And Cindy, if you can't get to it, I, I can crank it up. It's trying, so bear with me just a second. Hopefully this is not marks against us. <laughs> We're having no. tech problems. You have little hand puppets or something? Yeah. <laughs> Hot Wheel cars. No plan. I have plenty of Hot Wheel cars. <laughs> yes, my son is all about those. Remember that FedEx commercial with the positively has to get there overnight? Yep. Cindy, do you want Bob to give it a shot? I think I have it. So okay. let me. And if you'll just optimize it for sound when you share your screen so the sound plays with the video. I'm switching to the big computer. <laughs> I have my laptop and um, let's see. Ah. I hope this works. Oh, wait, if you can, um, the sound is not playing. I don't have sound on the screen that I am on. Okay, well, we'll just watch it. That's okay. <laughs> Can everyone see it okay? Yeah.
what you're seeing is video from the 2019 event. All right, so Dave, you'll just advance it to the next slide. That would be great. So again, apologies for our technical difficulties. Um, what that video <clears throat> really allowed us to do, we we so missed last year being able to host our event and the, the sights and the sounds and the smells and everything that comes with the car show. And that video for us was a way to kind of bring it as best we could to life for everyone. Um, at the beginning of this year to kind of, like I said, reintroduce ourselves and get people excited for the fact that we were planning a return this fall. So I know you've seen this information before. We shared this information in our presentation last year. Unfortunately, we don't have any new event data to share with you because we didn't have an event last year. But I did just want to touch on some of the highlights from our 2019 show since it was our last event that we physically held at the Port Royal Golf Club. Um, we had record attendance in 2019. We had just over 18,000 people. Um, we had half of those people coming from outside of a 50 mile radius, uh, over an $8 million economic impact and a record online and advanced ticket sales. Now, mind you, I know you all are familiar that we've had a Savannah component of the event in the past. These results are specific to the Hilton Head Island side of the event from 2019. And there you can see our 2019 Best of Show winner, Mr. Bob Jepson from Savannah, um, who will be back this year showing a car as well. So we're excited to welcome him back in 2021. Um, Sunday, if you can just advance. So to give you an update on where we are for this year, as you can imagine, we are thrilled. We are back. Um, and thanks to the support and efforts of a number of constitu constituencies, the town included, um, despite what we went through last year, as everyone went through it, we're entering this year finan financially secure and liquid and are returning to the fairways of the Port Royal Golf Club bigger and better than ever. Um, I knew everyone was excited to get back, but uh, the results are really showing that. We have the largest show field that we've ever had, record number of cars. Um, we have over 250 cars in the Concours itself on Sunday. We have a whole additional fairway of cars with our partnership with the Legends of the Autobahn event this year, which is bringing 150 cars from the BMW, Mercedes, and Audi National Clubs. We have a record number of Stutzes that will be on display this year to celebrate our honored mark. We've been working very closely with this, the National Stutz Club to put that together. And we had a board member promise if we hit a record number, he'd be doing backflips out at the show field. So that'll be a show within the show if you guys want to come out and watch him do that. Um, this year, we also are doing our, we're continuing our life exhibit. Our life exhibit, if you're familiar with our event, is the changing theme every year. We've done everything from life on the big screen to life in the military. This year, we're hitting the hot topic, electric vehicles, life electric. So we're going to have about 25 cars on display from the early 1900s to present day. So it's really going to show the history of the electric vehicle because as most people don't realize, electric vehicles were actually made in the early 1900s and might have been the primary option over the, um, the combustion engine. So it's very exciting um, to have that display. And we're welcoming back our second annual Women Driving America program, which is also bigger and better. It's up 50%. We have 50% more female exhibitors and judges participating this year. And 2020 in COVID saw a huge boom of women in the collector industry. There's been a lot of things happening around that. And we like to think we were on the cusp of it, introducing that program in 2019. Um, we've had three hotel blocks on the island, the Westin, the Hampton Inn, and the Hilton Garden Inn. Um, all of those, we've been seeing record numbers at the hotel, faster sellouts at the Westin. Um, and then in addition to our blocks, the Classic Car Club of America and the BMW Club both have blocks at the Senesta, and the Mercedes-Benz Club of America has an additional block at the Omni. So the Concor audience seems to be taking over the hotels this first weekend in November, which we're thrilled about. Sponsors are back. Uh, of course, as you can imagine, we have lost a few. 
but our major players are back. Lexus, Porsche, BMW are back at the same participation that they've traditionally been. We've got a number of sponsors that have increased their participation since their last time with us in 2019. For instance, Foreign Cars Italia, which is a Ferrari dealer out of the Charlotte area, they are, in addition to their normal sponsorship, they are adding on and supporting our Women Driving America program and offering private test drives for our Women Driving America participants this year. Um, so we're really thrilled to see the sponsors returning. And in addition to those that are returning, we've got exciting new ones joining us this year for the first time ever. The Lamborghini dealer out of Charlotte is joining us. They heard about McLaren's success in 2019 and quickly jumped on board with us this year. Bring a trailer if you're at all familiar with car auctions. They have um, taken over online car auctions and they are a huge player in the game. And they are coming on board this year as a sponsor of ours and our official auction partner, which is really exciting. And with someone like a Bring a Trailer, not only do you get the sponsorship, but you get the exposure to their audience. And they have a huge social media and online presence, which is also a, just an added benefit to that sponsorship. We've got a number of wonderful guests joining us this year. Um, as you know from our past presentations, the Hilton Head Concours has become known as the Designers Concours. Um, we feature designers each year um, throughout the event, but really at our Saturday night dinner where they sketch live and help us raise money for our charities. Uh, this year's designers include some names we're all familiar with, Jay Ward from Pixar, Maury Callum, who just retired as the head of design from Ford, and we have a new designer coming that we're really excited about. It's the current head of design for General Motors, Michael Simcoe. So we feel very blessed to have him coming and joining us this year. In addition to being with us at the show and sketching to help raise money for charity, those designers are also going to be judging the finalists from Beaufort County High School's Michelin Junior Challenge Design. So the students are gonna have an opportunity to meet and interact with these designers as well. And it's just a really special experience to offer students. I never had an opportunity like that in high school or even college. So it's really special to see the interaction between these designers and the students while they're together. Um, in addition to the designers, we've got a couple other VIPs coming in. Lynn St. James, who's a legendary female race car driver, is coming for the first time ever. She's been to the Savannah part of the event. This is her first time coming to Hilton Head, and she's going to be a judge with us during the Concours. Um, we're really excited to have her. Dennis Gage from My Classic Car will be our announcer for the Car Club Showcase on Saturday. And if, if you know the Pringles man with the mustache, that's Dennis Gage. Um, and then we've got a couple other special VIPs coming into town, first time ever with us. Wes Duesenberg, of course, his family is the Duesenberg family of the Duesenberg Automobile. And then a woman named Saran Castle, who donated the famous Castle Duesenberg to the Auburn Court Duesenberg Museum. She will be joining us as well this year. So we're excited to have some new names um, to show Hilton Head Island off to, because I think it's their first time to the area. We significantly increased this year our digital advertising spend and presence. Um, we focused the majority of our advertising spend on digital, which we've never done before. Um, and it was sort of, you know, a testing ground to see how do we do. And we're, we've seen what we think are amazing results. We've captured over 4 million digital impressions and over 400,000 social media impressions. Um, and that's just through the end um, of August at the time of our application. So we've been obviously continuing to promote the event since then as well. Our click-through rates are higher than the national averages and our social media followings are also up. Compared to this time last year, our page likes are up 66% on Facebook and our followers are up 40%. And we're ranked um, amongst our competitive set we're ranked second, only um, second only to Pebble Beach. And the Pebble Beach Concours, as you all know, is, is the granddaddy of the American Concours events. And I think that our efforts show, as you can see in this last bullet point, our ticket sales um, are from this time last year are up uh, actually over 300% from 2019. Our total ticket sales are up about 80%. That includes all of the hospitality components and the VIP tickets. But if you look just at the general admission, that's where we're up over 300%. So we've actually been adjusting things on our end to accommodate what we think are gonna be much bigger crowds than what we've seen in past years. Zendaya, if you can advance to the next slide.
So next year, which is really what we're here to talk about, is a really big year for us. It's year 20 for the Hilton Head Island Concord Elegance and Motoring Festival, which, which just kind of blows my mind. And we are already working on um, some plans to help celebrate that milestone year. We're going to be inviting all of our past Best of Show winners um, from the previous 19 years to come back and display as part of the 20th celebration. And this painting that you see here is actually something that we've been working with Amiri Ferris on, the local artist. He is painting all of our past best of show winners to use in our invitations to those owners. Um, so we're, we're really excited to not only showcase the event and their cars, but the local talent and the local culture of Hilton Head Island as well. We're also going to do a best of our life exhibit. The life exhibit, as I mentioned earlier, is one of our most popular features. It really, it captures everybody, whether you're a car person or not, the life exhibit is a fun thing to see. Um, so we're gonna do a best of and feature everything from life on the road with vintage campers and RVs to life on the big screen with cars from the movies to life on the farm with old farm equipment. So it's gonna be a really fun display to kind of walk us back through time of the Hilton Head Island Concours. And then we're gonna invite a lot of our past dignitaries, the past designers that have participated with us, um, the past executives that have participated. Bob Lutz has been an honorary chairman of ours. Bobby Ray Hall has been an honorary chairman. These are people we'd like to see come back and potentially do something special around at perhaps our Saturday night event. And then what you probably noticed in our application is that we did ask for uh, slightly more funding than what we were granted in for the 2020 event. I didn't look at last year's funding because we did not request, uh, we, we only requested last year what we had spent um, and we kind of held the, the 2020 funding we had been given to use this year. So if I fast or if I rewind to two years ago, we looked at that request and we increased it by $25,000. And that $25,000 would be spent specifically to recruit social media influencers. I think we all know what the role of a social media influencer is these days, but we really wanna be able to tap into their networks and use them to endorse our event. Um, and they would trust their endorsement uh, much more than anything. So we're hoping to um, recruit specific number of influencers, both in the automotive space and also in the luxury and lifestyle travel. And I actually just spoke with Charlie Clark from the VCB the other day, and we discussed getting together to cultivate a list of some of the lifestyle and luxury influencers that would capture both the event and the island. So that's something we are hoping to do and hoping to introduce next year. Cindy, if you can advance to the next slide. As you know from our application, um, there have, there's a long list of Concours events. This is just a short list of the other Concours events that exist um, around the country. Um, and because of the support that we've been given from you all over the years, we're lucky to be towards the top of the list of all the Concours events. Um, we're consistently ranked in the top three or four around the country. Every year the list grow, adds new events and every year the list loses other events. Um, for instance, the Chattanooga event that you see at the bottom here and the Audrain Concours, which is in Newport, Rhode Island, those are newer events that have come up in the last two or three years. Um, and then events like the Atlanta Concours, which you don't see here, has gone away. So it's, it's, an, it's a changing dynamic every year. But um, be, again, because of the support that we receive from you all consistently, we're able to hold our place, hold our position, and stay at the top. The interesting thing that's transpired over the last year to year and a half, you can see the name Haggerty here with three of the different events. Haggerty is an insurance company for classic cars, if you're, if you're not familiar with who they are. They are quickly expanding, they are going public, and in that process, they are buying up events on the, on the calendar. They've recently bought the Greenwich Concours, the Concours of America, which is in Michigan, and the Amelia Island Concours was just announced after Amelia Island show this past May. So more so than ever, to keep our momentum, to keep ourselves differentiated, it's even more important. So support from you all will only help to continue to grow us and to keep us different and at the top of the list. So um, Cindy, if you'll just advance to the last slide. I'll just start wrapping up, but we, we um, thank you for your support. Again, I apologize for our technical difficulties this morning. 
we would not be the event that we are or where we are in this space of, of Concours events without the support of the town and the ATAX committee. And, you know, we are continually not only competing with those other Concours events that you just saw, but we're competing with all other events. So um, we really appreciate what you all have done for us. And at this time, if there are any questions, I'm open to take your questions. Thank you, Ms. Harrell. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Berghausen this time. Mr. Berghausen. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of observations and, and, a, and a question or two. Uh, I'm impressed with the tracking that you all have. Um, I'm uh, big on accountability for the for the money we're handing out and to to see that you're tracking uh, who comes and and you have, are demonstrating that you know a lot about the people you're attracting, not only 50% tourists, but multi-night stays. Uh, that's really good information. I oftentimes reduce it to, uh, as a guide for myself, uh, the cost per tourist. If you're asking for $307,000 and you bring in X tourists about what's that come out to, uh, the neighborhood of uh, $30 a tourist and at a, a 2% uh, head tax, you know, bed tax, uh, that tourist has to spend $1,675 on accommodations um, for us to just break even on this. And with multi-night stays, you got a shot at it. And so um, this um, event seems to a accomplish, be a great example of accomplishing what we want to accomplish. And thank you for your efforts in tracking that. The, the one thing I did notice that just strikes me as a little funny is, is you've got hotel blocks and all but one of them are in the town of Hilton Head Island. So we are giving you $307,000 and you're, you're taking a block outside of the town. Um, that's the good news, it's only one, one, one hotel, but it's just a little awkward that that other town is, I, I don't think, providing any money to you. And no, Bluffton, no. And I, I, I guess this is where I'm fuzzy, is that is the Hilton Garden, and I assume because of its location, even though it's over the bridge, it's got the Hilton Head Island address. I, so does that not I, contribute to the telling. ATAX funding? I think that's just a mailing address. I think okay. it's outside of the town of Hilton Head Island. And so I just share it as an observation. It's a little unusual. That's all I have. Okay. All right. Thank, thank, thank you, Jane. You. Uh, Ms. Johnson, do you have any comments or questions? Well, thank you for a robust presentation. And I always look forward to seeing the cool cars on Hilton Head. The one question I had, you did answer, which was uh, the dip in re request for funds from 2020 to 2021, and then the increase now. So I understand that. Thank you. No other Thank questions. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Mr. Thomas, any questions or comments? Just another very well done presentation, Lindsay. Thank you very much for that. And I Thank really you. don't have any questions. I uh, going along Jim's line of of reasoning. Uh, not necessarily with respect to the location of the Hilton Garden Inn, but with the cost per tourist. Uh, if your numbers this year are in increase at the rate that your reservations have increased at this point, then that cost per tourist could be even lower. And, and uh, I think this is a, a, a very worthy event of our support. And it does bring a lot of tourists to Hilton Head, who probably wouldn't be here otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Arnold, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, just want to thank you for the presentation. Um, it is an awesome event and great to see cool cars come to the island. So thank you for that. Uh, and this is one of those events you can't do via Zoom. So it's one of those that you have to be in person and your field is growing, your reach is growing. Um, one question I do have or looking through the, 
the presentation and the information provided is you have this 230% increase from 2019. Um, I would assume that it would bring increased revenues. And as part of the accommodation tax grant, we'd like to see organizations start taking steps back as they grow. I know that you need a springboard to grow your event to where it is now, but could you speak to what your thoughts are, what the future looks like? Are requests gonna to continue to go up 9% each year or do you guys have hopes of coming off of the grant request in the future? You know, I, I, we get asked this question, um, I feel like each year we make our presentation. I, I don't foresee the grant request continuing to go up. However, I would like to see, continue to see the grant request being made because as at this point, the uh, funding that we receive from the ATAX committee, in addition to the smaller funds we receive from Beaufort County ATAX and also from South Carolina PRT, those funds make up 100% of our marketing budget. So if we were to scale back on the request, we would have to scale back on our marketing um, to probably to some extent. I mean, keep in mind, a lot of what we do is to, to raise money for scholarship funds and charities. So we're trying to grow that at the same time. So I, I don't believe you're going to keep seeing incremental increases from us every single year. What I would like to see, though, is that the funds continue to hold. And I mean, yes, would we love to be at the point where we could say we've got money coming out of our ears and we can step back from this process. But, you know, our goal is to continue to raise money for the local charities that we support and the scholarships that we support as well. And the town support to help us cover our marketing expenses allows us to do that as well. I'd like to add one thing, too, if I can. <clears throat> Um, if you look at our event, um, you know, on a million three, million three five budget, our ticket sales are $180,000. So tickets do not make up a major part of our revenue. And that's very, very typical of, of events like ours. They really come in from sponsor development and being able to build sponsorship, uh, the sponsorship base. Uh, but we have found that our online ticket sales track directly to our uh, attendance. And... As online ticket sales go up, attendance goes up. And every time we had a record year, we had record online ticket sales. So we're fully anticipating that to be the case um, this year. The only thing that could interrupt that is if we have rainy days on that Saturday or Sunday, which there's nothing that we can um, control. But with those increased attendances, the cost of creating the event actually go up as well. As, uh, as Lindsay alluded to, um, because we're expecting record attendance because of what we've seen with our online ticket sales, we're having to increase basically the facility costs out there of, you know, um, the, uh, the toilets, the garbage removal, the shuttles, all those things directly tied to the attendance um, that we're, we're projecting. Great. Well, we're happy with your success and uh, welcome back in person. Thank you. We're so excited. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mr. Farrell, do you have any comments or questions? I don't see Mr. Farrell, Mr. Fluker. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, my only, uh, again, great, a great presentation. It's, a, it's an event that I, uh, I attended back in 2019 during the last uh, in-person in event. Um, do you have any indication as to what your numbers might be this year based on your ticket sales? Uh, you know, uh, I, I would hate to say, because like I said, we can't control the weather mm -hmm. and um, roughly 40 to 50% of our revenues, ticket revenues are at the gate. Um, what I would say is that most of the uh, at the gate sales tend to be more local uh, purchases. Most of the visitors that come to our event do buy in advance. So um, I can tell you that a week ago, um, our ticket sales were already equivalent to where we were at the end of October back in 2019. So we were running roughly a month ahead of where we were in 2019 in ticket sales. And a significant portion of those are the um, out of market uh, sales. So um, I would say we're going to have record visitor sales because of what we're seeing with online sales, but total attendance is just hard to know because 40 to 50 percent are at the gate. All right, thank you. Anybody from the committee have any follow-ups? Mr. Fluker? Yes. Cynthia here. 
Um, one thing to note, Mr. Farrell emailed and said that the computers are down at Sea Pines. However, I also wanted to let you know that I am able to share the video that Lindsay had, but I'm going to have to mute everyone so you can hear it. Okay, go ahead. So if you, okay, so if you bear with me, just one moment. It's a competition style and This is what it's I don't think it's going to start. You would imagine it would get some attention. Experiencing the fastest one on the right. It's a top tier. I hope that worked out okay. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't. I didn't hear much of the sound. I'm not sure if you all did, but Zendaya, what I can do is I could share that YouTube link because um, we've got it on our YouTube page with you, so they can see it. Um, following I, the one thing you miss is it's it's if, if you know the history of this event, Paul Doring, who was our founder, it's actually a, a recording of him from several years ago that we pulled out of our archives and used. And it's a really special video actually for all of us involved in organizing the event, but I'll send the link. And there's a there's another fun video I'd love to share with you all too that we put out at the beginning of the year to help build excitement again for the event um, after the hiatus we had last year. So Sandeya, I'll just email those both to you. And if you can distribute, that'd be great. Yes, that would be perfect. No okay, <laughs> thank you. So sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Lindsay and Bob. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, our next presentation if they're available from Low Country Goa. Yes, Ms. Graves Sellers. Ms. Luana. There she is. You're on mute. There you are. Great. Now I can see everybody. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Sellers. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Fluker and committee. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you. And I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I'll share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? No. Let me see. Okay, how about now? 
Yes, we can see your presentation there. Perfect. Here we go. Great. Again, thank you so much for allowing Low Country Gullah to um, <clears throat> have this opportunity to present to you. And so what is Low Country Gullah? Low Country Gullah was developed to promote and more importantly document the richly significant Gullah culture, culture and its contributions to the United States by sustaining it through education, information, and preservation. The website lowcountrygullah.com serves as an interconnected resource between cultural assets as it educates, documents, and not only preserves Gullah history, but ensures that the historic Gullah land is protected. This is the website, Low Country Gullah, and these are some of the stories and information that the site um, provides. If you look at it, um, not only are there articles and information about Hilton Head First families, um, cultural and traditional information like about the Gullah Ring Shout and other information such as that, as well as videos and information that tie us directly to some of the assets that are around Hilton Head, such as Mitchellville. So what is Low Country Gullah? Low Country Gullah is not only a cultural influencer, but we also promote cultural tourism. We're a Gullah storyteller. We're an educational resource, as well as an ancestral cultural connector. And we provide non-traditional interconnected access to informa informational resources. And I'm gonna go into a lot of detail regarding that. So why do we honor the significance of Gullah history? As a historical resource and cultural influence, cultural tourism influencer, we provide a central and necessary link to the cultural elements that have been woven into the fabric of American society. And so we are a one-stop shop for not only the culture on Hilton Head, but throughout the Gullah Geechee corridor, uh, uh, corridor, as well as stimulating cultural tourism. So with a primary focus on traditional cultural strengths on Hilton Head, as well as because of its central location within the corridor, we bridge the communities that um, range from North Carolina through Florida and 35 mil miles inland. So what is our mission? In addition to promoting cultural tourism, we also provide through fundraising and donations, preservation and are able to sustain the culture throughout our historic Gullah land preservation program. And if you notice uh, recently, we were very successful in, in helping save uh, Gullah land in, uh, the, in Hilton Head. And this is um, more information on our program. So who do we reach? Primarily, we meet, reach a male audience, about 52% and 48% female. And between the ages of 24 to 65 and up, but 89% of our audience is between 18 and 54 years old, which is perfect because the, the site reaches people when they're on the go and wherever they are. So whether it's desktop, on the tablet, or in their mobile phone, we're able to reach low, uh, low country Gullah reaches everyone wherever they are. So who do we reach? We're in line with the island's targeted tourist profiles. So a lot of the, the specific tourist profiles that uh, the chamber and other um, groups that you'll be seeing later today and next week, they're reaching sports enthusiasts. They're also reaching um, food and drink and um, foodies, as well as travel and tourist destinations with historical sites and buildings. And this is the category that Low Country Gullah really focuses on. So what is cultural tourism? Cultural tourism is the movement of people to cultural attractions with the intention of gathering new information and experiences to satisfy their cultural needs. 
And what is genealogy tourism? Genealogy tourism and, or heritage tourism or even roots tourism is people traveling to discover more about who they are, their rootedness in a place, or search for authentic self-identification and experiences. And both of these categories is exactly what Low Country Gullah really targets. And so as you can see, I've started to gather some of the, the comments that, that um, followers are, are sharing with us because of the fact that they're able to enjoy and are hungry for cultural information. So why is, Gullah, why is uh, cultural heritage and genealogy tourism considered one of the fastest growing segments? Because cultural tourism accounts for $171 billion in annual spending. 81% of tourists are considered cultural tourists. They travel more, they spend more, and they stay more. They're considered more affluent and educated. And most of them are millennials, as well as their, their vacation includes a cultural, art, historic, heritage activity or event while they're traveling. So these are some more of some of the things that people are saying to, to uh, express the fact that not only are they looking for things, Gullah, but that they also want to experience other cultures. And as you can see, some of the information and the, the um, feedback that we've been getting is that people are really not only experiencing this, but they're also, it's, it's becoming really a emotional connection to the culture that has been become established. So why are we highlighting the culture? People are actually starving for historic information. They're starving to learn about new cultures, as well as establish a genealogical connection to their heritage on a global, global level. And specifically for the Black community, especially searching for that tangible connection to the culture provides a priceless sense of identity. So one of the things that people have been sharing with us is that this is more than just information. It's, it's more than just uh, a destination. It is a cultural identification. And in, at a time where ancestry research and being able to identify yourself is part of our society, it's a perfect time to promote the culture and its relevance to a broader audience. And so these are some more of the comments that we're getting. This particular um, photo on the side of the screen was someone who actually came, is doing a 50 state tour and looking for her identity and um, uh, expanding her, her um, desire to have um, a cultural connection. So one of the questions that the committee asked me is how am I measuring all of this? Well, this is one of the articles that is um, currently on the site that um, specifically speaks to Hilton Head. And this is further down on the page where it actually has links to all of the different cultural um, um, partners that are around the island, as well as a link to the chamber, so that if someone is looking for a specific place to stay or things to do, um, any kind of recommendations, they can uh, link directly to the chamber website. And this site, um, that specific page, has become one of the top 10 pages that focus on Hilton Head. And as, as, as you can see, that page is number four with um, over 7,700 page views that have occurred on it. And the page, that specific page has only been up for uh, about three or four months now. And so it has uh, obtained about 7,700 um, page views on its own. The category page uh, has over 7,500 um, 
page views. And that is the specific to Hilton Head page. And then the number 10 on the list is one of the videos that uh, documentaries that we did this year with Mitchellville. And so you can see um, in combining all of those that 18,000 page views have gone to uh, look into what Hilton Head is, um, what is interesting about Hilton Head on the site. And so not only are the followers interested in culture, but they're also planning trips to Hilton Head. And these next few slides just give you an indication of specific um, requests or shares that people are saying because they're interested in coming. They're, they've seen something in the uh, site or on Facebook that interests them. And they're, they're sharing the fact that um, we want to, to be there. And some of the people like this particular person um, is showing that her heart is really full because of the information and the connection that she has been able to obtain. So in addition to people coming, they're also asking for recommendations. They're asking for accommodations. They want to know where I can go, what I can do, and um, experience not only the culture, but the, the, um, the island as a whole. So one of Low Country Gullah's strengths is that we cross promote with all of the island's cultural assets. Historic Mitchellville, we did the uh, documentary this year exploring the historic families of Mitchellville, as well as articles on their master plan to keep people updated and the archeological dig that they um, are uh, currently working on. We've done information with the Gullah Museum, as well as the um, Heritage Library, um, and we participated in their um, promotional video, Our Storied Island, did an article on a greater sense of place, which connected the history of, of my ancestor uh, to the island, as well as how to, to um, get people started on discovering their roots and um, referring them back to the Heritage Library. We've also partnered with the Coastal Discovery Museum, did an article on their upcoming slave project, as well as Fort Howell. We included that in the story of Low Country Gullah, as well as a lot of the different pieces, um, for instance, the um, Exploring Historic Families of Mitchellville uh, documentary as well. So these are some of those articles that um, that you can find on the page uh, based on the descriptions that I just gave you. So in one year, Low Country Gullah has grown substantially, not only through our users and page views and our sessions, but from year to year. Last year we when we presented to you, we had a little bit um, around 25,000 page views. And as of this year, um, not even uh, including October, we have uh, surpassed over 200,000 page views with um, 37,000 new users on the site. And so every single day, we are increasing our, um, not only site visitors, but our social media followers. And this is an idea of month to month, how many people have increased through the website. Starting in January, we had about 573 uh, that, that were following us. In February is when we launched the documentary with Mitchellville. Uh, on uh, the exploring Mitchellville and the historic families. And since then, in, in addition to other projects, we have grown to um, over uh, 12,000 in, uh, in August and uh, 10,000 in September. And through our reach, we have been able to 
cover every state. And as you can see, the majority of the, the states that are following us aren't even South Carolina. Uh, we reach as far as California, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida and Texas and New York, Virginia and Maryland. So those are our top 10 states that are following us. And not only do we have a um, domestic following, but we also have a worldwide audience. So this was the map in 2020 of how many people were um, countries we were reaching. And this is where we are in blue now. So basically we are reaching the majority of the world. And these are the top 30 international countries that have been accessing our site. So our strength is on social media. And as you can see from this chart, the majority of the uh, channels that um, are feeding into the website do come from social media. And so our social media audience, yes, we do have some local um, Hilton Head um, followers, but from Hilton Head, we go around the country and um, are, are um, truly reaching a, a diverse audience. And of course, with uh, social media, we also have a large international following as well. So in addition to our delivering articles, this year, Low Country Gullah expanded into visual medium to, um, as well as adding social media platforms. And so in addition to the Facebook, Instagram, you, and, and Instagram channels that we were on, we've added the YouTube channel, a LinkedIn channel, as well as a Twitter channel. And so with our growth, we have added um, just a few on LinkedIn and, tw uh, and Twitter. However, on Facebook, in the beginning of this year, we had started with about 5,000, I mean 500 Facebook users, and now we're about um, 8,600. 8, 8, with Instagram, we started this year with about 3,000 followers, and now we are over 4,000. And with YouTube, we started with zero, and so far we have had 37 uh, views of the, the videos and documentaries that we've put up, and our newsletter is growing um, significantly as well and that we went from 123 at the beginning of this year to um, over 900 as of now. So on our YouTube channel, as I mentioned earlier, we have the, the um, Freedom Day video exploring the first families with historic Mitchellville. And so far that has received over 1400 views. Our storied island that we also share um, with the Heritage Library that has had 156 views. We did a, a, a documentary on Juneteenth, the birth of freedom. So far that has had over 600 views. We are um, completing production on a Harriet Tubman from the railroad to a spy, which includes her um, time on Hilton Head for, and we will be doing a February release for that along with the Gullah celebration. And um, we have a video on preserving historic Hilton Head, which we have not fully released yet. So that's only had 64 uh, views, but the story of Gull Low Country Gullah has had over 200 views and another story about a uh, US colored troop soldier who, um, who has um, was been on the island. And just to give you an idea of some of the productions that we've been doing, this is the story of Low Country Gullah.
Can you all hear this? No. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not hearing any audio. You can't hear? No. No. No, ma'am. Ms. Luana, if you wanted to send it to me, I can by all means forward this part to the committee. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah. If you'll just send the link okay. to Yosendea and then she can send us that link. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I'll be happy to do that. Um, the These are uh, a few of the other um, um, uh, documentaries and videos that we have also done just so that you can get an idea of, of each of these titles. And this is the one that will be coming out in uh, debuting in uh, February. In addition to videos, we've also taken the uh, show on um, Coastal with Catherine and been able to do a walk around Mitchellville and promote not only the culture, but the island and the history through, through um, this um, avenue as well. So what's next for Low Country Gullah? We're going to, um, we've already established ourselves as, as a cultural resource. And through that, we promote Hilton Head as a cultural significance, not only for its history, but, um, also for the genealogical connections that um, have, uh, people have been able to establish. We've created a, a significant online dialogue. And so we are continuing to have those conversations. I'm continuing to help create uh, that connection so people know that Hilton Head if they are not able to establish where their, their ancestry comes from, if they're Black American, that Mitchellville is definitely a place where they can try and find some connection. Um, in addition to all of those things, we are gonna continue the collaborations that we are working on. Uh, this November, uh, we are partnering with NIPCA for a full gala celebration, as well as we have some upcoming collaborations with the Heritage Library on some, some um, other projects. So we're ex really excited about where we are, um, what we've been able to accomplish, and uh, where we're going from now. So do, can, is there any questions that I can answer for anybody? All right, thank you, Ms. Sellers. Um, sure, we'll, thank you. Yeah, you know, we're gonna go ahead and start our uh, Round Robin here, so to speak. Ms. Johnson, you're first up this time. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, good, after, good morning, Ms. Sellers. Thank you good for morning. your presentation, which was a great compliment to your written ATAX application. So it added a lot of information. I'm just a comment, I'm particularly grateful for your definition of cultural tourism as historical tourism and genealogical tourism. I think those are all important aspects that cuts across uh, all visitors and residents on Hilton Head Island. As a cultural influencer, here's my question. How will you answer our challenge, which is to show that your efforts or Low Country Goa's efforts are specifically bringing people here to Hilton Head to put heads in beds and causing people to return. So how are you going to define those metrics? Um, three different ways. And um, I did get that question. So I, I um, sent some details in an email yesterday. Um, in addition to doing local events, so far we've done about three this year, and we have several more. We do gather zip codes when we uh, do go on the road, so to speak. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are gathering zip codes when people are signing up for the um, newsletter. And however, uh, we can gather that information regarding where people are coming from. And the, the specific link that, that I showed you that showed the um, Hilton Head page, I can track the specific links. So if, if someone is looking for 
accommodations. I have data regarding how many of uh, the people who are not only on that page, but that they're tracking, that they're specifically going to the link on the accommodations or recommendations or the different partnering um, um, entities that are on the page. So I'm able to track all of that information. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Mr. Mr. Thomas, do you have any comments or questions? What? I was trying to unmute the wrong place. I'm kind of like John Farrell, very challenged uh, technologically. Luana, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm blown away. Uh, a lot of progress that you have made in one short year. And, uh, you know, I see that the foundation is being laid for something that is uh, very definitely uh, in the in the direction of becoming a powerful attractor of people to the story of the Gullah uh, culture and, and Gullah people. Um, I understand the challenges that you have with the uh, uh, hard data that track the heads to the beds, you know, coming through the social media uh, channels, but um, I looked at some of those, uh, some of the quotes that you put up, um, and they were only up there for a short period of time, but they were clear evidence to me that it is directly influencing people to want to come to Hilton Head, whether they follow through and book, I can't be sure, but a lot of those comments said that you're definitely uh, having an impact in that regard, so congratulations on that. Thank you very no, much. I have no questions. Other, oh, wait, one other comment. If you haven't had a chance to watch some of the, the uh, productions that uh, Low Country Gullah has done, uh, you should take a chance to do that because they are really a very good quality of production and they tell a very uh, compelling story. So congratulations, Luana. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Arnold, are you back? I'm back. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Another great presentation. Uh, I've lost thank the you. you guys have taken to track. Um, it's obvious you know what you're doing when it comes to tracking the website movements and where people are landing and their conversions. Um, but you answered the question on how you guys are starting to track those folks that are coming. I do believe that you've had, like Mr. Thomas said, a, a tremendous growth over the past couple of years and provide us with more information. And you definitely have been planting the seeds uh, and reaching those people. Now it's going to fall on you to convert those folks when they come to the island that you're able to track and give us the data. You know, you, you have created the waves. Now we just hope that they ride them in so they can come experience the culture, not just learn about it as content online. So um, I have no questions. Thank you again for the presentation. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Is Mr. Farrell back on or is he still off? I'm here. Thank you. Oh. Chairman, we had technical difficulties here, but um, I just say bravo to, to you and, and to all your efforts. I think it's uh, with the higher occupancies we're going to have, you're going to have more and more. I think there's a lot of pent up demand for this this story, and this, I think you've got a beautiful story. I'm I'm enjoying learning more about it myself, even having lived here as long as I have. I think it's wonderful, and I thank you for your efforts. I look forward to learning more and more as I go forward. I just I think you're going to attract more and more tourists because all of us our experience, our high occupancies are benefiting us all. So buckle up, we're gonna have some fun. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Berghausen. Oh, thank you. Uh, I ditto what, what others said. The only question I have is you've said that you're beginning to collect uh, data by, by zip code. Can you share any results uh, of what you've collected so far? What are you seeing? Um, from from the events that I've done so far, um, I have, I, uh, of course, there are local people who are, are coming, but I am also um, getting a lot of curiosity seekers who come to the, the booth because um, the stories are the draw. Usually when, when I do a, a, um, a location, I have um, posters of the first family articles. So it's people come and they literally read the entire article. And so a lot of people are not only fascinated with the information, but they're 
people from outside of the area are, are looking at it and saying, I had no idea that this was here and that they're learning about what's going on. So I can definitely send you um, the zip code data that I have and, and more specifics, as well as Rich had mentioned um, that uh, the, the um, comments that I'm receiving, that they're kind of went a little fast. I can specifically send you those just so that you can see more about all of the people who said I'm coming or I just left and I'm so grateful that I contacted you. Well, yeah, thank you. I, I think oh. is any hard data that you have would be helpful to us because it, it helps uh, complete the, the, the circle that trying to complete to show that people are actually coming. It's just the beginning. I understand that's great, but whatever you can share would be helpful. <laughs> well done. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Sellers, thank you for your presentation. I just have a couple of uh, comments. Please, when you get a chance, send those links to Sendaya. And any of those uh, zip code uh, demographic type things you can send to her as well that she can forward on to us. Um, we do have to make a decision on uh, November 4th. So as soon as you can get that into us when we finish all the applicants and we're going over our notes, we would love to have that information. Uh, you sure. mentioned some events you have done. What were those events particularly that you just done? I just, I just did Crescendo on Tuesday. Um, I am doing the Heritage Days on Saturday, which is in Penn Center. Uh, which is their big um, yearly event that, that, that they have been having for a long time and is a, a huge uh, draw through um, the area. Um, and I've also done um, the um, MLK committee. They have had a few events um, over the past few months. Uh, so we've been participating in those. So it's been about six in total that we will have done this year. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank uh, you. All right. Sadea. Yes, sir. I know we're running behind schedule, but I think I'd like to at least let our committee members have a five minute break, if that's at all possible. Yes, sir. We can do that. Um, okay. I've, I've got, let's just do it this way. I've got five. I've got 1113 approximately right now. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do is go ahead and take a recess until 1120. And then we'll just push we'll push on until we may have to shorten our lunch break, but let's just go from 1120 then start our next presentation. All right, sounds good. All right, everybody, I'll see you in about uh, six minutes then. All right, I have 1120. Do we have all of our members who were present before, are they still present? All present and accounted for. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas and Sunday. Um, as the next presenter, the South Carolina Low Country Tourism Commission, ready to present? I have um, Ms. Peach Morrison. Ms. Morrison, are you there? Um, I don't know what that I'm trying to get the volume off. Ms. Morrison, are you ready? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, here we go. My name is Peach Morrison. I am the Low Country Tourism Commission um, Executive Director, uh, and I would love to share my screen and, and let you know some information about what we do, who we are, what we do, and, and um, what's new. Okay. This is um, our visitor center. We are located on exit 33, right off of I-95. Um, we were established by South Carolina law, one of 11 scatter regions, which is a South Carolina Association for Tourism Regions. We are a regional DMO. Um, we, are, we serve Beaufort, Hampton, Jasper, and Carlton counties. Uh, this is a, a SCATTER, which is our uh, sister organization. We work very, very closely with South Carolina Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. Also, with uh, our board is comprised of 12 members, three from each of the four counties. Ariana Pernice, who is, uh, serves on our board as a Hilton Head representative. Um, 
just one thing I, I don't, you guys really don't need to, uh, need to preach to you guys, because I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but of course, South Carolina really, really does um, benefit from our tourism um, assets, you know, with the state and local revenues, one in 10 employees um, that are hired in our industry, and all the wonderful tax revenues and accommodations tax that we are able to collect so that we can reinvest in ourselves so that we can grow that tourism um, pot, which was why the whole accommodations tax was brought forward in the begin with. Um, this is one of the ways that we market the Franklin Plantation House as a visitor center. We are open seven days a week, 24 seven on our website, of course, as everybody else is. is. Just to live, let you know, um, these are some of our billboards or example of them. We have 48,400 vehicles that pass our exit every day and 9,600 vehicles per day that drive by the Frampton Plantation House. Now, uh, you know, of course, we don't have a visitor center on Hilton Head. We have a lot of people that come through here. One of the things that we really strive to do is we market ourselves as and our, and our region as south of Charleston, north of Savannah, just near heaven. We try to get those people that are going to South Carolina, I mean, they're going to Charleston and, and Savannah and have them spend some more time within the region. This is a copy of just a, a, a example of our print ad. This was in the South Carolina uh, guidebook that we go through every year. Of course, this is our Naturally Amazing. That's our tagline. We talk about all the great things that are in all four of our counties um, together as a team, as one. These are some of the things that we do as far as our digital campaigns go. We are 8020 is uh, where we were wanted to be as far as digital print. It is now probably about 85, 15 or 90, 10. Um, our main um, agency really is Compass Media. They have, we have been with them for four years now. We have um, the numbers that you see in the uh, application. They have done wonders for us. We do the YouTube, we do Pinterest, we do um, Facebook, of course. We've gotten really, really good work out of Google AdWords and doing the retargeting. Um, we have grown our digital presence, if you'll see on your page three, um, has, has grown, uh, increased 32% of the exact same set of numbers from uh, 2021 to 2022, which, uh, you know, is, look at, we're talking, we touched at least 300, 372, 231 digital viewers at least once in uh, our FY 2021. This is an example of what our banner ads look like. As you see, they're outdoor, they're beautiful assets that we have. They're the natural things, they're the things that during the pandemic really have been able to lift us up as a region. The state did fare better, the Southeast fared better than the United States. The state fared better than the than Southeast and we in the low country fared better than the state did. Um, I don't know if you're aware of, but the quarter, um, April, May, June, uh, this past quarter, the state A tax returns was not only 234% higher than 2021, we would expect that, but it was 25.1% higher than 1920. So, and that was a statewide perspective. So, and I'm sure that, um, you know, I've, I've seen and talked to, excuse me, talked to Ariana and talked to Bill, and I know these numbers um, are greater in our particular region because we have those beaches and we have those open spaces and we have that outdoor dining and all the things that people are looking to do right now. So that's just kind of an example of what we do as far as digitally goes. Um, social media platforms, of course, Instagram has been a really good thing, very good for us. I am so nervous, you guys. I don't know why. I just haven't talked to y'all in so long. It's, it's nerve wracking. But anyway, um, so Instagram, of course, Facebook is doing very well. Just to look at what the numbers are doing as far as Google Analytics um, this past year, sessions were up 33.2%, users up 30.4%, page views almost at a half a million last year. Um, one of the things that we did not do as an organization is when COVID started last year, we did close our visitor center for 30 days. We still um, operated out of the visitor center because there's only three of us and we had plenty of space and had plenty of things that we could do downstairs in the visitor center to spruce ourselves up. And, um, but we never stopped marketing. We changed our message and we said, you know, we've got the, the places to do when you're ready, you know, all this, the, those wonderful assets. But we didn't stop. And because we didn't stop, we didn't lose market share like some others did. So this is what has happened since we since our um, COVID numbers. Um, and we were also able to we got 50 grand every um, 
well, not every, but most of the scatter regions got an extra $50,000 in 2021 that we had to spend in marketing, pure marketing, separate bank account, everything. We were able to spend about 12 of that to do some content generation. And one of the things was uh, we did six videos. Um, and then this is just one of the 60 second ones. This is a place full of tidal marshes, meandering streams, and sandy beaches. Deep salt water and sea breezes, secret fishing spots, and dolphin sightings, sunrises over the ocean, sunsets over the land. But to see why all of this costs so much more, I suggest to learn your child. Now that's just one of the ones that we have on our um, YouTube channel. We were able to get six done. We have literally thousands, tens of thousands of pictures, still photographs from that. As you see the one in my background is one of those from that um, particular photo shoot. Um, these are things that we do on our website, which has those numbers and have grown significantly. Uh, we deal with um, different wonderful blogs. We have a wonderful writer that does our content generation for our website. Um, you know, we do day trips, we have information about things to see uh, in all of the municipalities in all four counties that we serve. Um, I will say, you know, as Mrs. Graves uh, was talking um, about the gullah culture, that's of course one of the biggest, bigger things that we have. Um, you know, stop sharing. One of the bigger assets that we have as far as the natural assets, the cultural assets, all the wonderful things that we can see and do in our area. We actually, um, as a Regional DMO, we also work very, as I said, very closely with PRT. We brought a writer down this past uh, March that her name was Dana Gibbons. She was on assignment from Food and Wine. We took her to Ridgeland, we took her to Beaufort, we took her to Bluffton, we took her to Hilton Head, we took her to Dubusky Island. She met with Fort Mitchell, um, she met with BJ Dennis, she met with Anita Prather. Um, and she was, again, looking for that Gullah culture and looking for that where she came from. So that was an awesome thing. That's just one of the many things we do. We ask, uh, our ask in all of our municipalities is 6% of the collections that are posted in the, um, from the Department of Revenue on the PRT site. Uh, from Hilton Head, we do not ask 6%, we only ask 1%. Um, we, one of the things that for me, the pandemic has highlighted is that you know, we need to continue to work together as a team. A lot of times um, people get wrapped up in on, on their own things that they're own doing, but, but because of this, a lot of the information was freely flowing this year or, or during the pandemic because people were, were helping each other out and um, you know, the information of how we can get more people here, more heads and beds, but not only just more people, the right people and in the right times on the shoulder season, not when we need, you know, we, we have 100% occupancy. We certainly don't need that, but we do need them in the, the January to February timeframe. Um, so we, as I said, are um, a regional, we're part of the team. We would love for your support. We don't, you know, we have an arduous job and you have some wonderful assets and I know that we need to support all of them, which we do. If you'll see on our website and our newsletters that go to 45, 50,000 people twice a month, um, all of the Hilton Head um, events and all the festivals and all, all that we can promote from Hilton Head, we're doing that also. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Jim, you're muted. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Um, well, Peach, uh, just uh, one one question that I have is, uh, what what percentage wise, what portion of your total marketing budget is directed to or allocated to Hilton Head promotion promotion of Hilton Head Island? We do. We do. We are a regional. D DMO, you know, we don't set out, you know, 5% goes here, 2% goes there, 3% goes there. That's why we, when we ask, the ask is a, a flat amount on all of the regions so that we're not asking more of the ones that don't make as much. Um, we are an awareness group. We are here to be an umbrella group. We're not here to um, promote any particular one. We're here to be the, um, the, the net, not the network, but the, the overseer of the region as prescribed by state law. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Arnold. 
Thank you very much. Uh, this is a tough one for me, as as you just said, Peach. Um, you don't have a, a set amount of dollars spent to drive tourism to Hilton Head, uh, and this committee's job is to uh, help those folks who are trying to put heads and beds on Hilton Head. So I don't know how we could collect data to see how effective this money is used, uh, this, this grant monies, and it seems that. Um, it would almost be a, a double dip request against our current, uh, the chamber for what they're doing, focusing on Hilton Head itself. I understand you're promoting the low country, but uh, this is the town of Hilton Head's accommodation tax committee. So I appreciate the presentation. This is a tough one for me that I'm open for discussions with other committee members. I'm just kind of lost on this one. Well, you know, as I said, this is, um, we are to be a team and we are to be the regional supporter. And that's why we bring in everybody from all the different municipalities and all the different counties. Um, we, I understand what your point is, um, but just because we're not on the island does not mean that we're not pushing people to the island and pushing people to the assets that are on the island. So, you know, I understand what you're saying, um, but that's, that's our point. And I'm, I'm sure you are, but do you have a measuring stick of how effective that is those efforts are well I, I can't tell you that when um john salazar was at the low country institute for uh, through uscb he they did studies and they use our data also and the msas that hilton head has are you know the, their their metros our metros not only kind of combine on some of those but our metros were shown to have added additional people in from different areas okay thank you Okay, Mr. Mr. Farrell. I'm more. I'm kind of curious about what the relationship is between um, this organization and the the um, and our and our chamber. We, as I said, Ariana um, is our is our Hilton Head representative. We are there's, there's twelve members, four from each. I mean, three from each of the four counties. Of those three. Two are to be chamber representatives and one is to be a hospitality representative. In our case, Ariana Pernice is who, with the CDB, is our Hilton Head person. Rob Wells, who is the director at the Greater Beaufort CDB, is the is the um, chamber person from Beaufort. And then our hospitality person is Jonathan Seven Sullivan, who is a hotelier in the Beaufort area. Um, so then we have you know the same happens on the other so we do work together we when um when before pre-pandemic when we were doing the travel south international showcase i think cbb went back i think ariana went back this past year but prior to the pandemic we would go along with the Chilton head chamber with west kishima was the representative there and also we normally went with savannah Hilton head um, airport to serve as a pod to talk to these international people that were bringing over groups um, and we, we did that for several years. I also, when Brenda Ciapana was at the chamber, uh, when she was pregnant with her child, I represented the Hilton Head Chamber at the ABA, which is American Bus Association. So the, the relationship is there. Um, you can, you know, as I mentioned in the email that I sent, I believe that, you know, Charlie or Bill or any of the people at the chamber would say that we are an asset. Um, I believe Steve Wilmot would say that we're an asset you know it, it takes a village that's my perspective my perspective is that it's, we're a team um i'm not asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars we're, our budget is very small um and we don't expect to get the one percent that we're asking for but we would really love to have the support because we do support and you know that's i'm very passionate about it because i'm, I'm very passionate about what i do i love where i work i've been here all my life not in buford i grew up in somerville in charleston thank god i'm not I mean, I'm a little further south now, so I really appreciate that. And I love being able to tell people that this is, you know, this is such a wonderful place to be. Um, and I could go on and on and on. I know you guys are already backed up, so. Thank, thank you, Pete. All right, Mr. Berghausen. Uh, yeah, I, it was a nice presentation. I can see that you're, you're passionate about uh, what you do. Um, I'm... I think I need more, more guidance internally here because my understanding has been that it's our town council that hires one or more DMOs and they're 
their decisions in the past has been to hire one DMO. And it's not our role to, our role to employ another DMO and go around town council. But yes, I, need, I need more guidance internally from staff. Yes, sir. We're not, we're not the DMO. We do not get any of the 30% money that it goes to the DMO. That's, you know, that's, that's what council does. We're competing for the 65% as a nonprofit, but we are considered the regional DMO at, from a state perspective. But we're not a DMO for Hilton Head. We're DMO for the Low Country. Okay. But you could be designated, couldn't you, as a, what, a DMO of Hilton Head? We could, um, but we're not asking for that. We're not asking to be. Well, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Other, otherwise, a, a nice presentation. I can see that you're passionate about what you do. So thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson, do you have any comments or questions? Yes, thank you, Ms. Morrison. I appreciate your passion. My question is, have you applied for a Hilton Head A tax grant in the past? And if not, um, what's prompting this year's request? Great question. We, um, when I started back in 07, we were getting, you know, from somewhere between around $5,000. And we, we continued to so that was a seven, eight year. We continued to um, apply and we continued to get funding until about 13, 14. That was the last year that we got fun funding from. We continued to apply for like three or four years after that, but were, you know, were turned down because we weren't on the island. Um, so we did, after being turned down a couple of times, we said, um, you know, uh, but we felt like this year, you know, it's time to, to get back in the saddle and to, to realize what we have as far as you know the tourism industry um, and working together as a team and just supporting each other and um, what we have done with the extra monies that we've gotten from ATAX from the other municipalities is get, be able to do all this wonderful content management that we're sending out and we're pushing on our digital platforms, we're pushing on our social platforms that have really given us a great boost. But none of them are a field and had number or have highlight Bluffton because we haven't been getting the additional monies from them. Um, they highlight the region and they highlight Walterboro and Hardyville and, and Buford and the Buford County um, unincorporated. But, you know, that's why we want to, we just want to come back together as a whole group and support each other and just go forward and move forward and, you know, just amp up our game. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, Ms. Morrison, we, I think the committee as a whole recognizes your passion uh, our problem as it's been in every year except last year is there's usually more wants than um, than we have resources and we don't know this year what our situation will be um, and and so there's members that have uh, have difficulty when we have a DMO that we have a contractual relationship with uh, looking at making sure we're not duplicative of any processes and so I'm uh, just letting you know that um, but we'll, we don't know what our funding is going to be yet. And uh, we look at each application though, like in and of its own merits. And you have, a, you know, your application has merit and it will be considered uh, in a couple of weeks. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you guys. And again, I thank you for your time. And I know that's a really tough, tough thing that you do, but thank you for your willingness to serve on this committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, do we, uh, Sundaya, do we have somebody from the Mitchell Pre Preservation Project? Yes, sir, I'm getting Mr. Ahmad now. Mr. Ahmad? Mr. Ahmad, can you hear me? Oh, there he is. All right. Now I can. Sorry about All that. Right. That's okay. Get everything All right. Mr. Mr. Ward, go ahead with your presentation. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be in front of you again. I am going to attempt to share my screen here.
Uh oh, here we go. Mr. Ward, do you have two screens? No, I'm just on one. It says to double click to enter full screen mode. Um, did you want to stop sharing and then try sharing again? Yeah, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Can you see me? No. I'm just getting a spinning wheel on my screen. Oh, no. Technology is beautiful and it works. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try something else. Hold on one second. I apologize. It's OK. All right. I think I had to I had to get rid of completely close out Facebook. I think that's what was jamming me up there. All right, let's try this again. How about now? There you go. Yeah, yeah. Facebook was the culprit. I apologize. For that. Let me uh move this so I can get us to where we need to be. And I'll move quickly so we can uh, get back on time here. No rush. All right, how's that? That's good, you got full screen now. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate your patience. All right, uh, again, my name is Ahmad Ward representing Historic Mitchville Freedom Park. We are glad to be in front of the committee again this year to ask for some funding to support the uh, the things that Mitchellville is trying to do. So I'm going to slide you up top so I can see. So even with the cloud of the COVID-19 pandemic still hanging over 2021, unfortunately, uh, we were to maintain the energy behind our digital imprint from last year and actually get people back in the park. Uh, you might remember we had to do everything digitally last year, but we had some opportunities to get people in the park specifically for Juneteenth and for the reopening of some tours on the property. So that was good for us. Uh, one of the things that went extremely well for us was our, our pivot to a holiday ride through uh, at the park. And so for those of you who had a chance to see this, uh, we had 20,000 lights uh, in the park and the 2,500 people come through there. And now we were only open six to eight on three days. Uh, so we actually, uh, I thought we were gonna get in trouble with the sheriff's department because we had a line from the park down to 278. Uh, and they stayed like that for all three nights. And so we had about 1,100 tourists participate in that. And what we did when you came in, we gave you a card uh, at the beginning of the line. And then we want to get all your information there and you could put your donation in that card. It was a free event, but you can give us a donation. So I would say probably 95% of everybody actually filled the card out, uh, which means we had a whole lot of data. <laughs> it took us a while to compile it, uh, but it was great to get that information in from them. And states represented here, as I said, Florida, Georgia, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, uh, had a pretty wide ranging um, uh, event there and people were telling me almost to a person, hey, you got to do this next year. Uh, so guess what? We're doing it this year too. So you'll see it again first weekend in December. So uh, Freedom Day has been mentioned exploring the families of historic Mitchellville. This was a great collaboration with Low Country Gullah. 
and, and others. Uh, we did have to do some of these things virtually early on in the year because we weren't completely open yet. And so we had about 1,500 viewers on this program for our Freedom Day presentation, something we do every single year. And we're looking forward to collaborating with Low Country Gullah again and uh, the Gullah celebration. Uh, that was more like the kickoff for the Gullah celebration. So we're looking forward to doing that again next year. Juneteenth, which is a huge thing for us to get back into the park. This was our first real big event back in the park. We did a three-day weekend here. We actually did a sleepover in the park with Joe McGill. If you've never done anything with Joe McGill, he's an incredible person and one of South Carolina's own. And so we did a sleepover in the park Thursday night. And we did a, uh, a virtual presentation, our virtual Juneteenth, which I'll talk about in just a second. We actually showed it at Barker Field uh, at Friday night and on that Saturday. Uh, we were a little worried about would people be comfortable being back in the park, but we had well over 900 people in attendance at the park on that Saturday. Uh, again, we took zip code uh, information at the door that was kind of like, hey, pay your money, but you got to give us where you live before you can get in. <laughs> and so some of the states represented there. Again, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Virginia. Um, and so we were really pleased to see that many people in the park. We had the fabulous Hamiltons as our, our special guest. That was a great event. The weather held for us, so it was really nice. Um, so we look forward to being back in the park physically again uh, this coming year. Uh, I mentioned the virtual Juneteenth presentation. This is something we did last year because we couldn't have an actual Juneteenth. And we partnered with the five other African-American museums around the country to do this. And so this year we expanded it to 10. There's a lot of information here and I'm not gonna go over all of this, <laughs> but just a few, uh, uh, the August Wilson Center for African-American Culture in Pittsburgh, the Amistad Research Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, the Charles H. Wright Af uh, African-American Museum, Museum of African-American History, I'm sorry, in Detroit, the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, the Northwest African American Museum in Seattle, and the American Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We were all, uh, we did a 90 minute presentation, which is still available if you didn't see that on blkfreedom.org. You can watch that right now. If you'd like to, after the, these meetings, go get you some culture after we're done here. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, that, the connection there was about 152,000 viewers uh to that that site and that was an incredible thing for us the first year we said hey let's get twenty thousand. uh we got forty thousand last year and this year we had fifty thousand on the date and another hundred and fifty two thousand another fifty two thousand rather no hundred hundred and two thousand i'll get it right in a minute hundred and two thousand uh from amazon who was one of our key sponsors and they offered the program to their 1.3 million employees and they had over a hundred thousand of their people watch this uh, video. So our, our sponsors here were Chase Bank, T-Mobile, Hulu, and Spotify. And one of the coolest things we were able to do, if you heard the Spotify commercial, that was my voice. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I was on Spotify for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the only time I'll be there. Uh, so despite this the, the shutdown, we were able to get back in the park later this summer. I uh, got about had about 400 tours during the summer. I mean, 400 people doing those tours. Tours made up about 52 percent of those participation. And that doesn't count the people who are just coming to the park to be in the park, which is a number that continues to to be high. Uh, our Finding Freedom Home exhibitions still reached 22,000 tourists as of last month, and some of the advanced reach with some of our our, our ads. Uh, you can see print impressions, 41,000, radio impressions, 390,000, e-blast, 231,000, and total TV impressions, about 1 million, uh, close to 1.1 million, uh, how we're getting our reach out there. Uh, our 2021 anniversary forum, Blueprint of the Culture, will take place virtually on our website on October 30th. Uh, things kind of closed back up, and it just made sense for us to not do a, a public event the size we wanted to do it. And so you will be able to register now on explorementrico.org. That is free to the general public. Uh, and you'll get more information about that on the website. And so you'll be able to see that at the end of the month. Uh, we will be doing historic holidays as, a, as the holiday tree lane, as I mentioned. This is a collaboration with historic holidays on Hilton Head Island with the, land, the Hilton Head Land Trust, Heritage Library, the Gullah Museum, Coastal Discovery Museum, the Black Churches on the Island. This is one of our, our key events to uh, chronicle the, the holidays and get people kicked off in the right manner. And that the actual full thing will run 
from the 4th to the 11th. Our little piece here is December 4th to 6th, and that is a Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Don't show up on Friday. <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, Monday from 6 to 8 at the park. We have a whole new theme for you. I can't put it out there yet, uh, but you'll be able to see that in all its glory the first weekend in December. Uh, a little bit about collaborations here, besides the ones I already mentioned. Great partnership with the Hilton Head Island Office of Cultural Affairs. We have some QR code stations, one of our newest things in the park. Really, really cool situation. There's some big head guy talking about Mitchellville. You can skip him. But you got Marlena Smalls and the, and the Hallelujah Singers on a cut QR code and also our own Cora Miller, who's doing Harriet Tubman. Uh, at the point where we turned this in, which would have been the end of August, we had 1,500 scans from tourist ranges from over 30 states. Uh, and as long with those 30 states and some of the ones that we hadn't normally seen recorded at programming here would have been Arkansas, Colorado, Idaho, Illinois, Missouri, Montana, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Washington, West Virginia. You had to be physically in the park to hit these QR codes. And so these people came from all of those locations. On top of all that, we had people visit from France, the UK, and Puerto Rico, and, and Ireland, which was really cool that those folks were in the park and looking at the things we have to offer. So we are really appreciative of that relationship with the Office of Cultural Affairs. Uh, our collaborations with the Bluffton Chamber, uh, Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce has led some exposure. We're a travel and leisure magazine and Condé Nast Traveler. As you know, we've been named the number one island again uh, for the fifth year in a row for both of these publications, uh, which is really cool. And I don't know if you see my cursor. Uh, the editor uh, for Travel Leisure Magazine mentioned Mitchellville in her little editor's note there. So you get the September issue, which I also have right here handy. <laughs> go to page eight and you can see her quote about Mitchellville and she, she mentioned that it was a landmark that will stay with you long after returning home. And of course, we had a chance to, to walk through the park with Condé Nast's editor and there'll be a video coming out really soon about that and you will see more of that for in probably another week or so. So the things that we're continuing to do here. Uh, the promotion of Finding Freedom's Home, archeological uh, events at Mitchellville. That exhibition is going strong at the Westin. It's our biggest outreach. Uh, we are adding some promotion to that. We're actually gonna put some more signage and things there, freshen it up a little bit more. We promote this pretty regularly and we get a large uh, number of people that come from the Westin to come to the park. So it's one of our best arms to get people in, into the park physically when people are in the area to, to visit Hilton Head. Hopefully we can get back to a physical blues and barbecue presentation. Uh, we did it virtually this year with Gwen Yvette and Marlene Smalls, uh, but hopefully we'll be getting back to regular business as long as everything holds true. Let's see what happens. And we'll get back again to our eighth annual Juneteenth celebration. Uh, you can see this is some images from this past year. It was great to see all these people together and having fun. It felt like old times. So it was really a, a great introduction to get people back in the park. One of the one of the first events for a lot of people who talked to me while I was there, that hey, this is the first thing we've gone to in about a year and some change. So we were glad that they chose us uh, to come back outside and hang out with the people. These tours, the Dawn of Freedom and Roots Reconstruction Tours will help enrich the visitor tourist experience. We'll continue to do those. In fact, uh, we are about to announce a regular scheduled tour next month. Uh, we'll start two times a month at a certain time frame. We'll move to weekly. Uh, you'll see that on our website soon. Uh, we'll have the days and times set up, scheduled. So you got people coming in, you'll be able to sign up for those specific times to do an actual guided tour of the site. Uh, as we have more things coming. We're also working on some more interpreter panels uh, and some uh, what I like to call bateau panels. These will be shaped like the flat bottom uh, bateau. They'll talk about Gullah culture and those should be unveiled as early as next January just to complete uh, this experience. Uh, the request of funding will also help us with widespread promotion that will aid in the upcoming capital campaign. We are in the feasibility study uh, level of this campaign. So we're quiet, quiet, quiet phase. Um, but we look to explode on this thing as early as next year, hopefully. And so the funding here will help us to put the word out and get people involved. We have some national targets that we're gonna be going after to try to get funding to raise the $22 million needed to get the park up and running. 
And here again is our ask. So all of the marketing stuff we're looking at about $105,000 uh, implementation of key tourism events and programming like Juneteenth about 65,000 and keeping the park looking the way it needs to look about $15,000. Again, our request as of last, like it was last year, 185,000. Uh, as we move further along these process, we can see that ask may be going down some, but right now, uh, because we kind of, we lost some, uh, some time with COVID. So uh, we're getting right back up the steam where we thought we would be this time last year. And so we're looking to, to launch some things really, really uh, soon for Mitchellville and start to get this park up and running and promote it in the appropriate way so that we can expand all the great things that people can see when they are here in Hilton Head. And again, you can see how we're going to be trying to get people there and where our media buys will be going, obviously in this area, but also uh, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida. Uh, as usual, we have uh, electronic surveys, online ticket sales, online analytics, and putting uh, visitor surveys in people's faces and asking them to give us zip codes. Uh, that's how we make sure that we have people, we know where people are coming from and the kind of impact that we're going to have. So with that, I will stop my share and answer any questions that you may have. All right, Mr. Arnold, you're first up. Go ahead. Thank you, I'm up for the presentation. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, each year, just the, the significant historical importance of Mitchellville Preservation Project. So thank you again for the great presentations. I love yeah. seeing the QR code signs. Uh, that's exactly the kind of tools that could easily be used by uh, a lot of the applicants to to gather this information just a, a quick capture of that qr code allows you the ability to get all the information that a guest is willing to give you so uh i know you guys had a setback like everybody else with the pandemic but hoping that you can springboard and keep moving forward uh, i was able to attend for the first time last year to the holiday drive through and I look forward to doing that again this year um my girls thoroughly enjoyed it as well so thank you for that awesome glad you can come we look forward to seeing you this time all right, Mr. Farrell. Um, Mr. Ward, I was lucky enough to be a part of that travel advisory board, travel and leisure magazine visit that was at the end of August. And I wanted to congratulate you on that presentation you gave in the Heritage Room and what an outstanding presentation that was, how flattering that was for this entire community. That was high-end travel agents from around the country and in some cases the world that were here on behalf of Travel and Leisure Magazine. And it was outstanding how Mitchellville and the Gullah community was highlighted and participated in that. It was wonderful. So I like the, your metrics. How you you uh, have a great way of measuring your ability to attract uh, tourists to this to this community. So thank you for everything you were doing. It was I felt lucky to be in the room that day. Quite honestly, I appreciate that. That was a fun day. We were glad we were able to do that. We were able to do that. Thank you, Mr. Berghausen. Uh, I'm uh, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, I think I'm hearing a lot of good decisions, a lot of creative solutions, you know, strong leadership. You've you obviously got a strong team over there. Um, the Christmas lights, great idea. Um, and in this coming from not much a few years ago, whatever, you've really been building this um, nicely. 22,000 tourists to Finding Freedom exhibition. That is, yes. is that real feet on the ground in Hilton Head Island? Yes, uh, the, the cool thing about having that, that connection is the Westin is on the second floor of the Westin Hotel and the hotel gives us their numbers. And so we, uh, over the last couple of years, the average for the full year is about 30,000. I mean, this, this is a model of what we can do as a community and what ATAC can help fund um, and attract that many people um, efficiently and really show something of significance that wasn't being focused on before. So um, A plus, I thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Ms. Johnson. Hello, Mr. Ward. I was one of those people who one of my first times out of the house was to go to the Juneteenth celebration. So I was looking to see if I could see myself in the pictures, but I didn't. <laughs> but it was a wonderful event. 
Thanks, and um, I think that what Mitchellville represents is just a great crossover of cultural and historical tourism, and it's significant. And I uh, just applaud the efforts, look forward to expansion of the park, and I'm sure that's going to be featured in your marketing outreach, those plans that Absolutely. will bring even more people. So thank you very much. Well done. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Ahmad, the, the most exciting thing to me is the fact that you've just begun to scratch the surface of the potential with Mitchellville and you're doing such fabulous work. Uh, keep it up. It's a, it's a thrill and a privilege to have Mitchellville as part of the array of historical heritage assets that we have here on Hilton Head. So continue the exceptional work. We appreciate it. And we appreciate the support from uh, the committee and, and the town council with ATAX money. It's really helped us come a long way. Thank you, Mr. John. Well, Mr. Ward, um, having had an opportunity to see you dance the other night at Crescendo, um, <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know how enthusiastic you are about the entire arts community, the cultural community and yours. And, and as a person that considers themselves somewhat uh, uh, an historian, I, when I came to this island, was totally ignorant of a lot of history. And I even took an entire course on Civil War history, and nobody 35 years ago <laughs> was talking about Mitchellville, you know. And, um, you know, and, and so in the past eight years that I've actually been on the island, I have learned a great deal about that history. Um, and I, I'm thankful to you and your uh, your compadres and everybody that's working so hard to to teach um, those of us uh, who grew up in the Midwest and were not, I guess, taught good history <laughs> um, or taught the correct history or even the true history of a lot of uh, matters. Uh, I thank you. You presented a good presentation. You are an asset to the island, and I thank you today for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you for your support. Look for big things come from our, our organization. And we just we want to help the entire arts, culture and historic scene on the island get noticed because there's a lot of really, really great things here on the island to offer people. Thank you. All right. Y'all have a great day. Thank you so you much. Mm -hmm. Zendaya, do we have a representative now from the Sandbox? We do. Miss Fish is connecting now, Miss Nancy Fish. There she is. Good afternoon. How are you? You're fine. Miss Fish, would you go ahead, please? Yes, let me share my screen. And I can do this. <clears throat> there you, go. you can see the presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, of course, at the beginning, um, what you see here, of course, is our brand new, beautiful new building, um, which we are very, very excited to be in. Um, just some background on the Sandbox. We are the only interactive hands-on children's museum here in the low country of South Carolina. Um, we opened in 2005. We do currently have two locations, our brand new one here at Low Country Celebration Park, and then we have one at the Tanger Two Outlets. <clears throat> During a normal year, <laughs> which we haven't had in a few years, um, we had over 20,000 visitors come through just the Hilton Head location. Um, we've had about 390, 392,000 to date. Um, in this past year, really from the time we opened here, 85% of our visitors um, have been tourists. Um, some of the programs that we are doing here at our new location um, is our, we opened back up our summer camp. So last year, our summer camp was um, quite small because of the pandemic. Um, this year, we were sold out every single week. Um, we even had a waiting list. And one of the things that we found was that families were coming here and staying here for the entire summer and wanting their children in some sort of an educational program. So uh, more than 50% of our enrolled campers were tourists and some came from as far away as Brazil. Um, so it was a very interesting um, and great diverse mix of, of children here this summer. 
Uh, next year, we do hope to um, increase um, our availability because, like I said, we did have a waiting list this year. So that is um, on our list for next year. We also added a new summer program, of course, being right here at Low Country Celebration Park. Um, we felt like we had a great venue on our side steps for a musical program. And so we hired Rick Hubbard to come in on Monday nights on our side porch and do his interactive music show, um, which of course fits right with the museum. He gets the children involved. He starts out, as you can see in the picture on the left, with just some warm up activities like juggling. In fact, he even taught me how to juggle. Um, and then he incorporates the children into his show um, and even the, the um, adults um, towards the end. Um, we created a QR code and had staff go around and ask the people who were there to um, complete the survey from the QR code and um, found out that 88% of the families were visitors um, and most of them had never ever been in the sandbox before. So it was great exposure for us. Um, as an organization as well. Um, additional tourist programs that we will be able to bring back in 2022. Um, of course, as an organization that focuses around um, young children, the pandemic has um, really severely impacted us. Um, but we're hoping with that vaccine coming um, that things will begin to open back up and be as normal as they can. So we're looking to bring back all our big um, events. Um, even this winter, we'll bring back our holiday event, our New Year's Eve. Um, we'll bring back our Irish Fest in coordination with the St. Patrick's Day Parade um, in the spring. And then in the summer, our two big events, our summer blowout and our Pops Goes the Fourth. Um, we're also currently doing some weekly programming that's bringing in um, tourists on the weekends. So we do a STEAM program for older children, and then we're doing a monthly local author um, series where a local author comes and reads their children's book um, to the children who are here that day. Um, as always, we continue to collaborate with other organizations. Um, this year, we've done a lot of collaboration with the Culture um, HHI um, and with the Hilton Head Symphony Orchestra. And you can see there through that picture this um, is part of our outdoor space. Um, and in the beginning, I was struggling to figure out what to do with it. It's just steps that lead down on, look over a little pond, but we found it served as a perfect stage. And so these are some of the students from the high school camp um, that were here with the, the symphony and they came and performed to everyone who was out in the park one day and those people who were here in the sandbox. Um, so that was a, a great afternoon. Um, we do do um, a lot of measuring of who we're reaching, um, where they're from. And just in the last month, we reached over 11,000 people on Facebook, which is a, a 33, 32% increase um, from the previous year. Um, th and this year, we've reached over 50,000 people um, just on Facebook alone. Uh, most of the followers that we have are women between the ages of 35 and 44. Um, and, and just some interesting things with some of the countries we've reached have been Canada, Brazil, Costa Rica, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United Kingdom. Um, and you can see on our right, the numbers of people who um, continues to build who like our page. Uh, the same goes for our Instagram. Um, our Instagram followers have increased 18% over the last year. Um, and a lot of times we tie um, local events that we're at. So when we go out to community events, when those organizations have an Instagram post, we then share that um, on our Instagram um, as well. And that of course helps with our followers. Um, when people come in, um, in addition to zip codes, we also ask how did they hear about us? Um, and here are some of the, the top ways that they did. Internet searches, Google, um, word of mouth was the next biggest one, um, which is wonderful. Um, we do send out to all the local, not only the hotels, but also the rental agencies, um, information about um, what is happening here at the Sandbox. So we're hoping that that's in with the word of mouth. Friends, and then of course we added walking by because being here in Low Country Celebration Park, we get a lot of people who walk in who are going to the park. And then of course our social media and Facebook. 
Um, and then where are you from? So when I went back and looked just from uh, July, we've had over, we've had 910 different zip codes come into the sandbox. Um, the top ones, again, this is just from July 15th when we reopened here, um, have been Georgia, North Carolina, of course the upstate in South Carolina around the Greenville, Columbia area, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Um, some of the great football teams there. Um, our visitor feedback, um, and this again, these are from just the past few weeks, um, talks about how it's a great place for toddlers and the young at heart, because we know that um, right now is a, everyone needs play, particularly children, but we often find the adults who are with them coming in and playing uh, with some of our uh, activities. Um, and then of course, it's always a good way to pass time on a rainy day. Um, and this person um, put how their older child liked the electric circuits in the painting. And you can see there in the picture, some of the things that we've added for older children are things like electric circuits, woodworking. Um, we have an interactive um, Lego board as well. Um, and then all of the art materials. Um, as far as our funding goes, um, we're asking for 44,400 this year um, because 2021 was a funny year with ATAC. It is a, uh, I looked at 2020 year and it is a decrease from 2020. Um, as you know, we are trying to slowly decrease that amount and increase other sources of funding so that um, your money can go to many organizations. And then because we are a new museum, I just wanted to give you just a quick look. So when you enter the museum, you will see our brand new fish tank there. It is a uh, freshwater fish tank. Um, to the right is the interactive um, Lego wall where when you press a button, um, you'll hear the sounds of what is in the little Lego picture. And that's something that we can switch out seasonally. So I have our, um, our fall ones ready to go and put up. Um, on the left is our maker room where you'll find the electric circuits and the woodworking. You'll see some of our STEM activities in the picture on the right with our wind tunnel, our kinetic sand. And then of course you can see the Lego wall in the background. This area in the museum is also gonna have a community mural which will highlight women in science and it will be interactive as well. So similar, or it's the same company um, where I bought the materials for the interactive Lego board, they have big touch pads. So when the children touch their hand to the pad, it will actually tell them the story of that particular woman in science. Um, our feature exhibit, of course, is the sand castle, which sits in the middle of the museum. It is two stories and underneath we have both our shadow room and a reading room. Up top, we have some, dress up and puppets or imaginative play. And then of course, everyone's favorite is the slide that comes off um, of the end there. Um, another really um, feature exhibit that we don't have um, in yet, but which is on order is our um, Gullah exhibit. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was really uh, reflect the low country culture. Um, and so this is one of the ways in which we've done this. Um, and I created this um, exhibit with some um, input from Louise Cohen from the Gullah Museum. Um, and so we're really excited. I, my goal was really to not only have those visitors coming in and the children in particular um, connect with the, the local culture here, um, but also for those local children who come in to be able to see a reflection of their own culture here in their children's museum. So we're very excited about that. Um, in the middle, again, our, we have a shrimp boat. Um, the back of the shrimp boat has a huge panel that talks about the history of commercial shrimping in the low country, the life cycle of the Atlantic white shrimp, um, as well as information on the TED, which is the turtle exclusion device, um, which saves the sea turtle. So again, we're talking about the culture here in the low country. And then in our grocery store on the right, we also have a seafood box, which has, you know, little um, like plastic shrimp and things um, because we want to highlight the farm to table and how those things come off the shrimp boat and they go into the grocery store and then you may be in a restaurant one night or um, in your home and actually eat those things. We also have our racetracks. Um, we have an upscaled vet clinic on the right and I don't know if you can see in that far cage 
we've even added a sea turtle um, so that the children will understand that there are all kinds of animals here in the low country um, to take care of. We have a brand new jet cockpit from Gulfstream, which actually came in before the museum was finished because it had it's so big it had to come in before the doors went on. Um, and then, of course, we have our outside exhibit space. Our outside exhibit space has these big blue blocks. Um, the picture on the left is one from um, some visitors who managed to use every single block we have. Um, we have a pool noodle forest on the right, which the kids love to run through. We have a music wall, and then we also have an art and a chalkboard wall um, as well. Um, and last but not least, um, just thank you not only to your committee for your continual support um, and the town of Hilton Head. So questions? All right, thank you, Ms. Fish. Uh, Mr. Farrell, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, not, none other than congratulations. I think it's wonderful what you're doing and, and, and I appreciate what you bring to this community. Thank you. Mr. Berghausen. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Nancy. I, I think you're just another model uh, application, a model um, uh, effort, um, and, and it's just great what, what you do. You did a great job filling out the application. Your data collection efforts uh, are outstanding, and, and it serves as an example to others um that struggle with data collection it can you can do it but you have to work at it and, it, and it's real effort to figure out how to how to get it so you've been capturing it and the data is great too um your cost per tourist is less than ten dollars a tourist and with the growth you're getting um it's probably going to dwindle from there so it's also a very ef efficient use of a tax dollars so we care about accountability. We also care about efficiency. So you just kind of got it all working. And thanks very much and congratulations on the new facility. Well, thank you. I always tell people I never met a spreadsheet I didn't like, so. <laughs> Ms. Johnson, any questions or comments? Well, a comment and a question. First, I couldn't stop smiling throughout the presentation. It's so fun. It's just interactive. I can see how kids and families enjoy it so much. I love the cultural inclusion, the technology, the emphasis on the environment, all great. With reference to your application and your visitor survey, you uh, mentioned that there's a form that you use. How did you hear about us mm -hmm. now? And in your application, you said more than 99% of the feedbacks, people said they'll be back. So wouldn't it be interesting to also find out who's coming back? Because that's your, that's such an effective marketing right there. Just how many people are repeat visitors? Because I bet, you know, you can definitely substantiate that 99%. Yes, and we do often have, and at this point are recognizing people who come back. Mm -hmm. So that is another question that we now ask um, because all of our ticketing is online. So when they do that, um, they're asked, have you visited us before? Yeah, good, so. good job, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Mr. Thomas. No questions, and I echo the congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I think Ms. Fish, again, excellent presentation. Uh, you've heard this probably every time you come in front of us. We appreciate the fact that your ask gets smaller and smaller every time because then it gives us an opportunity to fund uh, other groups. And you, again, like our members have said, you're very efficient uh, with your um, uh, with your uh, your funding, and it, 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 not having seen it until today, the uh, the museum and, and such, it is of the children's museums that I have seen in areas that I've been in in Kansas City and Phoenix. Uh, that's world class what I'm seeing there. So I uh, I want to congratulate you on that. Well, thank you. All right. Um, if uh, the committee has no further questions, all right. Thank you, Ms. Fish. Thank you very thank much. You. All right, Sindhya, do we have a representative from the 12 Jewels? Yes, Miss Amy. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes. 
Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, hold on, let me. Okay, can you hear me better now? You're coming in clear. Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Amala Ali, and I'm here to represent the 12 Jewels of Life. Um, I've been back on the island for the last four years, and it's really a great organization. I'm a 1989 graduate of the Restaurant School of Philadelphia. I did my apprenticeship at the Four Seasons, taught culinary arts, and opened my own catering company in West Palm Beach, Florida. 12 Jewels of Life is a mentorship program for the at-risk youth of the low country. We mentor children with reading and arithmetic. We have after-school programs and a free lunch program. Uh, we've been connecting the community since uh, 20, 2014 and have um, asked for funding for uh, several times and have yet to get any. But this time we have a really great program. Um, 12 Tools of Life has been very successful in the past seven years. Our membership has grown tremendously. Our children have grown. We've had 12 students who graduated high school this year, which is really great. Hilton Head High School is doing a great job. Each year, 12 Jewels of Life awards our high school graduates with $50 to open a bank account as a part of our financial program, financial independence program. We have also brought in 50 families from all over, and the families have come here um, 12 Jewels of Life has given them a tour, and they have decided to move here and make Hilton Head Island their homes. Um, we have a really fun program that we think will make the island laugh, smile, and shine. It's a food network. We have already have been in contact with Dr. Calvert with uh, USCB, the hospitality school on Hilton Head Island, and we would like to have a live, a series of live junior chef cultural cuisine cook-offs featuring Gullah cuisine at the new school. We will have 12 junior chef contestants ages 10 through 18 from all over the world, each trailblazed by a local restaurant, which means each local restaurant will sponsor a junior chef, helping with them with their entry fee ingredients and tools, making sure they are safe and following them through the entire process. We're planning on having a series of these live um, events and um, a series of six to begin with starting in August. We will be having celebrity judges, which will bring in people, um, heads and beds, bringing in heads and beds for these live shows. We've already been in contact with Michael Jordan's agent and um, just waiting for this seat and put the package together with him. He's really excited. Uh, we have more that we'd like to do with the uh, Junior Golf League and fishing outings as well. And we've reached out to others, including Emerald Gossi. Um, we, like I said, we have contacted the University of South Carolina, Beaufort, so in the island, their new state-of-the-art uh, hospitality school, hospitality campus, and Dr. Calvert said it was a great idea. He was really excited and eager to help. And when we're finished here, we're going to email him and let him know about today's meeting. Uh, we will also team up with Hilton Head High School and other high schools that have culinary programs. We have already contacted several people in the culinary world and are excited to move forward but we just need a little help. We need the funds for advertising and marketing. Our budget is 25,000, we're asking for 20, with 80% of that going towards marketing and advertising. We're gonna be bringing in big time celebrities who usually cost upwards of 5,000 and up, trying to get them to donate as much of their time as possible, but we still have to fly them in put them up in a hotel, and feed them good. That's what we do on Hilton Head Island. And the marketing is very important. We know we can do it because we do guerrilla marketing. We will be advertising on the top social media sites 24-7 worldwide, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, 
YouTube, Zoom, LinkedIn, and Eventbrite, as well as local newspapers, magazines, radio stations, and news shows. Uh, that will just bring great recognition not only to the island, the schools, the restaurants. Each uh, of the 12 children will be trailblazed, as I said, by a different local restaurant. And each um, event, we will be um, alternating restaurants, having different restaurants, different junior chefs. Um, We've just been here several times, and we think this is a great idea, and um, we're just asking for help so that we can get this rolling. Anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Ali. Um, Mr. Berghausen, you're first up. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, have you, do you have any experience at putting on an event like this? Yes, um, I personally have worked with event planners for the past over 30 years. So, yes, I do. And we do the um, entire organization, organization as well does. Yes. Okay. Like, tell, tell me about the, the last event you uh, were involved in. How did, what did you do and how did it go? The last event I personally or the um, 12 Tools of Life? Well, either. Either um, uh, if you would be leading, leading, uh, heading up this one, it sounds like. So, how about the last? Well, one we you do. Well, Twelve Tools of Life. We have a um, hot dog cart, and we do events. Um, in fact, tomorrow we do fundraising. Tomorrow we will be at Graco, and on Saturday at Ace Hardware. And we use our hot dog cart uh, to teach the kids with hands-on learning. We're able to teach them reading and arithmetic, uh, culinary arts. We're able to teach them entrepreneurship and um, business ethics. And we go to the different locations for fundraising and use this as a mini um, event to teach the kids hands on how to um, participate and how to work the events and become self-sufficient. Okay, and, and so would, would the kids be involved then in the event you're, you're proposing here? Yes, we have 12 junior chefs, and each one of the shows, there'll be new junior chefs from all over the world, and they are ages 10 to 18, and they will uh, each be trailblazed by a different local restaurant. So um, what each of the 12 chefs, uh, will be sponsored by a different local restaurant, and the restaurant will help them uh, with their ingredients, their tools, and just trailblaze them throughout the whole process. And these junior chefs can come from all over the world because the school itself, family, uh, people love food, everyone loves food. The island is just a win-win for everyone having a school of hospitality on an island and having this show would bring recognition to everyone and um, bringing kids from all over the world to want to come to that, you know, the school of hospitality and, and their families as well to see all the different restaurants and what the island has to, has to offer. Okay. And then they, they would be funding their, their own expenses. Cause I mean, you're, you're 20. No, you're they, the, yes, the um, the restaurants, the local restaurants, will be sponsoring the um, the students themselves, and then they will be and will help them with fundraising efforts to offset if they have any extra expenses, like family members or anything like that. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, thank thank you. I yield uh, to other questioners. Okay, uh, Ms. Johnson. Good afternoon, uh, almost afternoon. So I'm a foodie and as a foodie, presentation is everything. So I appreciate your bringing additional information to us in your discussion today because my notes included, I was looking for more detail. The mentorship program is fabulous and I just commend the organization for what you're doing. I was looking for specifics on the vision of the of the culinary program that you're discussing 
um, more okay. details as to the who the chefs might be and who might be uh, the restaurants involved and how the marketing would happen. So what what I'm looking for uh, in order to substantiate a tax dollars is more detail of the vision of what could be accomplished. The concept is wonderful. I can see people being so interested in seeing 12 young chefs competing. I love um, I'm Chef, for example, and I can see it as a wonderful concept. It's the presentation of the vision that um, is, is not, I'm not seeing the detail, though you've given us more detail today in your discussion. Is there, is there more detail forthcoming of what's happening? Well, I can let you know, um, again, these um, events will be live, and they will be live on the biggest social media sites, including Facebook, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, and they will be live all over the world, worldwide. So bring, representing these uh, particular restaurants, all local restaurants, um, we will be representing those restaurants on Hilton Head Island. So people all over the world and besides, you know, at the live, but also we will be, once we get the okay and we put our package together, we will be already doing guerrilla marketing live. So we'll be putting out worldwide 24 seven. We have our team of members are wonderful and everybody's all over the place on different social media sites, 24 uh, seven putting out about this event coming to Hilton Head Island, the number one island destination, and just putting a lot of, um, you know, emphasis on our island, what we have to offer, all the amenities, all, you know, it's for everyone. It's for foodies, it's for golfers, it's for everyone. And we want to get that out. And um, we, we're working with, uh, like I said, the different um, uh vocational culinary schools as well as the high school culinary programs we're going to get this out to the restaurants to the um well um for sponsorship we're going to you know get with all the grocery stores food distributors and just have everyone support um the junior chefs the community the school the island and um just you know blow the whole thing out um are what we what we need to do of course we have so many restaurants here and we're going to alternate so our first show which we will like to have in august um we will have go to you know we have 12 restaurants that we go to and ask them if they would like to sponsor our junior chefs and what that entails and then the next one then our next show we'll have 12 different junior chefs and 12 different restaurants so as we, as we, you know, our shows, and we would love, to, you know, to have shows every month or as much as we can, but we know that um, from last time, uh, we needed to have at least six. So that's what we're working on now. But um, each, so each in between shows, as we're, as we're advertising for the show, we're advertising for each restaurant, we're advertising for the island, we're advertising for the school, we're, at, you know, it's just mass marketing for everyone. Thank you for that additional information. You're so welcome, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions or comments? Ms. Ali, it, it sounds like uh, truly a, an interesting, different and stimulating promotional vehicle for Hilton Head Island. Uh, but do you have any projections or any goals relative to the number of tourists that you expect to the events? Um, as far I'm not really numbers, thinking of social, that was was not thinking of social media as much as I was uh, right, but the direct social live media tourism. Is yeah. Right, but the social media is to bring those the tourism here, is to get the tour tourists here. The events itself, I mean, we're going to have big time celebrities. If Michael Jordan's here, there's going to be a lot of people coming in. Not only foodies, but you know, sports, um, you know, sports enthusiasts, and 
lovers of all. So as far as numbers offhand, I I don't know, but we're just putting it out there. We had, um, a, and like I said, numbers, I'm not sure either, but um, we had um, our idea for our project for the comedy cruise last time we came up for the ATAX. And because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do it, but we had such great feedback on that. And the feedback that we've had on this is just outrageous. And everybody, I mean, people, we have enough um, time in advance that people will come out for this, and they said they will travel for this. But as far as numbers concerned, no, I don't have those numbers for you. Okay, thank you. We have brought 50, we've brought 50 in the last um, couple years. We have 12 years of life, have brought 50 entire families to this island that have moved to the island. So, you know, we are really trying. We're, we're bringing people here. We're, you know, we're helping them with jobs and, job placement and just trying to make the island more efficient and better for everyone. Well, thank you for the good work that you're doing and thank you for that information. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Arnold, do you have any questions or comments? Um, just, just a few. Um, we want you to be successful in your endeavors. We know that you have a passion for it and these mentor programs are fantastic, but without more solid details as to who the restaurants are going to be or who the chefs are or the participants or the visions of the event um, and, and those numbers that you don't have, those are crucial pieces of information that we need to make our recommendations. Again, we make the recommendations to the town and they are award the funding, but without these details, we really can't make a solid recommendation. Um, if you can get those numbers to us, or give yes, us a I can get those numbers to you. And the reason, um, well, first of all, the um, restaurants, we haven't spoken to them because we're trying to see if we could get our funding before we move on. We're kind of waiting for this meeting to see how we move on, because either way, we're going to, you know, we want to do this. We're going to do it somehow, some way. But um, we do have our list of restaurants. We and, you know. But we haven't, we don't have a, um, and as our celebrities as well, we just don't have, you know, a confirmation, validation that, um, you know, in writing because we're waiting on this meeting for our funding to see if we get that and then we can go move forward with that. But um, so, and as far as the um, junior chef, we, it's the same thing. We waiting to see, you know, we're waiting on this money to, to on this meeting to see if we can get this funding so that we can start advertising and looking for our junior chefs and, you know, doing that. And then we match them up with the restaurants and um, go from there. Um, and then you wanted to know our projection of how many uh, people that you thought we would bring in. Is that I, correct? No, man, but that would be a good number to have. Uh, I think that it's important that, not only you, but all of the applicants understand that this is a reimbursable grant. Uh, it's money that you are and being reimbursed for. So uh, my recommendation would be to encourage you to go ahead and plan out those details because you're going to need those details to get your uh, operation up and going and have a successful event. You'll need to know which restaurants you're in. You know, don't wait until you're approved for funding to do those things. That's the groundwork okay. first. Um, again, if, if you're needing money for marketing, that's money that you have to have available to you that for your spending, and then you turn in a receipt and it's reimbursed. So just, I want to okay. make sure you know how the process works. So, um, thank you again for your presentation. Thank you for what you're doing. For the, for the years. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate uh, you. Mr. Farrell, do you have any uh, questions or comments? Just a uh, much a lot of what has already been said, but I am curious about, are the 12 restaurants already secure? And I've heard Michael Jordan's name a few times. Is he, has he already expressed an interest or you know about uh, Yes, Michael Jordan has definitely expressed interest and he's also really excited because he, uh, we're, we're going to reach out to the junior uh, golf league and he's excited to swing, you know, swing with them and play some golf and then do some fishing. We're going to also have a meet and greet. We're planning on a meet and greet after each event. So the Michael Jordan or whatever celebrity is here, um, Scotty Pippen or Emerald Classy, whoever's here will do um, 
a meet and greet afterwards. And um, like I said, yes, um, the restaurants themselves are not 100% secure. We were uh, kind of waiting on um, this meeting to see where we were at with funding as to um, how we can move on. But if, you, uh, if I have it, um, you know, I can, we can go secure 12 restaurants. That's not a problem because we have spoken to the restaurants. We just have not secured them. We are waiting on this um, meeting. But um, if you, you know, give me a time frame or time limit, I can, we can secure those restaurants and get you our uh, number, projection number of scores and whatever else your information, we can get it for you. Um, that's not a problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Jim, Jim, if I might, I mean, uh, just list, listening to Ms. Ali, I mean, it, it might be helpful to have a list of the restaurants that you are targeting a uh, list okay. of the celebrities that you're targeting, um, just to give us a better sense of what the, you know, what it might look like. I guess a better vision of the event. It's or the event okay. themselves. So that might be helpful okay. information for us before we uh, consider it for a recommendation. Okay. Okay. So I will get that in as soon as possible. Um, and yes, I will get that in for you as soon as possible. That's not a problem. Yeah, but that was going to be my my comment to you is that uh, given the the questions that have been asked by the uh, members of the committee and given the fact that we're going to make we're going to vote on our recommendations on November 4th, uh, we need okay. to have that information from you as soon as possible. So if you could follow up with some sort of a written uh, an email or otherwise that has the information regarding targeted restaurants, uh, targeted celebrities um, okay. and what their status is. And if you can get that to okay. Sendaya, um, okay. the sooner the better, but we can ha we have to have it no later than November 4th for, for consideration. Oh no, we'll get it, we'll get it as soon as possible. It will be before that, that's not a problem. Okay, any other comments or questions from the committee? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much, Ms. Ali. Oh, thank you and thank you guys for helping support the community and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, that appears at this time to have, uh, we've gone through our morning session, is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Okay, so at this point we would recess uh, until, uh, what we got, 120? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Do you want us to call back in or how do you want us to work that uh, logistically? Can we log off and then come back on? You can log off and come back on. Um, I'm going to keep the, I'm going to turn off the Facebook feed and then I will come back. Um, but you all can log off. I'm just going to have it up on my side so you can all come back in. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll see you all back at uh, 120. Mr. Fluker, we are live. Okay. Uh, it is now one uh, twenty p.m. and Let's start with our afternoon session. And the first presenter in the afternoon is the Hilton Head Island Recreation Association available at this time. Looks, yep, there's Frank. Can you guys hear us? I can hear you. Berghausen, yes. Got a pair of gyms. So I can there. hear. <laughs> that one was me. Oh, wait. wait. Frank? Yes. All right. Frank, anytime you're ready. Um, how do I share the screen? Will you do that for me? Share screen. 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 Share screen
It should be. All right, I got it. Bottom. Got it. Great. Too many people telling me what to do. <laughs> it's just normal. Go ahead. Well, um, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, as you know, we've been making this request for uh, $15,000 for each of these events for several years now. Um, and we're excited about being in the opportunity to be back in the event business. We had a, a very successful uh, Jeep Island event this weekend and seeing the number of people that came and participated. And uh, we're, you know, we know that people are looking for things to do. So we're very excited about having the opportunity to be back in the Oyster Festival business and the Wing Fest business. Um, one thing, as you know, from many of my presentations is that we've always worked with the USCB and their hospitality program to do surveying on our events and surveying of the people that come and uh, participate in events. And what you'll find is that um, this is a slide from 2019, but we've uh, always collected data that's been important uh, to find out what visitors here. But if you look at this, if you look at whether the Wing Fest was influential in their trips, obviously you can see that we were very and then uh, influential and then overall that um, that's, a, that's a great number. When I, um, working with John Salazar all those years, when you got to almost 25 and then you got to almost uh, get a little over 15 and those two items that you were having a great event. Um, this, this slide here, you can see where people have come from, um, from actually from all over the world to, to participate in Wing Fest, but that's where we've got some data from. Some of the shows as we do some work with uh, WTOC out there, we do some, uh, some key markets being Charlotte, uh, Jacksonville, and Atlanta. You can see some of those numbers there where we had multiple people coming from. Here's kind of the overall campaign and what we've done. Uh, obviously the total of impressions, uh, tickets that were bought online. Uh, we see we we're moving more and more to those type of things now. Um, if I'm working with WTLC and their, uh, their ability to reach out into these target markets have really helped us. Some photos from the event. Um, we're still waiting to host the 25th anniversary of Wingfest two years later. So we're still working along. Hopefully the, this spring will, will be there. Um, got some Oyster Festival numbers for you. Um, you can see that uh, actually coming here in the fall, people were very excited about coming for uh, Oyster Festival and planning their trip around our Oyster Festival from 2019, uh, over 50% of the people had made that, uh, made that trip here uh, really for the uh, Oyster Festival. Here's where people travel from, once again, from all over the world, but here's where people traveled from. Um, here's a little video that we did, but here's the impressions and some other things that we did during that time. Uh, we added the video as part of our marketing effort uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, with Roy and Joe, we got a lot of hits off that. Um, here's what we did. I mean, the impressions and wh where they went out to uh, outside of the region. And some numbers about people who saw the ads and some purchasing tickets. Same thing here again. Um, really, we found this works out very well for us and how, how working with having that partnership with TOC and getting it outside. Finally, some pictures from 
oyster festival a couple of years ago and then what we've done with the oyster shells and uh, getting those recycled as part of the event and uh, one thing we would have to say both these events will move down to the new park this year the shelter cove uh, community park we're excited about that um, we think that there's lots of opportunity for us. As I remember back in, when the park was first being planned, there's over 4,000 beds within that area. Not only do we plan on uh, having people that we're going to attract through our efforts with WTOC, but just some uh, new people coming that are actually spending their time here may have not heard about the Oyster Festival. Hopefully they'll come back next year after they have a great time and be able to walk up to that event. So. I know it's short and sweet. I mean, we've been doing this for a while. We plan on uh, having uh, USC be back and uh, taking the data that we need uh, to find out where people are coming from and how successful our buys are with as we uh, go ahead and, and market outside the region. So I'm open for any questions that y'all may have. Frank, really a quick one, and I'm sorry if I'm going out of order, Jim. Uh, you're showing a picture of celebrations and you talked about Shelter Cove. Is it going to be at Shelter Cove or Celebration? No, Low Country Celebration Park. If I said Shelter Cove, I misspoke. You, you, you did. You did. All right. Okay. I meant Low Country Celebration. Thank you. So while you're at it, Richard, do you have any other questions? Um, only, only question, Frank. I mean, uh, all of the data that you showed and the percentages show that clearly these events are impactful in people's intention and desire to visit. Um, any numbers on the actual number of tourists or visitors that are coming for those events? I, okay, I, I don't have the, I'm guilty. I don't have the packet in front of me. Okay. Um, they're in the packet. Uh, I love Zoom. Yeah. Not only does it put 10 pounds on me, but uh, <laughs> sometimes it's not, not the same as being in person, so. Yeah, no problem. I, I, yeah, I have it's in the, the packet of, where people, of uh, number of the number of visitors uh, that took the survey. And then obviously you can uh, take that number and build it out a little bit more. Not everybody okay. takes the survey. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Rich. Okay, uh, Mr. Arnold, do you have any questions or comments? Frank, uh, no, I don't have any questions or comments on this one. Uh, excited to have you guys back and fulfilled and taking full advantage of the um, the new park. Yeah, Thanks. we had a, we we hosted an event down there. Um, not only the food and wine fest was down there, but we hosted a little event on uh, part of our Jeep Island that we did last weekend. And uh, the people that came from out of town just raved how great this park was, and they were so excited about being down there. So. We we'll kind of look forward to really, you know, maximizing the use of it, but it was designed for events and being able to not only have the ability for people to walk up to the events, which, are, you know, Shelter Cove is kind of a destination park, but having people be able to walk up to the event, I think will make a big difference in a lot of the events that go down there. I fully agree. It's a, a great location for an event just like yours. Okay, um, Mr. Farrell, do you have any questions or comments? No, just uh, it's going to be fun, Francis, uh, to, when you got the combination of the new site and the pent up demand you've got. So I think people are really ready to give it out and celebrate life a little bit. So I think it's going to be neat. I look forward to participating in both. Thank you. We, we, we actually saw some of that pent up demand this weekend on, at the Saturday event with the Kiwanis Club and the Jeep Island. Um, I know that their numbers were up a little bit or a lot of bit from the pr previous year, the last, the last time they did it. So that pent up demand is uh, something that we're planning for in all of our, all of our events. I think rightfully so. Okay. Um, Mr. Berghausen, any comments or questions? No, Frank, there's, there's not much not to like about this. Uh, I mean, all really, really good. And I just want to say thanks for the good data collection. To it, it takes effort and to do it, and then you're also getting really good results. So it it, it results in the very efficient use of ATAX dollars. You're spending, you know, maybe eight 
eight dollars a tourist even even less and if your attendance goes up it comes down more so a lot of good news in here thank you very much keep it up thank you Ms. Johnson, any comments or questions? I do. Hello, Mr. Soul. Hello. Hello. Great question. I love the question in your survey. How influential was this event in causing you to come to plan your visit? It just it cuts right to the chase. So that was very helpful. And then a question. Last year, you uh, uh, the REC Association applied for a grant of $10,000. This year is $35,000. Please describe whether this refers to the quality or the quantity of how that marketing will happen. Um, well, I think the, the reason for the, for me, some of that is some of that is rollover. We actually hosted two oyster roasts last year, and uh, we did use some of the money from the oyster roast uh, dollars that we had available to us, and then at Wingfest we rolled over. I got to. So that's my, sorry, I'm Lee's off camera. So she, we tag team this thing. So she's telling me how we did, how we did that. So. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And hey, thanks for that explanation, uh, Frank, because uh, Ms. Uh, Johnson's a new member of our committee and, and a lot of these uh, organizations that could not hold events in 2020 or even in you know, 2020 rolled their, money over and so that's the reason why we had a significant amount of uh, of um, of lower uh, requests in 2021 because they had money left over and normally locally we only do it for a year but then state law allows a two-year rollover and then we kind of built into that and I don't mean to eat up your time Frank I just want to educate um, Ms. Johnson anybody else that's out there uh, understanding um, why the numbers are so great because in the past you've had, you know, they're at 19 and 20, your, your ask was $25,000 and, uh, this year it's 35,000. So that, that's not, you know, that's not an unreasonable request based on, uh, the pent up demand that we, that we think we're going to see. So, um, I'm looking forward to getting back out and going to some of these festivals. And so I, I thank you for your application and, uh, good luck with, uh, with all these events. We appreciate the support that we've gotten. I mean, I've actually sat in uh, those that seat before, and um, I would tell you just the information that we provided uh, has really changed over the years and, and for you all to look at and uh, having that data that we're able to provide, I think, I think in the long run helps you make easier decisions on it and really trying to figure out who's coming to our community. I mean, how the event is so impactful in their in their travel plans and other things. So I, I appreciate your support and everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Frank. Thanks. Are we good? <laughs> Anybody else have any questions before we let Frank go? All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Zendaya, do we have a representative from the Lean Ensemble Theater? Yes, sir, we do. Mr. White is on. Go ahead, Mr. White. Good afternoon. How is everybody today? Let me get this screen cleaned up. I'm so sorry. Got it. You are, I am being recorded. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all very much for your time and consideration this afternoon on our annual uh, accommodations tax application. Um, in our last meeting back in May, I said to you that Lean's new mantra was determined and optimistic. Today, not only does that remain true, it is beginning to pay off. On October 21st, one week from today, we will open our first live production in 18 months, the regional premiere of Larissa Fast Horse's satiric comedy, The Thanksgiving Play a story that is not afraid to stare the idea of being woke right in the face. It is a timely play for our community, one that will inspire in com uh, conversation and perhaps even a little bit of debate. It is the kind of story that Lean tells best. On August 9th of 2021, after a month long marketing push, season subscriptions went on sale at Lean for the first time in over a year and a half. We reconfigured our sales model to provide more patron flexibility in light of the pandemic, but we still didn't really know what to expect. As the numbers came in, we were beyond delighted. Our first day back on sale, we doubled 
our previous record of daily subscription sales. Following the Thanksgiving play, we had the regional premieres of the Tony Award winner Art, as well as other desert cities and the parody Death of a Streetcar Named Virginia Woolf. And in March, we will finally see live and on stage the world premiere of our first ever commission, Mitchellville. It is an inspiring slate of stories to tell. This is not all to say that we are in the clear, far from it. Performing arts organizations across the country are facing a patron base that has not yet become fully comfortable returning to the theater. Lean has spent a considerable amount of time, energy, and money to ensure patron safety as we return to live theater. This includes but it is not limited to, union required ventilation checks of the performance space, performance space and rehearsal space sanitation, as well as antigen COVID testing for the entire company three times a week. We have also contracted Sleeves Up Productions to film and release the Thanksgiving play and art as an at-home viewing option for those who do not yet feel comfortable returning to the theater, no matter what their reason. Using state-of-the-art 4K multi-camera equipment will provide an option to these folks that might not be exactly the same as being in a theater, but it will be close. And it also provides us the opportunity to expand our reach beyond our borders to better meet our vision to become a destination theater here in the Southeast. There has never been a moment in a staff or board meeting where someone has asked if it's worth it to get back on stage, considering all of the excess effort that is required to produce live theater in the face of the pandemic. But Lean is built to tell stories that inspire conversation. And while we have made every effort to fulfill that mission over the last 18 months, we know now more than ever that nothing works better than telling them live and in person. We are determined to do this in a safe and responsible way, and we are optimistic about the results that it will bring. And with that, I will stop talking and answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Blake. Um, we will start with you, Mr. Arnold. Do you have any comments or questions? Uh, thank you again for the presentation. I'm excited for you guys to get back in person. I know it's been a long wait for you and the project you guys have going on. Uh, we're excited to bring back to the community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Farrell. I have no questions at this time. I look forward to the live presentations as well. So thank you for what you're doing, Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Mr. Berghausen. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank thank you as well. I don't I don't have much. Obviously, the challenge here is to get the cost per tourist back down, uh, running around seventy bucks now. But uh, we understand we didn't we didn't have we didn't have tourists. But if you get that <laughs> number back, or even start breaking the records as as you said, you'll be back to twenty dollars and below, which is where I'd really love to see you. Yeah, I, I, I tried to explain in an email that the numbers were very, very atypical for, for where we normally are, but it's been an atypical couple of years, I suppose. So I see it as, as temporary. We're, we're just watching and want you to get her back down, but yeah. So do good, we, I promise. <laughs> good, good happening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Johnson, any comments or questions? Uh, just a comment. I appreciate the opportunity to learn about the Lean Ensemble Theater. I moved here a few years ago, far away from Bluffton, and I hadn't heard of the Lean Ensemble Theater. So I'm so happy to know of the work that you're doing. And uh, it sounds like a great draw for people coming to Hilton Head Island. Thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to having you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thomas, any comments or questions? Just a comment that the work that you're doing is reflecting very well, I think, for Hilton Head Island and like to congratulate you on that. And also I have no questions related to the application. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, are you guys able to uh, operate the theater at, at full capacity right now? Yes, yes sir. The, what we had to do was um, in order to get union uh, permission, we had to go in with a company called um, 
Johnson controls to check the ventilation of the entire building. And once we got that permission, we were able to go full force. Okay. okay. I have no, uh, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you for your application. Uh, look forward to uh, live theater again. Uh, there's nothing better than live theater. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys, all of you for the work that you do for the town. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions or comments, from the committee. All right, thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, you guys have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right, I know we're running ahead of schedule. Um, Zendaya, uh, do we have a representative from the Outside Foundation available? We do, we have um, Ms. Jean and also Ms. Caitlin Lee. Can you ladies hear us okay? You're on mute. Uh, yes, I can, Cindy. Okay, perfect. You're free to begin when you're ready. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, go right ahead. Oh, uh, for some strange reason, it's not popping up. So maybe Caitlin can can do that. So I always have problems with this. So Caitlin, if you could share your screen with the PowerPoint. So while we're getting started, th thank you all so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here. It's a, it's a really exciting day for the Outside Foundation to be here, um, to be able to um, talk about our um, accommodations tax and our work. Today is also significant because I just left, left the docks at, at Shelter Cove Marina where we have our first kids in kayaks program. Uh, over a year and a half, we've waited to, to host these kids. and. Over the next four weeks, we'll host 667th graders for this program, so super excited. Uh, so once again, the Outside Foundation, we're founded in 2014, and our mission is to get kids outside and to preserve and to protect our, our local ecosystem. I'm here today to, to talk a little bit about our programs, about last year's success with our programs. Um, hopefully, we can get the PowerPoint going because uh, it has all of my stats on it. I apologize. I'm, I don't know what the... Uh, hopefully, Caitlin's got it going here. Um, but if we begin with the, the first programs. Um, oh, thanks, Caitlin. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Um, go ahead and, and advance, Caitlin. That would be great. Thank God for the technologically efficient. <laughs> um, continue, Caitlin. Thank you. Great. So we're seeking um, ATAX funding in 2022 in support of our beach, park, uh, kayak based waterway cleanups, um, our Earth Day um, HHA uh, initiative, which will be held in, on Earth Day of 2022. We're asking specifically for, for $2,000 there in support of social media, our digital reach, uh, for some print media, um, and to get our work out for some promotional materials. Um, we're also asking for an additional 20,000 um, for our annual Keep the Broad Creek Clean Water Festival. This will be our sixth water festival, super excited about that. Um, in addition, we're also asking for an initial 2,000 uh, for our community-based oyster shell recycling and bed restoration to get the word out, to hand out educational information, uh, to spread that kind of information and to recruit volunteers to help with our program. And then uh, there's also an additional 14,000 in there in support of this uh, uh, program, which, which collects shell um, from local restaurants, including Surge and Crab Group, um, from, from community type oyster roasts. We just heard about the Hilton Head Island uh, oyster roast. We'll collect 100% of, of the shell from that coming up here in November, we'll be there. Uh, so $14,000 in support of that program and the creation of Oyster Reef for living shorelines. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then also $20,000 in support of our Olakai Low Country Boiled Paddle Battle Race and our Pinckney Island uh, cleanup event, uh, a whole weekend of activities um, to be held in um, August, uh, September of 2022. Um, next, Caitlin. 
So if you're not familiar with our beach park and waterway cleanups, we've been doing these for a number of years. They provide a great way to involve our whole family uh, in making a difference. Um, it's outdoors, it's community-based. It was something that we could continue safely through COVID. We were so excited about that. Um, our results are very tangible. We weigh our, our weigh and count our, our, our uh, debris. Uh, we welcome all families, um, locals, out of towners, uh, winter visitors, um, and the impact is real. Uh, next, next slide, Caitlin. If you take a look at our 2021 cleanups, we hosted 14, we had 622 volunteers and we collected almost 6,000 pounds of trash. Of the 622 volunteers, uh, roughly about 14% were from uh, greater than 50 miles away. Uh, and then of course, a large chunk from Hilton Head Island as well. But we're still drawing in people, um, especially those who come to the island and, and you know, kind of want to do a little bit of a mitigation perhaps of their, of their uh, carbon impact. There's a nice group of kids from Hilton Head Christian Academy doing some service work here. So next slide. Out of the blue, we came up with this idea in about February of last year that, hey, you know, we're challenged by COVID. What can we do? What, uh, what types of programs can we, we actually maybe foster a little bit more? And so we did this, um, the first ever hashtag Earth Day HHI, simultaneously clean 12 miles of the beach, um, you know, on one day. Uh, which we learned a lot. Um, we had two months to prepare for it this year. We have a lot of time to prepare for it, but we had an, a tremendous uh, impact with that. Um, we used the QR code to collect information. Um, next slide. So our call to action, we got over 300 volunteers that really calculated into to over 500 volunteer hours, picked up 206 bags of trash, totaling about 712 pounds. And yes, we did draw in a, an interesting mix. Um, we had so many groups involved, you know, over 20 from the island. Um, the, the basically this uh, conservation group um, that is nationwide has a low country branch. Um, and it's run by uh, this kid, John Acker, who, who's grown up on the May River. And he brought down a whole group of students from the Citadel and the Carlson, uh, College of Charleston group of friends. And uh, they did uh, part of that cleanup. We also had guests that came out from the West End, Tanglewood Villas and Island Link. So it was really kind of exciting and I think very, very impactful. Uh, this is gonna be an annual thing for us. We're really excited about it. Uh, we had our fifth annual Keep the Broad Creek Clean Water Festival. We would want very much to do that in a bigger, better way next uh, July. Uh, we had it in August this year. We learned a lot from that. We changed our venue. We love our new venue. We're up there in the new Shel in Shelter Cove Community Park, not new, but a new location for us. Uh, we're going to push that back to July this year, and we think it's going to make a huge difference for, for gathering people there. It kind of fell on the first week of school. Not a great idea, but really had a lot of fun. Some pictures from the event. Next slide. If you take a look at that water festival, um, we drew in actually 25 local and regionally environmentally focused uh, nonprofits and organizations. We had over 300 attendees. Uh, and from the zip codes that we collected, we determined that about 40% 40, 40 of the people that came through that day to enjoy were from 50 miles or, or more away. Um, so as part of this year's festival, um, we also, instead of doing a kayak-based cleanup, um, we couldn't do that for, for a couple of reasons, we actually built an oyster reef that morning, which is just mind-blowing when you think about celebrating keeping the, the, the Broad Creek clean, and then we went out put a 400-bag oyster reef out there in the morning. So, so really an amazing event. We want to continue to do that. We want to spread that word. We want to be able to reach more people, more vacationers that are here this week, and also also those that are planning to attend or planning to come to Hilton Head that week. We want that to be on their list of, of must dos for the week here on Hilton Head. Our community-based oyster shell uh, and bed restoration project continues to roll along, even despite uh, COVID and being uh, some of the restaurants being challenged. We managed in 2021 to collect uh, 16 and a half tons of shell from 12 restaurants. An additional one ton, we were at both of the Hilton Head Island Oyster Roasts in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we had a whole bunch of bagging events. We did get a good number of volunteers at those. And as I uh, cite here, 15% were from greater than 50 miles. We built three reef, pretty amazing, all in the Broad Creek. Over a thousand bags are out there. Um, and we had uh, 38 volunteers, 21% from 50 miles or more. Uh, and we've got all kinds of great press for that, some promotional videos, uh, social media from Pew and so on. Um, and we think that this speaks so, so solidly to the our, our, our plan, uh, the town of Hilton Head, uh, which repeats a lot in that. And I know that I was part of that environmental um, uh, focus of it. 
uh, about resiliency of our island, resiliency for, for sea level rise, resiliency for, for the effects of, of you know, storms and, and other such things. It also speaks directly to the Broad Creek Management Plan, so in support of fisheries as well and related tourism. Next slide. So, you know, here's a great shout out. Uh, Emily Dunn, 17, came with her dad down from Columbia uh, just to participate that day in that build. Um, it was pretty amazing. Um, she plans to study marine biology and she wants to work for the DNR. So we're getting our word out. That's great. We, we want to do more of that. What a, what a neat thing. Um, and this, uh, just recently in September, we got a shout out from Post and Courier in, in, in Charleston. Wow, you know, Charleston is kind of like the, the center point for oyster shell recycling. They use our program as a model within the state. Um, so that's just really cool. And here's the article as it appears and it mentions, if you look in the picture on the, the left-hand side, pretty cool. Um, you know, that's us building that reef, one of the three reef um, in, the, in the Broad Creek. So it's a really neat. And then there, there was that day when, when I opened up my social media and I found this, the Pew Trust, a national, uh, national worldwide um, nonprofit. And here they are mentioning the outside foundation. We are just a speck. Uh, on the map of environmental, um, you know, kind of nonprofits. This was just overwhelming. Uh, the Pew Trust has given us support over the last two years. They were able to give us some money for shoreline restoration a couple of years ago. But this type of support, this type of um, kind of uh, great press for Hilton Head, I think is just, just amazing. And I'm so, so proud of the work uh, that we're doing to, to help shore up and protect our shorelines to create new habitat to support our fisheries. Our third annual Alakai Low Country Boil Paddle Battle just took place. It was pretty amazing. We had 140 uh, racers uh, over there at Hudson's. Uh, about 75% of those that registered were from 50 miles or more. We had 65 uh, spectators, um, you know, that were 65% of them were actually from 50 miles. Uh, that's as many as I could catch running around that day. I think we had more spectators, but certainly I think a great event. And we're super excited to, to now be planning the fourth annual. Um, hugely important for us to get that out of market support. When you look at 140 racers and 75% were from, from uh, you know, uh, the far reaches of, of South Carolina and up into North Carolina and down to Florida. So, um, and the next slide, this was the next day. Uh, we invited uh, volunteers, racers uh, to come out for uh, basically a four team uh, cleanup. We had Low Country Trash Heroes clean on clean. Palmetto Running Company, and we said you can jog, walk, bike, pick up trash, both sides of the of the bridge there. Uh, we had 100 volunteers. Uh, we didn't have very many from 50 miles away, but look what we did. We we took away 50, four, almost 1,500 pounds of trash from from that area. Just absolutely remarkable. Uh, this is the girls' tennis team at, at Hilton Head Christian there. So if you look at our our year kind of um, year to date stats and, and uh, you know, another one that's way back there in the Earth Day picture too that I, that I didn't mention, which was really amazing. Um, don't have a slide for it, but the South Carolina Aquarium actually chose us for their sweeps across South Carolina cleanup. And so we targeted the Rowing and Sailing Center back in February, we had a great turnout. They brought down people from all over the state for that. It was really, really kind of cool. Um, so, so finishing up with our total stats, um, you know, 1,323 total participants, it's probably a little bit low, 26 events, um, you know, 753 people in that kind of zip code, 57%, and, and 573 people from, from uh, over 50 miles away. So, you know, we're getting our word out. Uh, I think if you look at our Facebook stats, it's really powerful. So last slide. You know, essentially, when you look at the, the Facebook slides, you can see that in 2021, our social media ads were viewed by 269,200 times. That's how often they were viewed, almost uh, over 250,000 times those Facebook ads were, were viewed. That's a 3,800% difference in one year. So just remarkable to have that. It was uh, basically support that came in the kind of the out of cycle, but just made a huge increase. Um, and that was viewed by, you know, six, 64,573 uh, people, which is an increase of 1,300% of from 2020. Uh, so I think, you know, the amount of money that we were able to spend in boosting and, and spreading our, our media um, and our social media reach or digital reach, um, and also that print market into the magazines of Atlanta, um, uh, Charlotte, down to Jacksonville, across to um, Augusta and such, 
I, I think we did a, a, a really um, a great job of kind of getting our word out on that event. So um, thank you very much. You're muted, Sorry. Jeff. Okay. Yeah, I know. Thank you. <laughs> we'll start with uh, Mr. Farrell. Do you have any questions or comments? I, I think it's more of a comment, Gene. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. And um, I'm of the opinion that we should do, as a group, we should go to all the hoteliers and all the lodging people in Hilton Head and steal their remote controls from their properties. <laughs> so that anybody that comes to Hilton Head, they don't have the option of watching TV. And they need to be outside because there's too much to enjoy and appreciate. And I think it would work, but, but I don't know if I can get any support on that. But I would appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> get everybody outside doing what you do and what a lot of others are doing. And so I, I say I thank you and, and uh, I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Berghausen, any comments or questions? Um, no, Gene, I'd, I'd say I appreciate your enthusiasm. It's infectious in a positive way, I'd say. Um, so it's, it's good application. The, the questions I have would be about the, the Turk qualified use. And, and I just, I have to turn to uh, staff and to legal counsel for some guidance on that. But, but that, that said, I like everything that's here. My questions are, to what extent can we use tourist dollars to fund it? Jean, can I take that? Absolutely. Okay, so part of the Turk qualified use is actually um, can be used for shore stabilization and also um, trash removal and um, infrastructure. So we were very careful and thoughtful when we put this application together to follow the rule of South Carolina law. And that is one of, while may not be traditionally um, something that organizations here in Hilton had apply for, um, it's definitely a Turk qualified loose because, use because we followed the, you know, we were looking at the state law when we put this application together. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson, any comments or questions? Amen. Thank you so much. We're so blessed to be living in this beautiful area. Thank you for your presentation, which highlights what you're doing in terms of um, the sustainability and being environmentally conscious and just being good stewards of the land. My only question, and you answered it, was how did the paddle battle event go? And you let us know that it went very well. And uh, congratulations on that. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas, any comments or questions? Well, I thought I was muted, but I wasn't. Gene, thank you again for that presentation. And, and you know, the work that you do is in many ways very subtle, but incredibly powerful. And the people that you attract and the people that you touch are as passionate as you are and uh, typically about the work. And so that to go to Jim's point is infectious in so many ways. And, you know, there aren't a lot of organizations on Hilton Head that share your mission in the way you uh, implement uh, really your mission and the use of the Turk law interpreting that law in that uh, manner, I think is an incredibly creative and appropriate way of doing it. So, um, uh, you know, I don't see, I mean, we'll have to defer to staff to, for the final ruling on that, but uh, I don't see any reason that that should be an impediment in our consideration of your request. So thank you for a great presentation and, and the work that the Outside Foundation does. Thank you. Mr. Arnold, any comments or questions? Uh, no, just thank you as well. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm out on the boat going through Broad Creek and look over to my left and there's a whole crew of people placing these oyster bags and creating new reefs so thank you for the work you do to help us take care of this beautiful piece of paradise that we live on and share so uh, i was able to the folks that were on the boat with me i was through the atax and understanding what you guys do i was able to explain to them what's going on and uh it brought a lot of joy to all of us aboard so thank you again thank you uh, i think it's a for myself from my own point of view i think it's a, a very uh, very useful use of our money. Um, 
And I know that it's in the four plus years that I've been on this committee, nobody has ever uh, had an application that regarded uh, the um, beach erosion and or renourishment type situation. So I applaud you um, for using uh, your application for that purpose. And um, I would do everything in my power uh, based on that to, to see that that type of a that type of a request would be funded because I'm assuming that any requ any requirements you had to have in order to do that I, I don't know what any official requirements are to do a to do the um, type of oyster bed uh, renourishment that you did I'm certain that you you followed the processes is that correct. We work directly with the South Carolina uh, Department of Natural Resources. We select the locations through observation and, you know, kind of time after time after time. I've spent, you know, countless hours out on the water myself. And, you know, we listen to people around the island who talk about changing shoreline, particularly within the Borod Creek with the amount of boat wake and, of course, the storms we've had. So we listen carefully to them. Um, and, um, you know, that has really um, been the way that we approach. The South Carolina uh, Department of Natural Resources actually um, you know, oversees the program. Uh, we are the way in which that program is connected to the community. And so they do guide us. They do uh, basically all of the kind of side by side work with us when we get to that final stage, which is uh, basically building the reef. Each reef is about 400 bags of, of shell. All right. Um, again, thank you for your, your application. Uh, is there any other comments or questions from the committee? Okay, hearing none. Uh, thank you, Jean, for your presentation. Uh, we're supposed to take a break. I got 2.03. Um, so let's take a break until 2.15. And then can we have our next person, our next group ready at 2.15? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Take, take 10, take 12. <laughs> Mr. Fluker, I have yes. our next applicant ready whenever you All are. right. If, let's go ahead and go move forward with the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Mr. Perry? You're mute. You're on mute. Close this. There you are. You're. You got me? Yep. Anytime you're ready, Alan. Well, hopefully, you could hear a little bit of Irish music in the background. Uh, before I get started, I just want to commend Jean Fru and what she provided earlier. What a great organization the Hilton Head Out, you know, um, Outside Foundation is, and just what a great job that they do. So today you get a six foot two leprechaun to talk to you about the Hilton Head Island St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, Gabriel Vandeveld, um, you thing is, is watching on Facebook. Here with me today, I've got Jim LaFerrier, who is head of our bands, and Kim Capen, who is a past chairman of the, the parade committee. Um, we had a presentation for you, but since we had to go uh, virtual, we couldn't get the uh, bagpiper to come in and play for y'all. So, um, <clears throat> so, so here we go. A uh, little bit of history about the parade. Uh, started in 1983 with uh, about 330 spectators um, with one arrest and, uh, and has grown ever since. So that was started by Tom Riley and some other friends and they ran down uh, Pope Avenue and got a little bit of trouble. Um, we are going into our second anniversary of our 37th year. We have struggled, we have succeeded, and we have drawn a tremendous amount of people to Hilton Head Island. As you know, uh, we have not had the parade in the past two years. Uh, last year in 2020, we opted to do a, um, a makeshift uh, flotilla boat parade, which turned out very well, minimal cost to the committee. And we decided that, that since we had some time off, we needed to focus on how to expand the parade and, and make it even an even larger weekend. So we're asking for increased funds this year. We've got in, increased entertainment. 
we have, um, we are going to be doing the Saturday uh, boat parade again. We're going to do a Saturday concert down at Celebration Park. We're going to have uh, five uh, Irish bands playing down there. This is something new that we've introduced. We've talked about bringing it in for the past several years, and we finally realized that that's the spot to do it, since that's where we stage from anyway on the following day. Um, this year, we are doing it for free. We want to see how it goes. We want to get as many participants to come in and make certain that it is a viable and, and well-attended event and then see how we can utilize that in the future to generate some additional revenues. Then, of course, we've got the parade on Sunday. Uh, this year, we've got uh, six marching bands, Boston, New York, uh, uh, Boston, New York, Bergen County, Atlanta, uh, Charleston, Coastal Carolina, out of Myrtle Beach. We've got a actual band that's going to be playing, a musician band with different instruments. We have about 160 uh, band members just from those pipe and drums that will be coming in this year. And then, of course, we've got the high school marching bands, which will bring in probably another three to 400 individuals. So over the years, we have grown from roughly 30 spectators up to about 35,000 participants. And off the studies that we've done over the past years, we realized that we have anywhere from a 35 to 40 percent uh, visitation rate from, from tourists, both within a 50 mile and, and inside 50 mile and outside a 50 mile radius. Uh, those numbers have been provided. And um, we had an economic study that was completed in 2019, which was also provided with, with, the, with the application. And within that, and it was done by uh, Don Kleppersmith of the, the uh, he's the chief economist for Data Core Partners out of Connecticut. And he did a complete economic study of, of the uh, parade and went out and met with different businesses, different hotels, and tried to determine where their revenue was coming from and what the impact of our day then meant to them. So overall, the parade has a, a total economic impact to the community of about $2.3 million for the one day event. The volunteer hours that come into it are roughly 2,000 hours. I will say that this year we were probably above that because of the additional items that we have put forth into the expanded activities. The, the participation volunteer hours we calculated, actually he has calculated at roughly 10,000 uh, 10,000 hours. So the parade route runs from Pope Avenue down Office Park Road, and then it ends out on Greenwood Drive. That one day has been the largest revenue day for all the businesses, hospitality businesses along the parade route of any other day of the year. It is the biggest economic driver that they have and it's been a, an amazing thing that they have been able to sustain without the parade over the past two years. I will say that our sponsors from uh, for 2020 and 2021 have allowed us to retain our revenues, their sponsorship dollars, so that we can continue to utilize that money going into 22. So we have a big increase. Like others, we expect it to be a tremendous turnout, and we expect to meet or exceed that 35000 uh, participation. And uh, without it, without the funding from ATAX, there is no way that we would be able to move forward and provide this community with such a great quality event. You know, we spend a lot of time and we help out a lot of businesses. There's nothing we get in return but the satisfaction of, of offering a great one day free event to the community. And that community is Islanders and visitors alike. So with that, I will open it up um, to questions. Okay, um, we'll start this time with Mr. Berghausen. Any questions, comments? Um, it, it, yeah, well, I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed going to the event as well. Um, the only question I have is for your patron data on the application. Um, right. I'm not sure you've clarified this, but you have 18,000 physical tourists in zero Right. physical visitors. That what's I the, have corrected. Say, say again, I'm sorry. What's, what's the right numbers there? I mean, yeah, really. so, so I have corrected that um, to, I've broken that number out. I put the 18,000 in as a total, and I believe it is a 10,000, um, uh, 200 or so that are out of town and roughly six, uh, I'd have to go back and double check, but I sent that information to some day yesterday. 
but I did break that back out. Okay, but it's about 10, roughly 10,000. Yeah. Sure. Okay, okay, uh, that, that's all I have, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Ms. Johnson, any questions from you? Just a couple of comments. Thank you so much. I appreciated all the information in your economic impact report. That was very helpful. And um, this is a great example of turning the COVID on its head and coming out of it with two really great events. So looking forward to it. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, any, uh, Thomas, any questions or comments? Just to say that that pipe band lineup is about the best thing I've heard of in a long time. So I'm tremendously excited for this year's parade, Alan. Good job on that. Rich, I will tell you that those are four of the top 10 pipe and drum bands in the country. Listen, I'm, I'm from Morris County, which is a neighboring county to Bergen County. And those guys are the real deal, man. That's yes, spectacular. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Arnold, any comments or questions? Uh, I have no questions. Uh, like everyone on the committee and everyone else on this island, I'm excited about the return of the Patrick's Day Thank Parade. You. It's been a little different the past couple of years without it. So I uh, definitely look forward as well to hearing those bagpipes and seeing the drums and having a festival. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Any comments or questions, Mr. Farrell? Yeah, Alan, um, congratulations. It is, I consider it one of the majors, you know, I'm biased with the heritage, but after the heritage, it's one of the top events on the island. It's awesome that it's back. Just as a, a point of interest, do you and your, your management team um, assist with all the participating uh, exhibitors, including the bands and et cetera, do you assist with their lodging um, or they are on their own to find all their accommodations? So with, with the pipe and drum bands, we assist with their lodging and uh, daily food and back food. But other than that, everybody's on their own. They just find- That is correct. That is correct. And how many- we've got a, I believe we've got 105 or 110 nights at the Holiday Inn Express. And how many total exhibitors, including the floats and everything? So we, we would expect uh, this year 150. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Alan, I, I, I tell you that uh, uh, it was one of the great joys to come down to this island and see a uh, parade like this because I come from a town that very similar, come from Kansas City, Missouri, and we used and we do, we hold one of the biggest St. Patrick's Day parades in the country. Uh, but it started out as it basically is a radio personality, two drunks, and a three legged dog. <laughs> and back in 19, I think 70, 1973, if I'm not mistaken, they walked across from the street from one bar to another, and the dog had a sign on it that said, beginning and end of parade. And <laughs> that eventually grew into a parade that drew, drives 250,000 people to it now. Uh, we also have other neighborhoods that have parades on Snake Saturday and, and other things like that. Right. So I have missed the parade down here for two years, and I'm looking forward to having that tradition start back up. Awesome. Again. Thank you. I, I will also say, and I failed to mention that in 2019, Governor McMaster awarded us as the oldest, built, oldest St. Patrick's Day parade in the state. All right. Thank you, Mr. Perry. If there are no other questions or comments from the committee. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have a representative from the first T available? Mr. Pat is, is logging on. He's muted at this time. Cinda, I've recused myself from this because I'm a board member there. Um, does that mean I'm to sign off or do I listen and just not speak? You, I'm just going to ask that you um, um, mute your mic and um, shut off your camera. All right, you can you. stay online, though. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello. There we go. 
Hey, uh, Sundaya, do I need to share my screen or are you gonna be doing that? You're gonna share your screen. Okay, hold on a second. wrong one. There we go. Okay. There we go. I'm assuming everybody can see that. Yes, sir. All right, great. Well, first of all, uh, thank all of I want to thank all of you for the work you're doing with this. Um, you guys do a great job. You got a lot on your plate, and uh, sometimes it's tough to sit in judgment. Uh, so just thank you for the service you're uh, doing for the community. Um, so our uh, application this year is entitled a golf experience for all. This is a picture from uh, Women's Golf Day that we held earlier this year. Come on. There we go. Uh, just a quick review of our facility. Um, we really believe that that headline there is, is very indicative of what we try to do. We're, we're the only family affordable golf option around. Um, we charge $10 for adults, $5 for kids, and that's an all-day experience. They can come and go as they please for the entire day. And in fact, we, we list it as a donation. So literally, they can actually do it for free. And we have let people on the facility for free. So, um, so just one thing, we have a pretty uh, great place for people to practice with the par three course, a full-size driving range and a uh, very well-maintained uh, short game area. So it's a, and, and the disc golf course as well. Um, the only, like, once again, the only available thing on to the public uh, that's not at a golf course, very affordable, in fact, could be free. Um, so we had a couple of uh, really big wins this past year with the, um, with the Palmetto Championship at Congaree. Uh, we actually got national media exposure for the first tee of the Low Country during that broadcast. Um, that was a very cool thing, um, and we've experienced another increase uh, again this year in the number of people not only visiting the facility, but uh, also the number of tourists. Um, so it's been a pretty good year. Just some highlights: uh, we hosted International Women's Golf Day again this year, which we hope to do for next year and also expand on it, make it a little bit more, a uh, uh, little bit more of an event rather than just a golf clinic. Um, the, I, I mentioned the Congaree. This was a really cool thing where the people from Congaree and our volunteers ran a clinic for the kids and then they went over and played golf. Um, and as you can see, that was uh, highlights of that were shown on television during the broadcast. And then uh, the other, sorry, and the other thing that we thought was uh, kind of unique there, I'm sorry, I'm having a heck of a time here, is the uh, Musicians Triathlon. And what that was is, uh, it's kind of a cool thing. We had, and it was a, enabled us to reach a different audience that we would normally see. We had a group of area musicians out and they played a triathlon. They had a, a long drive competition. They played disc golf. And then they also played regular golf on the par three. And they all use their social media stuff to publicize the event. We got a lot of good awareness. So we got some, we got some new customers out of that. It was really a fun day and, and great publicity. Um, so now to some facts and figures, as you can see uh, there, I won't go through each one of these, but um, we've got about 45% of our visitors through the end of August have been tourists. Um, the last regular sort of year, I guess, was 2018, um, and that was 39%. So in that, in that five-year span, we've been able to increase the number of tourists and the number of visitors. Um, 
So here's what we're asking for. The, I'll come back to the top three in a moment, but as you can see, the bottom items are things that we've done in the past, rack cards, print, mail campaigns, email blasts, Facebook, newsletters, peach jar, the whole nine yards. But we have uh, sort of three new things that we wanna uh, add to the uh, arsenal this year. Uh, the first one is the concierge event. And this is something that we are actually gonna try in 2019. And for obvious reasons, we haven't been able to do it yet. And basically, what we'll do is invite all the concierges from the, from the uh, hotels and, and uh, facilities like that to come out, host them for an evening, have some food, have some drink, have some games and contests for them, let them understand what we're all about and how we can benefit their customers. We think that has the potential to have some really great impact once people get to the island. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the women in golf event, what we wanna do is take that international women's golf day and expand it and make it more of a all encompassing event. Uh, right now they come out, they do a golf clinic, they go out and play the par three and they kind of go home. Uh, we'd like to have food trucks there, you know, really amp this thing up and make it a real, uh, a real event that would be something special around the island. And uh, the newest thing is this cross networking partnership with other first tea chapters. And the notion here is just, is quite simple if you think about it. In the Hilton Head target markets, there's probably 50 or 60 first tea chapters. So what we wanna do is advertise on their websites, ask them to put Facebook posts up for us. And that way we can literally First T families are our target market. So we're hitting them directly. And hopefully with that, um, you know, when they know there's a facility here, you know, perhaps we could do some, you know, co-marketing with hotels and so forth, that kind of thing. So those are the newest things we're, we're looking for this year. Um, I do want to make one correction to our application. Um, as I was reviewing things today, I noticed that, um, some numbers were inaccurate. Um, so what I'm looking at on our application is the bottom of page two, where it says the total number of physical tourists served. Um, that number should actually be 1,514. Um, the total number of physical visitors served should be 319. The total number of physical residents served should be 1,539 and the total should be 3,543. Um, so with that, I do apologize for that. I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, let's go we'll start this time with uh, uh, Ms. Johnson. Any comments or questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. I think this is a great opportunity to increase the accessibility, availability, the equitability of golf on Hilton Head. So appreciate that very much. And one question on the bottom of, of my page five, where it referred to funding and you received uh, in donations, a little over 68,000. And in your presentation, you said that the fees that you charge are also called donations. So are those the fees that you collected or a separate donation? No, uh, what I was referring to in our, um, in my presentation would have been, uh, would have been facility use. Ah. Okay, thank you Donations for that are actually just, someone writes a check to the first tee because they like what we're doing. Okay. I can see that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, any questions or comments? No questions, Jim. Uh, just that this is one of those organizations that's a credit to the island and uh, very worthwhile work that's done. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Arnold, any questions or comments? Uh, just echoing those of thank you for what you do. Uh, for golf, the game of golf on Hilton Head. Um, obviously golf is in a strong position and should be there for the next several few years. So uh, having an affordable option for folks that maybe come to the island and some of the courses are out of their price range, uh, but still love the game and want to say they played some golf on Hilton Head, you definitely offer a, a top experience. Um, so thank you for that. 
and uh, presentation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Berghausen, any questions or comments? No, can I just clarify that the tourist number again? I was writing some other things down and I and I missed it when you said it. One okay. thousand. Um, so the actual tourist number, yeah, through August of this year, um, was one thousand five hundred and fourteen. One thousand five hundred and fourteen. Okay, so that's eight eight months. annualizes to 20, about 2,300. Okay. Which, which is uh, good. That gets your cost per tourist back down under $20, which Great, is thank where, you. where I think you had, you had been, and then you're saying we're going to spend more to try to get more. And, and that's good if we get more and you're getting more. And, and so the yes, cost, sir. yeah. Cost per tourist is, is good. That's where that's where I was. Like what you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, uh, Pat, but it's, I didn't get a chance because I was actually at the Congaree uh, for the Palmetto Championships. I I worked as a uh, as a marshal out there. Um, tell me what kind of exposure the first tee had again on during those those telecasts. Well, uh, basically, I, I think it was mostly on Saturday mm -hmm. um, or it was either Friday on the Golf Channel or Saturday on CBS, uh, which I, th I think it was CBS that carried it. Um, they actually showed the, they had done some taping uh, uh, with the, uh, the kids, you know, watching the kids at the clinic, the kids at the golf course. And then they they did some uh, individual stuff and they put a couple snippets of that in there. Um, and that was, you know, that's kind of what you saw. And then I also, they also put up a very nice little display uh, actually at the tournament. I probably should have included a picture of that, but it basically had, you know, photos from the event and had a little blurb about what the event was. It was kind of in an area uh, where, um, where, you know, people could walk by and see it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it's probably unfortunate I didn't see it because the way they were getting the volunteers in and out, we didn't really have much. Of, yeah. uh, you couldn't see much. So. A volunteering in a golf tournament is, is hard. It is. I mean, I've been on the, the Heritage, this will be my ninth year there. And yeah, I've done awesome. about 15 tournaments all together. It, yeah, it can be, yeah. it'd be tough. But again, we're getting back into it again. It's been a while since I've seen a full crowd at any golf tournament. So hopefully yeah. this next year, knock on wood, we'll have full house at all of our events, including the golf tournaments and such. Yeah, um, I would love to see that. That's for sure. Yeah, but there's nothing, there's nothing better than to have you know, the, the type of advertisement that we can get from these national events uh, that are carried on major, um, major um, um, outlets like CBS and the Golf Channel, um, you know, I, you know, and you have a good weather, <laughs> and which we, we were lucky in both cases last year with the Congaree and um, except for that one five minute period at the end of the day two, I think at the concrete where uh, they just didn't quite get the last grouping in before oh, yeah. everything right. broke yeah. loose. Um, uh, yeah, those always make for good, uh, good advertisements for the, for the, uh, for the island. So thank you for what you do. I, I enjoy your, your facility. I've been out there several times and hopefully I'll get back out there again with the senior group that is using it as well. The senior center has, has it one day or, in the morning one day a week and yeah. before i start my all my snowbirds come down this uh this winter i'll have to get out there and hit your links just get warmed back up again before i go to the other golf courses there you go great idea yeah, all right thank you pat all right well thank you all very much appreciate it we have representative from the Gullah museum yes sir I am getting everyone now. Can everyone hear us, Mr. Meldon, Ms. Nell? 
I believe you're on mute. Okay, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, sir, we can. Yes. Someone has, um, it, does someone have maybe Facebook on in the background? That problem has been cured. Hey, go ahead with your presentation, sir. Uh, good afternoon, folks. My name is Melvin Hollis. Um, I'm making a presentation on behalf of the Gullah Museum of uh, the Hilton Head Island. Uh, I am making this presentation because I was the last person at a meeting where they were to decide who was to make the presentation. Um, I'm the newest member of the board, uh, having lived in this area since about 2015. But uh, my family goes back at least five generations in South Carolina. And so I've come home after leaving as a young man and coming back. I've been particularly interested in the uh, museum uh, established by um, uh, by Ms. Louise Cohen, established, I think, in 2003. As you know, uh, she, did, she uh, dedicated the land and the little blue house that's on that, um, that's on that, that um, uh, property. Um, and um, I'm coming to ask your support for what I will call the new museum. If you've driven by that new museum in the last year, you will notice significant changes. First of all, there's a fence and now there's a mural. We've also added a brand new trailer to that area, which we are in the process of fixing. Um, the migrant houses are also located on that location. I'd just like to talk for a minute about where we will be going over the next year. Uh, we have leveled the site so that we can add new, um, uh, new exhibits to the site. We have the new murals, as I have pointed out. Uh, we've had a surveyor come over and look the site over, and we have submitted a brand new um, site plan uh, to the town. Or we're, well, as a matter of fact, we got the site plan back today, so we'll be submitting that uh, to the town. Uh, that site plan includes an outhouse. One of the problems with the museum uh, is that you have to have people able to stay and enjoy themselves. We will be adding an outhouse. It will be adding uh, facilities that are designed like an old outhouse. Uh, we are adding an office building. We've already located the building to be located at the site. Uh, we are waiting for uh, approval from the town. The museum really has all sorts of artifacts that we have not been able to display. And the reason we have not been able to display them at the site is because there has not been a building and there has not been a place to display those, uh, those artifacts. They have, in fact, been stored uh, in our uh, storage area and in Ms. Uh, Cohen's house. Uh, one of the things that will happen as soon as we get the approval from the town is we will then have an, uh, an office building where we can do business um, and we will be able to do business and also uh, be able to display some of the artifacts that we have, uh, that we have saved over time. We're putting in a new storage unit uh, we have two migrant houses at the site that we have not been able to uh, use. Uh, we are we have put out now offers to have those um, those buildings renovated. And then there is the big house, uh, which is the home that uh, Ms. Cohen lived in. Uh, we're getting ready to have that. Uh, we're getting ready to have that located at, at the site. Finally, we have to put in the the uh, the decks and the ramps to the building. Now, there we did not do much business during the the pandemic, as you as you know. We closed and then we opened back up. Uh, we just opened back up in July. Uh, we had a heck of a turnout in July. Um, as a matter of fact, just to quote some numbers for you, um, I want to look look for the numbers. Um, We've, we've completely redone our, um, our website. Uh, last year at our website, we had um, uh, on the average 678 visitors per month. Uh, since the new site is up, we've had about 1,200 visitors per month. On the page, page views, we went from about 1,700 page views to about 3,500 um, page views uh, per month. So 
uh, the traffic the traffic is really picking up. Um, we had um, last year we had about four hundred and ninety six visits. This year in two months we had five hundred and sixty six visits. So you can see how the visits to both the site and the website are increasing significantly. We will be over the next uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, we will be hosting uh, the annual Soul Christmas. Uh, we have the annual gala awards um, event that we do every year. We have the annual oyster roast. Uh, we participate in the Gullah breakfast. We have usually the Gullah food cook-off. And this year we're going to do a Gullah food festival on October 30th. So we're having a very, a very active year. Um, what I'm going to do is at this point, just point out that there's a difference uh, between the display and the attraction uh, to um, the Mitchellville experience, which had to do with the establishment of the first free community for African Americans in this country. But there's a period between Reconstruction and the bridge up to 1956. And the question is, for that culture, for that experience, where are the artifacts? Where's the historical record? Uh, how can people have that experience? And the answer to that is they can have that experience at the Gullah Museum. A problem that the Gullah Museum has had up until this point has been capacity. We've had more people interested in visiting than we've been able to that we've been able to handle. This the, the, the presentation I've just made to you shows you how we are doing capacity building we'll be able to receive more people, we'll be able to display more, and we'll be able to have what we think will be a more useful and a more um, fulfilling experience. What do we do to attract and to keep people on the island? It's one thing to bring people to the island, but the other thing that you wanna measure is what is the quality of the experience. Um, we think that the, uh, visiting that uh, museum add significantly to the quality of the museum. I would just, uh, something that's related, I would just like to point you to a survey. Uh, this is a 2020 survey uh, done by the Gullah Geechee, it's called the Gullah Geechee Tourism Study. Uh, it's a 2020 report. Uh, I think the most important thing is the first line. The first, the key finding is the potential leisure spending for Gullah Geechee quarter states is $34 billion. Um, and if you go to just about any national, uh, any national website and look at African American experience in South Carolina, or if you go to the website of the quarter, the national quarter, you will find the museum listed. So what happens is people who are visiting, while that may not have been on their list, uh, when they began to the travel, there's something they pick up uh, and it is, some, it is something that a place where they visit when they're here. The increase in the numbers of site visits on our website and the, and the increase in traffic just by that site uh, tells us that is uh, the only thing that's limiting us right there now is our capacity. And over the next year, that is what we're gonna be focusing our time on. So uh, I am willing to answer any questions you may have about what those plans are, uh, what our priorities are and how we uh, expect to achieve them. For some reason, I am not hearing you, uh, Mr. Sorry about that, Mr. Here. Thomas. It, uh, you're up first. Mr. Hollis, I I have uh, I really don't have any questions. I live on the north end. I pass uh, the Gullah Museum frequently. I see Louise every now and then, and I believe that the work that's been done over the last year is a great testament to the ability for the Gullah Museum to continue to improve and to thrive. So I applaud your plans. Uh, I am extremely hopeful that we can make a meaningful uh, grant to the Gullah Museum for its future work. But I, I applaud the work that has been done to date and look forward to the improvements in the future. Mr. Thomas, our biggest problem is that Ms. Cohen has had no place to do business. Her <laughs> business has been done under a tree at that site. The greatest contribution we can make is an office with a chair and a telephone. 
microphone and a coffee pot. Uh, once we've done that, we think you'll see a significant increase in business and interaction with the rest of the community. Well, I, I, I wish you and, and Louise incredibly well on that. Thank you. Mr. Arnold, any comments or questions? Uh, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, again, this is one of those uh, very rich and important pieces to the island itself. So thank you for the work that you do. And uh, like Mr. Thomas said, you'll have my full support to the max. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Mr. Farrell. No, just thank you, Mr. Meldon. Just like everyone's saying, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Keep, please keep it up and we're, we're behind you. We think this is going to be a very exciting year. You will not recognize the museum in another year. Well, that's great. Mr. Berghausen. I would ditto the comments. You did a great job at anticipating all my questions. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, sir. That is a first today, I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you for the important work that you do in adding to the historical and cultural environment here on Hilton Head Island. I've appreciated the improvements that I've seen. I stopped by with all of my grandkids to take pictures in front of the murals, really love those a lot, and look forward to um, your continuing the plans as you've outlined them. So thank you very much. For what we you hope did. to see you at the food festival on the 30th. I'm coming with my girls, yes. Right. Thank you. Uh, I take it that you're, and again, I, I know you just submitted this. I, I think one of your biggest problems other than office space has also been parking as well. I take it that your site plan takes into account all those things that are necessary for the museum. We are going to have to work that out as up to this point, we've worked with the boys club uh, it is an issue we're working on and we hope we can solve it. Now, um, actually it depends on what they allow us to do with the site plan. We've got some problems with setback and how much space we can use. When that's resolved, we'll be able to address the, the parking, I think in a better way. All right, thank you. Good presentation. You'll have my support as well. So thank you for your thank presentation you so much. today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. If there are no other questions. All right, let's move on to our, our next presentation, the Heritage Library. And Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna to have to recuse myself from this. So I'm gonna black the screen out and mute the microphone. All right, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Barbara, oh, there you are. I'm on. I'm on, good afternoon. I'm Barbara Catanese, I'm the Executive Director at the Heritage Library. Um, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity. It's always fun to meet with all of you and talk about what we do and uh, also to answer your questions. I'm gonna take you through a uh, brief PowerPoint and then we can get down to questions. If I can get it to work. There we go. In our 2021 application, I'm going to review what we've done in the last year first and then go into the 2022. Our total request was $110,000. That was $10,000 less than we had requested previously. And obviously that had a lot to do with what, with what was going on in the world with the pandemic. $15,000 towards um, site maintenance and $95,000 that we use advertising and marketing. In facilities maintenance, okay, the costs that we're looking at there, okay, and basically we base this on attractive sites, attract visitors, okay. So each year we have to go through one annual big cleanup when we start our tour season, regular tree trimming and removal of dead trees, um, the regular monthly maintenance, where they come in, clean up pathways, things like that. Minor storm cleanup. And this year we are also adding people counters. Uh, they should go in next week, not helping with this year's numbers, but they will help with next year's numbers. 
under advertising and promotion. One of the big things that we did this year was the creation of videos. We started out with the process of creating two marketing videos. One marketing Fort Mitchell, one marketing Zion Chapel of Ease. One of the things that happened once we got all that video collected and did all, did all that, we discovered that we had some really great stories from the individuals that helped us with the videos. So Louise Cohen talking about how her family rode across Port Royal Sound to escape and come to Mitchellville, how the silver chalices were, remo were taken from the Chapel of Ease when it was destroyed, but returned again. So we took those two marketing videos and we created a series that we're calling Our Storied Island. And they are those individual stories that connect people and place and tell our history through the people who are still here. We did one with Louise Cohen, with Alex Brown, with Chuck Yaris, who is a descendant from the Baynard family at Zion, Louise, uh, Luana Graves Sellers, and I'm missing one and cannot think of it. Um, but that was a big chunk of, of what we did in 2021. In addition, of course, we had all the other marketing, the rack cards, the Facebook ads, everything else. One of the other things that's going on right now that hasn't happened yet, but will happen by the end of the year is new signage at our sites. The signage that we have right now is literally falling down. Uh, so we are in the process of, of specking those signs out and getting, and getting some bids so that we can have those up and in place by the end of the year. We also created a guide to historic sites that we could, um, that we could give to the Chamber of Commerce and other, and other visitor and convention um, yeah, and other VCBs along with our rack cards so that folks had a clear understanding of, of the breadth of historical sites on the island. And that's a print guide. We're gonna move that into the website in 2022. We added a QR code. We partnered with Culture HHI. We took one of the marketing videos for Zion and we added that QR code out at Zion. In the first five weeks, we had 185 hits on that QR code, which also transferred to website hits and things like that. We did some additional programs and classes. We are still not doing live classes. We should start that again in January We'll limit the number of folks depending on the health situation at that time, but we hope to start doing live and in-person a little bit more, but we are still doing online classes. We are getting ready now to pop all the advertising and marketing for historic holidays. That will run December 4th through December 11th this year. Again, the highlight for us was the, was the video collection that we did. We've had 109,000 views in just two months. They didn't launch until July, and 109,000 views was pretty good. We, in addition to that, though, 13,000 engagements. So yes, folks clicked on that video, but then what did they do after that? They shared it, they posted it, they liked it, all that fun stuff. We also added the Western Resort reached out to us and they are using the Our Storied Island videos in their elevators. And we had, a, we had an interest, on Sunday we did a bike tour for a corporate group that was in from um, the Northeast. So we had 25 folks on a, on a bike tour of historic sites and everyone saw the video. So that was a great, yeah, you know, it was great because it kind of just, just hit the Westin, but absolutely everybody saw that video up and down the elevator. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our marketing reach, okay? Virtual classes, again, without the, uh, without the in-person because of the um, pandemic, we're a little bit different. But basically what we saw from January to July was that we had a total of 4,537 folks participate in classes. Of those, that tourist number was 1,985. And yes, we're talking about that virtual visitor versus that visitor who is here. But even with just the virtual aspect and not the, and not the live aspect, okay, we're seeing a 6% increase 
in participation year over year. Ghosts and Myths is a, li is a live event that we do. It starts next week. We limited greatly the number of tickets in 2021 in 2020 because of the pandemic. We are still limiting tickets, not as much this year. It is an outdoor event. And right now we are sold out across the board with the exception of the last performance on Saturday night on the 23rd. Historic Holidays kicks off. All the events for Historic Holidays are outdoors so that we didn't have to limit participation so we could do some larger events. So everything we're planning for Historic, event, historic Holidays is outdoors, okay? One of the great things that we saw in, and it's kind of one of those things that, you know, what money can't buy, but the work that we're doing with the Ayers Property Family Research Project netted us two mentions in USA Today, including an article. And the article, I had not seen the article. I knew the mention was in. We knew that the mention was in, but we hadn't seen the article yet. And the phone started ringing off the hook the next day that day when the article came out. We had 19 calls to the library as a result of that article. Our digital reach, okay, what we're seeing is a huge increase in website views. We had approximately 60,000 total website views in 2020. We are now averaging 22,000 per month. The increase in that can be attributed a whole lot to the partnerships that we're working with, okay, so the VCB generated 23,000 views to our website. And I know I've got the number for um, Culture HHI has delivered approximately 146,000 views to our website. So we are seeing a huge number, a huge increase in that number. When we look at those visitors and where are they from, 50. 82% of those of those visitors are from outside the market and 55% of the website visitors are from over 50 miles away with the majority South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, New York, and Connecticut. We had 1,800 international visitors. This year with virtual events and everything that we did marketing-wise digitally, we touched 49 states, Canada, the UK, New Zealand, and Austria. The other thing that we have done this year with all our email blasts is we've added a partner spotlight. So we can take what our partners are doing. So when, when Mitchellville is doing something special, they, they can be in on our email blasts, Culture HHI, Gollum Museum. Those cultural partners can all, all they need to do is send something to me and we will add that to our email blasts. The other thing that we did um, this year, we had an we had a good year recognition-wise because we were a finalist in the PGA Charity of the Year, so we got the video that was played on all the on all the trolleys taking folks to the tournament. We were named to the South Carolina Liberty Trail, Zion Cemetery was. We got coverage in the Greenville News, the Associated Press, and USA Today. In our 2022 application, Total request is $120,000 with $25,000 going to the sites and $95K back into advertising. How that breaks down. Regular monthly maintenance, we know it's going to go up. This year, we will finish up the parking improvements at Zion. And in the past, we didn't have to take care of the parking area at Fort Mitchell because the old Fort Pub connects to, for, to Fort Mitchell, and we had a parking easement agreement with the old Fort Pub. The old Fort Pub is no more. So we are getting a parking area at Fort Mitchell. That, that will be paid for with, uh, with a private donation, but we are going to have to maintain that parking area. So improvements to the parking and driveway areas are also going to drive up because we're going to have to renew that renew our maintenance contracts and obviously there's going to be more work so that cost will come in. Same kind of thing that we see every single year. We need we do that one big cleanup, we do the storm cleanup, we do the regular maintenance. This year we also, we had talked about this in the past and we avoided it. Um, we're at the point where we can't avoid it. We want to add security cameras at each site. There has been some vandalism at Zion Cemetery 
And the other thing that we have is we have, you know, our sites are open to the public, but what we have to be careful of is outside groups that don't contract with us using the property. And we've run into that. Um, so basically cameras will help us know who's on our property doing what at what time. It's a shame that people vandalize the cemetery, but they do. Advertising and promotion. Basically we're looking at that same amount of money and what are we going to do with those dollars. We want to create, we want to add to the Our Story video, to our, our storied island video collection and start to look at, you know, really broaden and really bring in what is essential to, um, to our history as it relates to people. So we want to talk about the fishing industry. We want to talk about modern development. We want to talk to some of, you know, more native island families. We want to get into some of the Gullah art and song and storytelling with those videos. And we hope that we can do this over a period of four to five years until we can build that library to 20 videos that really tell a great story. If you haven't seen the Alex, um, Alex Brown video yet, he has a great line in it where he talks about how the people and the places are all connected and the, islands, the island has great beaches, great golf, but our history and our culture brings its soul to the island. And we really do believe that. And so we really want to continue to get that message of this is the soul of our island. All the regular marketing and things that we do, the rack cards, the emails, the Facebook ads. We also are looking at with, you know, hopefully with the demise of the pandemic, bringing back more live programming. We had really good reaction before the pandemic to History and Happy Hour and Authors and Afternoon Tea, and we want to bring those back. We also want to take the, what, the, what we have successfully with the QR codes and literally build those out with videos so that someone can literally go in and do a video tour of each of the sites with well-placed QR codes. Interpretive signs. We're doing the entrance signs and the welcome signs this year. What we're trying to do now are some interpretive signs for those folks who don't use QR codes, but those QR codes would be a part, would become an integral part of that interpretive sign. The other thing that we did, we did the historic site guide this year. Next year, what we want to look at is the guide actually to the library. A lot of what we want to do with the history and what we saw with the family history in the videos is we're telling this great family story, but the library can also, t can also tell you your family story. Where do you sit in history? Where does your family come from? How, where were you during different historical moments you know, in, in our country's history? And um, we're kind of stealing this from, of all places, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, and, and really, nothing against Fort Wayne. I've been there. They were very welcoming, but I'd rather do family vacation meet family tree research on Hilton Head than Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we really kind of want to push that. If it rains, come in with your kids. Let's, let's dig into where your family's from and some of the history of that and really kind of push that. And in that, in that process, we will do both a print and a website guide to the Heritage Library. In addition, we hope to finally bring back the Revolutionary War Forum. Again, we were very cautious about doing anything live and in person and bringing groups into an inside area, but we think by next fall we'll be past that pandemic piece so that we can actually do something inside. And also we want to start to program, we really want to start to focus in on Having, the, having Zion Cemetery added to the South Carolina Liberty Trail so we can partner with, with the, with the uh, Battleground Trust and push what's coming down the line with the South Carolina Liberty Trail. We're going to do a little reinventing of bike tours, okay? We're do, we do some private tours right now. We didn't bring them back full swing because of insurance costs, but we think we can make them more event-like than just regular um, bike tours. And of course, as I mentioned before, we're going to bring back history and happy hour and authors and afternoon tea. What I'd like to do now is just give you a glimpse of what we did with that video in the hopes, okay, in the hopes 
that the video will actually show. Let me stop the share and go out of this. Fingers crossed. This was a piece that came out of what we did with some of the marketing um, during the process of making the videos. We created a little ad that we can run and we've pushed out to some, to some of the television channels and things like that to use. And that's a piece of the videos that we did. So, questions? All right. Well, first we'll start uh, this time around with Mr. Arnold. Thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, as always, um, pardon the pun, but the roots you guys have on the island here are fantastic. Uh, and the, the information and the resources available to folks to track back or uh, unlike any other on the island. Uh, it's one of those organizations that is um, well received by our tourists and everyone here on the island who's wanting to dig and again touch on the history and the culture of the island. So uh, thanks for that work. I don't have any questions. All right. Mr. Farrell? No, I, I appreciate the, the presentation a lot, of, a lot about it too. So thank you very much for all your efforts and can, uh, best of luck for continued success. And, and uh, thank you for being so respectful of our time by having it so comprehensive. Mr. Berghauser. I'd just say ditto and thanks for your effort at trying to understand who, so well who your customer is, you know, who, who's coming. You've obviously Put a lot of work into that too and that that helps us so much help you and and we'd like more people to understand how how important we think it is not only to you but but to us so keep data mining data mining is not fun <laughs> no it's it's not but unfortunately it's necessary uh, for us to do our job too right. um uh you know the, we're, I think we're investing here. We're trying to build something with with you, and and the uh, the hope and expectation is that the tourists will come, and you're giving us reason to believe that they will come, so that this continues well, so that this becomes a more efficient use of a tax dollars in the future. But now it's we're investing with you because we believe in you. We hope Thank so. We're trying. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ms. Johnson. Hello, Ms. Kananisi. Thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you for what the Heritage Library is doing on a macro level and a micro level to spotlight the history that's here on Hilton Head Island. I'm particularly impressed with the collaboration that you have with other local organizations. So as you shine the spotlight on one another, you're spreading out the experience. So there's no conflict. If I'm a tourist, I don't have to decide there are two things happening today, where should I go? But with that collaboration, everyone has an opportunity to fully partake and to plan that return visit. So thank you for the presentation very much and the work that you do. We're lucky we have great partners here on the island. It's an incredible group of people to work with. Agreed, yes. Thank you. Uh, and I have no questions of you. Thank you for your, the information in your in your uh, application packet and thank you for your presentation today both of which were very um, 
gave us the information we needed. That's the reason there's not a lot of questions, <laughs> well, uh, Barbara. Good. So that's the way to do it. So thank you very much. Um, and, and if you haven't looked at the videos, please do, because we're really kind of proud of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. The next presentation is from the Long Cove Club. Ms. Cohen. Hello. Can you hear me Hi. okay? Yes, ma'am. You can begin when you're ready. Okay, terrific. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Christy Cohen from Long Cove Club, along with Lindsay Finker, and we're representing the Darius Wrecker Intercollegiate. So I'll share my screen. Can you all see that yet? Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. So, there we go, let's see, there we go. Since we're first time applicants this year, I thought I would give a little history of the tournament so you knew how it came about. Um, I'm sure y'all know who Darius Recker is, but you might not know that he is a, is a very avid golfer and plays in most tour stops uh, around the world actually, plays golf during the day and does concerts at night. So about 10 years ago, he was playing a round in uh, Columbia with the USC women's golf team. Darius is an alumnus of USC. He was playing with them and the idea came up to uh, hold a uh, tournament in, at Long Cove Club in Hilton Head. So the idea was born. So that was 10 years ago. We're working on our 10th anniversary tournament in 2022. Um, the Tournament attracts the best and brightest in terms of uh, golf teams. Uh, 35 participants have gone on to play in the PGA, which is amazing. So we get incredibly uh, high caliber players here. And the tournament really is widely known as the top women's golf collegiate tournament in the country. So based on that success, the Golf Channel actually approached us to possibly televise the tournament in 2022 if we could find sponsorship to underwrite the production. So we have been working on that for eight months. We haven't quite been able to cross that finish line, but we are still working on it. And we have a uh, tentative deadline of Thanksgiving to, to be able to finally kind of with the Golf Channel make that call. We think we, we, we might have one sponsorship, uh, sponsor, television sponsor secured working on another. So we're really still up in the air about whether it will be televised. The presentation today speaks to the tournament without Golf Channel uh, televising, but you can imagine that if we did uh, have it televised, it would really change the, the impact to tourism here. But I wrote the presentation as if we did not get the uh, tournament. So this year's tournament is at the last day of February, first two days of March. We have 17 teams. The big draw here is that Darius Rucker actually does a concert at the Art Center uh, for the players and their coaches and sponsors and uh, lucky Long Cove members who uh, win a lottery to purchase tickets. 100 Long Cove members uh, run the event. And we generally get about uh, 2,000 spectators every year that watch the tournament uh, for the three days at no charge. A few pictures. Uh, bottom left, we are a unique tournament in that our team champion uh, trophy is actually a guitar, the same kind of guitar that Darius uses on stage. And he signs all the trophies and uh, the team trophy. And you can see the girls actually have guitar-shaped glass trophies as well. So this it gives you an example of our 2020 sponsorship. The majority of our operating budget comes from local sponsorships. The big draw here, of course, is not only advertising to our spectators and in a lot of our advertisements, but also, of course, the concert. The concert is a uh, huge, huge draw to see a uh, pretty major rock star in a 300 
50 seat arena is uh, an incredible experience. The, invitation, uh, the invitations have gone out for the 2022 event and we have uh, 17 of the top teams in women's golf. Going into our budget. So as we talked about, the majority of our revenue is from sponsorships. Um, team entry fees come in second. That pays for their lodging and pays for some of their food while they're here. We do sell concert tickets to members, whatever's left over. And this year we're requesting a $30,000 ATAX grant for uh, marketing. So our total revenue is 231,000. In terms of expenses, they generally fall into 10 categories. Um, the biggest expense is the Darius Record Concert. Without that, we wouldn't probably be able to get the sponsorship. So it's definitely uh, a needed part and it makes it to be the most coveted ticket for the teams to be asked to compete in the tournament. Um, uh, team and volunteer meals comes after that and then team housing. So in terms of visitors, in 2020, we had 2,000 spectators over the three days. In the past, the previous nine years, we have uh, given out numbered car passes at our security gate. The security team estimates that each car has two to three occupants, sometimes four, rarely one. Um, and anecdotally, based on license plates, the majority of spectators are not island locals. They are uh, out of state, even out of country. We do get a lot of um, snowbirds who like to watch the tournament. So we have estimated at this point that 45% of those 2,000 are tourists, uh, visitors at 35%, and resident, island residents 20%. But we have contracted with uh, USCB, the research center, and they will be coming to the 2022 tournament so that we can start collecting uh, surveys and zip codes and be a little more specific and less anecdotal for you. So this is the past tourism impact to Hilton Head Island. So one of the really fun things and the, the draws for the, the women's collegiate teams is they don't stay in uh, hotels, they actually stay in large ocean oriented rental homes. So we work with three local rental companies to find the right houses for them. Um, in uh, 2019, we spent almost $26,000 in the community for those houses. In 2020, it was 26. Uh, going forward, by the way, that those prices, rental prices have gone up. So we've budgeted over $30,000 for that. Uh, the Sinesta is our official hotel. We have a direct link on our website to book rooms at the Sinesta at a discounted uh, group rate. Uh, before the Sinesta, the Westin was our provider, and you can see some of our nights. Uh, last uh, tournament, I say last year, but it was last tournament. We didn't have the tournament in 2021. We booked 66 nights for a total of uh, $9,100. Additional impact, of course, we give the players and their coaches, which is about 130 people, some meals here at Long Cove for their entry fee. But we actually, there are five meals, uh, at least five meals that every team uh, of about eight people dine out at our local restaurants. We use the art center uh, and pay them their full rate. We use local uh, catering companies, et cetera. So here's our projected tourism impact for 2022. So this year we're gonna rent 16 homes at an estimated cost of 30,400. Uh, the Sinesta, again, is our official hotel. We estimate the bookings to be slightly higher at 75 room nights uh, for a little over $10,000. Um, again, we book the Art Center for uh, over $11,000. We use Surge Catering for the reception that accompanies the concert. Um, again, the players and coaches will dine out. And then here's where I did note, we do have this potential Golf Channel impact. So. The production team from Golf Channel alone is 75 people. That's on air and behind the scenes. So those 75 people will need to book about five room nights each. That's another 375 room nights, another $50,000. And they have to eat out on the island for another 50 to 75,000. 
but the total impact estimated for 2022 without the Gulf Channel is around $72,000. So to get to marketing. So previously our budget has hovered six, seven, eight thousand dollars a year. And we have done fundamentally local, although the more digital we do, uh, we are end up targeting people if they're here and go back to where they're from. Um, but we've had some, you know, certainly we drive a lot of traffic to our Long Cove website separately for prospective buyers. And they see, we certainly feature the Darius record there as well. So we had a, a very good impact considering we only spent around a little under $9,000 last time. So in terms of our request, we are requesting $30,000 to spend on marketing um, to target more out of area this year. So because we are working with Golf Channel to have the tournament televised, we had to move the tournament to Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Previously, the tournament was always uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. A little easier to get spectators to the island for a weekend trip uh, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday than it is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So that's why we feel strongly that we need to increase our advertising budget and really go out of area looking for more people who would make this a mini vacation to the island, hopefully stay through the next weekend. Uh, but it definitely is more, uh, more challenging to get these, the same kind of numbers to get 2000 spectators on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But that's when uh, Golf Channel needed the content for the network to make sense. They do professional at the end of the week and they do collegiate at the beginning of the week. So our marketing strategy, we uh, asking for the $30,000 out of state marketing will be 14,000 of it in area marketing. So just about split. Um, we will have a heavy concentration of digital display ads. We will be uh, geofencing down to the neighborhood and to the house based on, it's amazing what, uh, what they can do now, uh, based on parameters, um, people who have attended other collegiate events, we can target them in their homes with their ads on uh, Facebook and other uh, apps. So a lot of digital display search engines so that the tournament comes up first, a lot of Google AdWords, social media campaign, et cetera. But we'll also do print ads um, that will all be, uh, a lot of those will focus on out of area um, and golf specific uh, publications. So besides Hilton Head and Bluffton, we're really focusing, uh, we'd like to focus on Atlanta and Savannah, Charlotte and Raleigh in North Carolina, Jacksonville, Columbia, Charleston, and Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. And that's it. We'd love to take whatever questions you might have. Okay. Uh, start this time with Mr. Farrell. Well, thank you for your presentation. I know firsthand from this, I've experienced this as a spectator, and this tournament has tremendous leadership. It's it's it's, it's a PJ Tour event, just a different generation of players. The South Carolina University of South Carolina plays as the host, but Bob Patton and Lindsey Finger and and uh, Leon and the whole team there, they put on a really first class show over there. I think what's not measured maybe to a certain extent is the, the number of residual or people that come and support an event like this, like vendors, the PXGs, the rules officials, the, I think it's, it's a more difficult thing to measure, but um, we all know that when you have events like this, there's a lot of other people, there's, there's families, college coaches. And um, I think it's a, a wonderful event. I think it's a great reflection on Hilton Head Island and it does bring an awful lot of, uh, heads and beds, and I applaud you on, on how well this is coordinated. It's a tremendous event. Thanks. We've caught some of those people coming to the island at the, at the Sinesta or the Westin in the past, but you're right. We can never quantify all of them because if they rent their own, you know, VRBO or go to a different hotel, we're just not able to capture them. Right. right. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Berghausen. It's a new application. I like the idea too. Um, I like that. I think people are coming for multi nights. You know, this is not something you probably come to for for one night. I think you're 
introducing young um, young adult golfers potentially to Hilton Head. They could become a lifelong, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, vacation place for them. And and so mm-hmm. it's seems to me that this is this is right in our wheelhouse. And you know we have to try some things. And so I think I think this is great. The uh, by some numbers here, I had written in my notes thirty three dollars per tourist. Okay, that's that's a that's a start. And uh, I think with with more money spent on advertising, and as this matures, you've got significant opportunity to uh, to bring that down. So um, I I think it's very favorable. Good presentation. Great, thanks, Miss Johnson. Well, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate your positive approach. You are <laughs> hopeful that that extra, uh, that golf tele- televised performance will occur and yeah. you've constructed a marketing strategy around it. Having said that, since you haven't applied for ATAX funds in the past, I'm assuming that that's your catalyst. That's the reason that you're here now because you're anticipating the televised event. Is that correct? Yes, actually, once we started talking about Golf Channel and working on that kind of television sponsorships, it really occurred to us, you know what, we may be able to apply to ATEX funds. I, I'm not sure that it just was ever discussed before. And we realized, you know, that this could be a great avenue to help support the tournament and really take it to the next level. Got it. Again, I think it's a great positive approach. And the presentation answered a lot of questions that I had had previously. One other granular question, Um, when you say that we um, provide the homes for the players, uh, who's paying for that, those rental homes accommodation? So it's really the teams paying for it. I say we because Long Cove does the booking for them through the local rental companies as a courtesy for them. They're just, you know, supplied a, uh, you know, here's your house, there's full of snacks. We have a a member volunteer who's a hostess who, you know, helps them do anything they need to while they're here to kind of act like a concierge for them. So the teams do pay for it with their entry fees. We just do the booking. So I say we. Very good. Thank you. Those are my questions. And again, a great presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Mr. Thomas. Christy, I just want to thank you for the presentation. It was incredibly well structured and wonderfully data heavy. So that's much appreciated. And uh, it's a great tournament. I mean, it's been going for a while, as you as you pointed out, and it's got a wonderful reputation. So if we can help take it to the next level, I think it's a very worthwhile expenditure of a tax money. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Arnold. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I too enjoy seeing a new uh, applicant. So welcome to the, the ATAX um, application process. Um, I think it's a, a great tournament, obviously, uh, and that it falls at the end of the shoulder season as we're leading into the RBC Heritage. If we're able to capture that television contract with them coming in, it would put more eyes again um, leading up showcasing the island as a whole, mm. leading up the busiest events we have on the island. So uh, look forward to working with you and see what we can do to help send this thing to the next level. Thanks. Thanks. Any, any uh, event that has the opportunity to bring not only uh, nationwide coverage, but even worldwide coverage to this island is a, is a benefit. And no matter whether or not Golf Channel covers it, you know, on those three days, there will be coverage of it in some manner, um, I'm sure on their network um, and in the local networks and even then probably in the ESPN or otherwise, because something will happen uh, in a tournament of that nature that will cause there to be a, uh, a uh, some sort of a news blurb. And there's always, it's always good to have a positive influence and I guess that along with the uh, the RBC uh, would just is another thing that people say that this is this is an idyllic place we need to go there 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I thank you for your application. Uh, do any other members or anything have any further comments? All right. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, everybody. All right. And we have representative from the Sea Pines Forest Preserve. We do, Mr. Henderson. There he is. Mr. Henderson. You are actually muted. Yes, ma'am. There we are. <laughs> All right, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Are you all able to uh, see my presentation? Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate you sticking uh, it out today. Uh, we are uh, Forest Preserve. This is our first time making an application. So we do appreciate the efforts and we do, do appreciate your time. I'd like to start by just acknowledging a couple folks from the Forest Preserve Committee uh, that, that helped put this together, including Sharon Germano and Bernice Slutsky, Rob Bender, Committee Chair Charlie Miner, and CSA's Director of Finance, Victoria Shanahan. So it's been a team effort trying to, trying to put this together. For those of you that are not familiar with the Sea Pines Forest Preserve, it is in Sea Pines. It's indicated by the, the square that you can see in your map. I like to view the Forest Preserve almost as Hilton Head Central Park. It was established by Covenant in 1970 at 605 acres. It is the largest tract of undeveloped land that remains on the island. We received a prestigious important bird area designation by the Audubon Society in 1998. And we are consistently listed by TripAdvisor as a, as a top thing to do while on Hilton Head Island. Shell rings, if you're not familiar with them, they were constructed three to 5,000 years ago along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Although the majority of the shell rings are distributed along Georgia and South Carolina's coast. So we have the majority of them. There's only approximately 50 that have been discovered. And archeologists are unsure why they were built, but they're interested in shell rings because they were constructed during a pivotal point in time and place. What does this mean? This means that new technologies were coming along at that time. So we're talking about, you know, pottery. Uh, agriculture was just beginning to get started. Uh, group size, because of these improvements in technology, went from smaller, more hunter-gatherer nomadics to increasingly larger and larger groups that could then begin to coalesce, could then begin to form culture, and then tribal identities then followed. So there was no Native American tribe that we can associate with the shell ring because it was during this time that they were built that those tribal identities that we think of today were just starting to, to take hold. This is showing the uh, approximate location of the shell ring in the Sea Pines Forest Preserve. I'm trying to point out with my pointer, but just due north of that star is, is Fish Island. It is uh, the hub of the Forest Preserve and the shell ring is, is located within a, a five minute easy walk from, from the um, Fish Island there in the Forest Preserve. So specific to our ring, it was constructed about 4,000 years ago. There has been limited archeological work in the past that was done, but it was poorly documented. The ring was listed on the National Register in 1970. And according to the archeologist from Binghamton, who I'll talk a little bit about next, it is one of the most pristine rings known to exist. 
Binghamton did do seasonal archaeological work from 2015 to 2019. They were there during the winter of 2015 and then the summers of 16 through 19. Did pretty extensive work uh, during those, those seasons. Uh, it was typically during the summer when the professor and his students were out of school. They utilized a lot of volunteers. They quickly learned that there was so much interest in the project that they uh, worked with Coastal Discovery Museum and the Hilton Head chapter of the South Carolina Archaeological Society to serve as docents so that people could engage those that came to visit while the archaeologists were still able to do their work. There were some specific days in which the public was encouraged to come out, but only uh, generally one per season. The vast majority of, of the people that came out during that, those approximately six week seasonal uh, work that they did during the summertime were going to the shell ring anyway, and they just, and they just happened to, uh, to come across it and, and see this work in progress. Um, that, that photo that is in kind of in the center that runs from up, up the screen and you'll see what looks to be a big kind of blob in the center. And then if you look in that same photo kind of in the, in the back left, you can see another one of those uh, accretions that is there above the bottom, the bottom of the excavation. Some of the significant discoveries that Binghamton made is related to those accretions. The photo in the upper left you can, you can see where uh, they have uh, dug around it and they eventually removed that particular one, took it back to New York for laboratory analyses and have concluded that it was a crematory pit and that it included the remains of many different species and human uh, remains were presumed to be in there as well. They could not confirm that with DNA but this was something that was pretty surprising to them. Per protocol, those, uh, that crematory pit was, it was recently returned back to the shell ring where it was found. What is so interesting about that, that pit is that the shell ring was constructed about 4,000 years ago, and then it was abandoned about 200 years uh, after construction started. It was another 800 years after that that this crematory pit was formed. And in that previous photo that I referenced, there are multiple pits that are out there. They found from 4,000 years ago, post holes, evidence of walls, evidence of structures that were affiliated with these, these cremation, cremation areas. And it's something that took a lot of uh, purposeful effort, a lot of fuel, a lot of time, a lot of energy to create these things. So they don't know exactly why it was done, but it certainly was something of great importance that 4,000 years ago, they went to the trouble to make. The bottom left photo, you can see some pottery shards. And this is what the archeologists had, had referred to as the pot drop. And they have been able to uh, identify these pots were intact and they were dropped for whatever reason 4,000 years ago they were able to identify that they had uh, uh, some wildlife, some mammalian species, as well as seafood. And it was essentially a stoop. And it was 4,000 years ago. And for whatever reason, somebody put a lot of trouble into hunting and gathering this valuable food source. And there were at least two pots, possibly more. And they were dropped and not picked up. And 4,000 years later, were discovered by the archaeologists from Binghamton in the shell ring. Photo on the right is just one of the, the pictures of the pottery from that pot drop. And they can tell from the, the amount of uh, decoration and the style of decoration where it came from. And they have found a lot of pottery as they expected, mostly shards at the shell ring, and have been able to deduce that there were people that were coming from, from far and wide based on the style of pottery that they brought with them to the shell ring. We are requesting $35,000 to help us develop new educational materials for the shell ring. We're envisioning both physical components and digital components. For the physical components, we are proposing to develop six signs shown uh, on, the, on the sketch layouts there. Each sign is two by three feet, very similar. You've probably seen it in other parks with the uh, aluminum 
park service look mount. These would be located at the ring itself. I would like to point out that of these six panels, only two of them are specific to the shell ring. It's the one that says Sea Pines Shell Ring and the one that says Sea Pines Discoveries. The other four panels are talking about things that while relevant to the shell ring, are certainly applicable to other sites on Hilton Head and potentially of interest to other organizations. How sea levels, that pivotal time and place that we were talking about, the forming of culture, how sea levels uh, went up, went down, came back up pretty dramatically over relatively short periods of time that influenced when these rings were built and when they were abandoned. We want to promote other archaeology on the Hilton Head Island, Mitchellville, Baynard Ruin, Baynard Mausoleum, uh, other areas so that in addition to people seeing the shell ring, we can provide them information and how to go and visit these, these other areas. Other physical component would be that we would have a companion brochure that we would print, the Forest Preserve Foundation would print, not part of this proposal. I just put up our normal visitor map so you can just get a, a sense for the, of, of the brochure, but it would be to accompany the, the signs and to provide some context and, and some additional information. The digital components of this is that we are going to have a QR code on each of these signs that would link to YouTube that would allow you to watch a professionally produced uh, video, two minute length up to six total by Dr. Sanger, who is shown there on the screen. And he would provide additional information and context above what the brochure or, or the signs would show. And so by using different QR codes for the, the ones that are physical and in the ground versus those digital versions that we can share with other interested organizations, those QR codes will be different. And so it'll give us the ability to track who's at the site scanning a sign or who's scanning a, a paper in hand brochure versus who is scanning a QR code from one of the digital uh, elements that we shared with these organizations. At the end, we're all trying to do the same thing, right? I mean, people are interested in interesting things. The shell ring was built about 4,000 years ago. That, that's about the time that the Great Pyramids were being built. Most people have no idea. They, it, you know, a pot drop. What caused 4,000 years ago somebody to have spent an incredible amount of time to get this valuable food resource and it was dropped and it was never picked up. I mean, were, were, they, were they attacked? Was there some other emergency, some, some calamity? What, what happened that 4,000 years ago that this was dropped and never cleaned up and found 4,000 years later? But we really do want to co collaborate with other Hilton Head organizations. And that's why we have in integrated in uh, the digital components so that we can we can share with them and they could use a portion of what we would share with them or maybe they would they would use it all there are a couple other shell rings that are on the island i'm trying to explain how archaeology has led to a better understanding of of today of what what it used to be in the past on the island and so we're really excited about being able to do, to do that collaboration and at the end of the day you know awareness and knowledge and appreciation of not only our shell ring, but these other historic and cultural sites adds to that Hilton Head experience. It, it may not bring them to Hilton Head Island specifically to go to the shell ring or to go to one of these other sites, but people are interested in interesting things. And I think that it, it provides an element to that experience that they one may not have been expecting or two that they're not getting in other places. And at the end of the day, make it so that they are more likely to come back to visit Hilton Head Island compared to somebody that does not have those type of resources and that type of material that's available for them to learn about it. That is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. First up, Mr. Berghausen. This is an easy yes for me um, uh, it's efficient I look at the number of tourists who do come and already already go there it, it enhances the tourist experience their feet on the ground here we know it you're documenting it um, 
and it's just a dollar ahead. You know, let's try it. I'm all in favor. Nice job. Uh, Ms. Johnson. So today I'm just learning of all the historic places that I hadn't consciously thought about here on Hilton Head. So this is just another great piece. My question is, how does a person access the Shell Ring site? Is, are there special, do you pay the regular Sea Pines gate pass fee or are there special arrangements if that's your destination? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, if, if you need to, you would have to buy the, uh, the daily pass at the gate to get into Sea Pines. Uh, no affiliation between the gate revenues and, and, and the forest preserve, but you would, you would have to buy a daily pass. And once you do so, you're, you're able to drive into the forest preserve and get to Fish Island that I referenced earlier. And from there, it's, it's less than a five minute easy walk to get to the shell ring. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Hmm. Mr. Thomas. Hey, David, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just a question, and I, I believe I know the answer, but I just want to make sure. Um, the Forest Preserve Foundation is a totally separate organization from either the Sea Pines Resort or the Sea Pines Community Services Associates. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. The Sea Pines okay. Forest Preserve Foundation was, was incorporated in 1993. We are a 501c3 and uh, have, have no connection to uh, those organizations. Okay, great. Um, I'm very interested in how you're anticipating providing information about the shell rings that will tie it to a much larger universe of sites and interests than just in the Sea Pines Ring itself. Um, I work with a lot of tourists that come to Hilton Head who are interested in, their, in its history and almost without variation. Uh, when you get to talking about the Native American culture that attended the construction of these shell rings uh, over the thousands of years that they were being used, uh, it's always the most, one of the most fascinating things that people will, will learn about. And although you said that people may not come to um, Hilton Head just to see the shell rings, I think the level of interest that is more current about shell rings and the research that's being done in them, uh, whether it's on Hilton Head or Fig Island or other places along the Southeast coast, uh, it's an area of fascination that's gaining more awareness. And I think there may be people who will come to Hilton Head just to see shell rings at some point in the future. So um, I'm, I'm obviously incredibly supportive of this uh, effort. Uh, congratulations on pulling it together. Mr. Arnold. Uh, I'll echo the comments from the other committee members as well. Um, when I saw the application come in for this one, and then when we started talking about the showering, my ears went up. Uh, earlier this spring, I took my family uh, to Fish Island and we walked around and found uh, the ring circle that I had never heard of or um, been talked about in the conversations in the 15 to 18 years I've been on the island. So. I look forward to learning more about it. Uh, and, and again, this is one of those unique stories to Hilton Head, something that dates back 4,000 years to the piece of land that we walk on today. So you'll have my support. Thanks for the presentation. Mr. Farrell. Oh, thank you, David. It's, it's incredible how few people are aware that it's in there, but it's one of those things that's once you get in there, you're like, oh, you're so glad you did. And the forest preserve in its entirety is, is really a beautiful place that you don't feel like you're on Hilton Head. You get in there, you think, are we really still on Hilton Head Island? It's so lovely back there. And the shell ring is something, it's almost like every time I go to the beach, I say, why don't I do this more often? But the shell ring and the forest preserve are such a great draw. And the more we get people in there, it's, it's, it's a value added thing. It's just another reason to come and enjoy the amenities of sea pines and Hilton Head. So I appreciate you bringing this to, uh, to, this, to this point, David, and I look forward to, to seeing this moving forward. David, I, uh, I, I too am uh, in favor of the application because if you put up a sign and explain something, 
my wife, I can't get me away from it. I love things like that. So that's the reason why if there's a historical marker or otherwise, I read them all. We were in Greenville two weeks ago in downtown and I must have seen uh, dozens of them along the parks and things. And I was reading every one of them. And I think that's it's fantastic to have that information available to people. And I make it a point to go out to the uh, forest preserve at least once a year. We usually get out there during the when the wildflowers are at, in bloom during, in the meadow there because that's a it's a very pretty area. But I was unaware actually of the shell rings, and I've been going to the preserve now uh, off and on for eight years that I've lived here, and for 38 years since I first started coming down here. So. It's something I look forward to doing the next time I'm out there. So I thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And uh, unless any of our members have any follow-up, uh, again, thank you, Mr. Henderson. As to our members at, at this point, uh, we're getting ready to bring the meeting to adjournment. Um, as you go over the remaining applications we have next week for hearing, um, if you have any additional information you need or anything, please email or call Sindaya so we get that information out. Is there anything further from any members today? Any questions or comments? All right. Thank, thank you, you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, John, do you have something? No, just thank you, Jim. Thanks for your leadership. Oh, sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, same thank time, you, same everyone. place. Same time, same place a week from now. So see you then. See you then. This meeting is adjourned.